Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come for the bout you've all been waiting for. The rematch for the battle for Los Angeles and the undisputed WBA featherweight championship of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to Staples Center as Premier Boxing Champions presents the featured bout of the evening brought to you by Ringstar Sports in association with TGB Promotions and Showtime. Sponsored by Corona Extra, La Cerveza Mas Fina and Casa Noble Tequila, the noble pursuit. This bout is sanctioned by the WBA, the President Gilberto Jesus Mendoza. The supervisor is Robert Mack. Along with the California State Athletic Commission, the chairman is John Carvelli, Executive Officer Andy Foster. Introducing to you our judges scoring from ringside. From San Francisco, California, Renante Danseco. From Rivervale, New Jersey, Steve Weisfeld. And from East Los Angeles, California, Zachary Young. Yeah. Introducing our third man to the ring, the referee in charge of the action, we have Thomas Taylor. All right, fans, here we go with the main event of the evening. 12 rounds of boxing for the undisputed featherweight champion of the world and now ladies and gentlemen in attendance and boxing fans joining us around the world live from Staples Center in Los Angeles it's showtime <laughs> introducing to you first on my right fighting out of the red corner wearing white trunks with gold trim fighting out of Los Angeles by way of Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. He weighed in at 125 and three quarter pounds. His record 31 wins, two losses and one draw with 15 wins coming by way of knockout tonight in his 11th world title appearance. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the sensational three-weight division champion of the world, introducing across the ring on my left fighting out of the blue corner wearing gold trunks with black trim also fighting out of Los Angeles he by way of Michoacan Mexico he weighed in at 125 and one half pounds his record 34 wins one loss and one draw with 19 wins coming by way of knockout tonight in his 15th world title appearance ladies and gentlemen here is the renowned three-weight division champion of the world introducing Leo El Terremoto Santa Cruz and once again our referee in charge now to give instructions Thomas Taylor right here Leo exchange flags 
Got flags. All right, gentlemen, I gave your instructions in the dress room. Belt line's good here, belt line's good here. Protect yourselves at all times and listen to my commands. Touch them up. Back to your corner, gentlemen.
bell, gentlemen. That was a good round, Akti. Let's keep doing that, all right? That was a good, very, very good round. Very smart. Again. Así, ¿cómo se siente? Bien. Ok, that was a good round. Este round tuvo bueno. In and out, side to side, you beat him to the punch, you step around him, cuando él, after you throw, he's going to throw back. Look, Wayne. Hey. No, no te va a volver a lo que hago. Tírame de, tírame de aquí, la. Tírame de aquí primero, pero, pero corriendo, ya te digo, los por lados, y luego los cruzamos arriba. Y muy bien. Hermanito, no te dejes abrazar, no te dejes abrazar. Sí, empieza de nuevo. Ábrele, ábrele, ábrele. Pero, hey, golpes de poder, pero, pero uno dos golpes y nos movemos. O sea, una combinación nos movemos, ¿ok? Leo, three, right here. Let's go. Drop it, drop it, drop
Vamos bien, vamos bien, Abner.
Top of the bell, gentlemen. Agus, Sellers, Curry, my Serena, my Venus. Come on, let's keep going, baby. Nick wanted his players to be great, but he wanted to be great with them. And the dark side is Nick had to do a lot of things to get to where he got. I was not the only person that felt betrayed and hurt. I don't know if Andre can ever get over that or not. If you want to do something in life, you have to pay a price. No matter what it takes. y los ángulos, mira, pídeme el one to one y un pasito para el lado para que le contestes a la derecha ah, y bájese luego, ok no te levantes, no te jales vamos, ¿cómo siente? bien, vamos pues ya, ya, para atrás, para atrás, para atrás pum, 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 y mueve la cabeza allí tiene que hacerlo, vamos, ok let's go, let's see a little bit more 
Seven. Seven.
lost that game. You right? Give right. me a favor, watch that. Quiero ver más presión. Llévenme para atrás, ¿ok? Usted es más, usted es más bueno, usted es más rápido. Faltan ¿Qué? tres rounds. Hazle chiquito, métetele. Métasele, mi amor, ¿ok? Métasele. Cuando lo tengas en las manos, cárgale el cuerpo. ¿Ok? Gaste, mete el cuerpo. Gaste más. All right. Take a deep breath. Quiero ver combinaciones. Afuera con su pinche jab, pero no le hice porque él está a la derecha. Quiero que tires tu jab y métase. Métase más a la izquierda. Ya ganas de que me estos rounds que faltan. Sí, es tuyo. No lo puedes bloquear. Hey, no dijiste que te estaba bajando a Estamos viendo, hermanito. ¿Qué estás haciendo? ¿Qué estás haciendo? ¿Qué estás haciendo? ¿Qué estás
head when you guys are tied up, all right? Let go when I say let go, all right? Let's go.
Ladies and gentlemen, after 12 rounds of action, the judges are in agreement. We have a unanimous decision, and here are the score totals. Judge at ringside, Renante Donseco scores about 115 to 113. Judge at ringside, Steve Weisfeld sees it 116 to 112. And Zachary Young scores it 117 to 111 in favor of the winner of the Battle of Los Angeles. He is the winner of the WBC Diamond Belt. He is now the undisputed WBA featherweight champion of the world, Leo the Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey. Thousands of boxing fans have packed this arena. American boxing fans, German boxing fans, Polish boxing fans to see this cruiserweight title fight. The tail of the tape between Hook and Głowacki looks like this. Hook with a height advantage, at least according to our tail of the tape. Those who went to the weigh in say these two guys stared eye to eye. Two reach, two inch reach advantage for Hook, both men weighing in just under 200 pounds, the cruiserweight limit. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Prudential Center here in Newark, New Jersey, live on Spike. This is Premier Boxing Champions. Tonight's action begins with the co-main event, 12 rounds for the cruiserweight championship. Introducing the red corner first, he wears the white and red. His professional record stands undefeated at 24 and 0 15. Victory is coming by way of knockout hailing from Vav Poland. Introducing the challenger, Krzysztof Mahed Growatski. And across the ring, fighting out of the blue corner, 
He wears the black. The longtime champion brings a professional record with 38 victories, two defeats and one draw, 26 wins coming by way of knockout from Berlin, Germany, introducing the cruiserweight champion, Marco Captain Hull. And the referee in charge of the action, Dave Fields. Scheduled to box 12 rounds for the WBO Cruiserweight Championship of the World. I'm going over the rules in the dressing room. I expect you to obey my commands at all times. Most of all, protect yourself, Lord God. Touch gloves, good luck. For this championship fight, we'll be using the unified rules. No standing eight count, no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight. You cannot be saved by the bell in any round, and the fight will be official after four rounds complete. We are set to go for the Cruiserweight Championship. These two men, various experiences. Hook, 147 rounds in championship fights. Kowalski, just 128 total rounds in his pro career. PBC on Spike starts now. <laughs> Fellas, these two men had a stare down at their final press conference. We took a stopwatch to it. It lasted a minute and 50 seconds. Might not seem like much. Stare at anything for a minute and 15 seconds, 50 seconds without blinking. These two guys wanted a piece of each other. They get it here in their United States debuts. By the way, our fight clock is brought to you by the new movie, American Ultra. Everybody's getting smoked August 21st. Glowacki and Hook, you'll see the names on the graphic on the screen. It looks like Huck and Glowacki. We have confirmed the pronunciations. It is Hook and Glowacki. Scott, I'm going to go back to that stare down real quick. Yeah. I don't care how long. It sounds silly. I don't care how long it lasts. I'm not turning away until you tell me. Uh, and they said that Glowacki actually was the first to turn away. And, and we'll see right now if that makes a difference crowd into it early here. There are Polish fans and German fans here to get uh, a good look at each one of their prospective fighters. Watch your hands, watch Huck, your hands. The German in black, Wawatski in the red and white. Now the question, we talked about it earlier before the fight, Hook tends to start aggressively, tends to throw hard punches. How is Gavazzi gonna react? Is he gonna stand in the pocket and show him you're not gonna hurt me? Or is he gonna angle and move? Right now, he's standing right in the pocket. He's standing right there in the pocket. The other thing too, Hook is, he slowed down his tempo right now. I think it could be that Gavazzi southpaw stands that we're seeing that's slowing down his offense. Think about facing the southpaw if you're an orthodox fighter. That power shot, that's your money punch. And Hook has an excellent right hand. And not only that, both guys are trying to let, uh, line it up. So yep. <laughs> it's all about who lands it first. A good, a good combination right there from Hook. One minute to go in round number one, scheduled for 12. If we take a look down to the feet real quick, whoever has the foot on the inside, they have a less of an opportunity of landing that, that straight left or that straight right. Big shot by Glowatsky, drives Hook back for a moment. Boxing is all about angles. We find that out real soon in this in this match. And so far, Glowatsky has been able to keep that foot just outside most of the time. That lines up his left hand a lot better than the right hand to Hook. And if you see, when he threw that one, two, he steps outside when he throws his jab because he knows that's going to give him advantage of landing that straight left. I'm impressed right now with Glowatsky's, with his work rate right now. A lot of times in fights like this, where Hook has more championship experience, fought for more than twice the number of rounds, will your opponent be shook and overcome oh. the big lights? Gavatsky right is the end not. Of the round, you... Great action to end round number one. At the end of round number one, it was Hook eating a hook from Gavatsky. As much as we talked about the power punches with the left and the right, that right hook over the top, the lead hook, that was a punch that caught Hook right on the temple. Great punch thrown by Glowowski right there. Great punch thrown by him. 
Good action in the ring in round number one. Great energy in this building. We'll see if the fighters pick it up here as round number two begins. We look to see if a, if a guy is overwhelmed by the moment. Gravatsky not overwhelmed at all, fighting with a lot of confidence in the first round. Not overwhelmed, and not only that, coming with a lot of hard, heavy shots right now. And the Gravatsky chance begins. Yeah. And here's what you want to do. When you when you hurt a guy like that at the end of a round, you want to come out in the next round and establish that, hey, I know I hurt you, I'm coming after you. Test how much he got back in between rounds. Exactly. And Huck's still moving slowly right now. Hook comes in with a record of 38-2-1. Kowalski, 24-0. Neither one of these fighters, guys, has ever been knocked down in their pro career. So you're going to get a lot of heavy straight lefts from Kowalski. What he's doing here is he's actually leaning down a little bit to his left just to line it up. And he's also keeping that, that right foot outside of Hook's left foot to make it that angle, to create that right angle that he needs. We're off and running in what we expect to be a great night of fighting. If you miss any of tonight's action, download the free Spike app on your phone or tablet and watch it all tomorrow on PBC on Spike. A basic one-two from Hook. That's about all we're getting right now from Hook. He's the champion. Now, Gravatsky said, leading up to this fight, he said, Hook has overlooked me, he has disrespected me, that's exactly what I want. I want him to look past me. Do you think Hook did that? He's a little surprised how effective and aggressive Gravatsky is, Sean. You know what? Hook may have done that. If he hasn't, Gravatsky is still stepping right to him, saying, I'm here for, for the, your belt. I'm here to take the history away from you. And look at that foot on the outside. He knows what he wants to do tonight. And Hook's giving it to him right now. And so far, Hook's been standing right in front of him, has been there to be hit. Hasn't been an elusive target. But typically, he's not that kind of fighter. Like you said earlier, he's a bully. He likes to move forward and be aggressive. The problem is, defensively, will he have the head movement and counter-punching ability to deal with a guy who's not backing down? Yeah. And Gravaski ste ste stepping forward the way he is right now, you can't help but wonder did he really change the complexion of this fight from right now coming up strong? And he looks him. like the stronger man, although both guys just pushing each other around the ring. Wawatsky powers forward like his idol, Mike Tyson. That's the large tattoo on his left deltoid as Hook landed a right as he backed away in the final seconds of round number two. Welcome back. We are live in Newark, New Jersey, set for round number three of the cruiserweight title fight. Marco Hook trying to go where no man has gone before in this division. A draw or a win here tonight gives him 14 consecutive successful title defenses. No one in the division has ever been able to accomplish that. reacting to what was just a, a balanced stumble right by Hook there. Scott Hansen, Jimmy Smith, Sean Porter, Dana Jacobson, your host. Pleased to be with you on Friday Night Lights Out. As the Glavatsky chants begin again, and then the Hook contingent uh, sounds to American sports fans like it's a bark, but a, a woof, <laughs> if you will. They're saying the Hook in their German accents. I like it. I like it. Hey, listen, right now, I mean, it's still early. It's only the third round. But you can't help but humble, humble wonder why Hook is moving at a slower pace than we all anticipated. This guy who generally starts early, generally spends a lot of energy early in a fight, at least testing the chin of his opponent. He hasn't been able to do that. The only thing I can think of tactically is the fact that Gavatsky only been past 10 rounds one time in his career. Hook may be looking as a more experienced guy to drag him into deep water, but 
He's eating some shots early. Well, maybe so, but when you're Kowalski and you, you're putting it all on the line right here and you're going after something, nothing's going to slow you down. Not even 12 rounds. A left right combo from Hook, countered with a right, and now into the corner. Hook forced by Kowalski. He fights his way out. Both guys are having their moments. Hook is finding that counter-punching opportunity with the right a couple times with the left hook over the top. One thing that's important to keep in mind is the easiest thing to see as a judge is who's moving forward, who's dictating where the fight goes. So far, that's Kowalski. And that's what I've learned over my course of being a pro is if you're moving forward, if you're throwing punches, chances are you are winning the fight. I like to see something different from Hook. Hook hasn't set anything up. But a counter right hand, which is it's landed, but it's not enough. Wide swing with the left, just missed the tip of Hook's nose. Mentioned Hook's consecutive title defense streak here. Put this in perspective for you. He's been the champion for six years. That's the third longest reigning active streak. The only other names with a longer streak of being a champion in their respective weight classes, Vladimir Klitschko and Floyd Mayweather. Little flurry at the end of round three. We're back as we went to commercial break. Listen to the bell, and Dave Fields, the referee, had to separate these two men. A very aggressive ending to that round right there. Kowalski not stepping back, and Hook doing what he can to get into his head before the end of the round. Start round number four, the sweat is broken, and, and you uh, had a point to make here, Sean, on the streak that Hook has been able to put together that's right up there with the Klitschko and Mayweathers of the world. Yeah, when you are on a streak like that and you know how to win, you can't help but wonder, even though three rounds are done and I have Hook losing, I can't help but think that he's going to figure out a way to win this fight. Pleased to be joined by the PBC on Spike historian and our unofficial scorekeeper for this evening, Steve Farhood. Steve, what do you got? Well, Scott, I think it's harder to say Kowalski's name than it is to score the fight. And it's pretty <laughs> clear to me that Kowalski won the first round and the third round. The second round, I gave Hook, Hook, but it was pretty close. So I think Kowalski off to a much better start than he, he might have anticipated. For the record, Steve, you nailed it. Kowalski, <laughs> well done. We'll check back with you. The crowd reacting to every shot here, fellas. Again, these guys have fought exclusively in Europe. First time in America for both of these men. Boxing is and always has been an ethnic sport. It's one of those things where your fans, you're from Poland, those Polish fans are gonna rally behind you, the German fans are gonna rally behind you. That's what's happening tonight, it's a frenzy crowd. I can't help but marvel at the art of boxing right now. I want you guys to pay attention to the feet. Please pay attention to the feet. Whoever is controlling the outside will land the better shots and will win this fight. Right now, it's Kowalski. Midway through round number four. Now, we got a double jab in the right hand right there, but his foot was on the inside. He doesn't have the angle that he needs. Good body shot right there from Kowalski. And you notice the power difference when that foot's on the outside and Kowalski really leans in that left hand. It's a power shot right through the center. On the inside, when Hook counters back and his foot's on the inside, not that a snap to that punch. No, it's not the same. You need that angle. Fans, the young assassin, Melvin Gillard, makes his Bellator debut against Brandon Gertz, plus Patricky Pitbull versus Syed as we have some action in the ring. Syed Awad, it's Bellator MMA, live here on Spike, Friday night, August 28th. That was a big right hand right there from Hook once he turned Kowalski. One thing you always have to do as a boxer is take advantage of those opportunities when they present themselves. He caught Kowalski off balance and was able to land a heavy right hand. And I think that's that experience factor. Used to big fights, has fought a lot of different kinds of opponents. He's got a lot of tricks up his sleeve. A lot, there's in boxing, there's a lot in boxing. Two things in boxing, anticipation and recognition. He anticipated that right hand would be there, he recognized it, and he threw the punch. Coming to the close of round number four. Wolofsky showing out well against the champ. Let it go, let it go, let it go. Come on, man. This is the 
We're back live with Krzysztof Głowacki getting his instructions in Polish in his corner. You might get a peek. That's the left side of his nose. On the right side of his nose, there is what appears to be a red, I'll call it a nick, out of his nose. This is not something that has happened during this fight. We did fighter interviews with these guys earlier in the week. We noticed that mark was there. The corner meant for Bolovatsky, giving it extra attention with the grease to keep it slick. There you can see the redness on the bridge of the nose of Bolovatsky. Something to keep in mind here as Hook continues to try and land. Well, in fighting, if you come in and you're not hurt, you're not cut, you probably didn't work hard enough. <laughs> I was just about to say that, that. That scar right there signifies that he's been working hard in camp. But if you're hooked, you maybe want to try to open that up. You want to try something to get back into this fight. You saw the CompuBox numbers. Both men landing exactly 29% of their punches. Wawatsky, to this point, has been the more active fighter with more volume. Say these guys, they're, they're, they're not working hard, they're not throwing any punches, all they're doing is they're looking. If you look at Wabowski, he's going up and down, he's moving left and right, he's trying to create something. Those are feints. Whether you like it or not, he's not punching, but he's throwing feints. Huck retreated for a moment and then was able to land a right, which stood up Wabowski, and now Huck throws a combination, which lands again. This is what we expected round one, round two. Now we're starting to see the real Captain Hook. But Gavatsky, to his credit, standing in the pocket, staying tight with his hands, not overwhelmed by the aggression of Hook either. He's not backing down. That's what you look for in a guy fighting for a title is poise and maturity. We've definitely seen that out of Gavatsky. Exactly. And that, you can tell from looking in Gavatsky's eyes that he's really ready for this moment, for this opportunity that he's been given. He's not backing down. Good counter right, right there. Even though the foot's on the inside, you can see that Robaski has slowed down a little bit, so that punch is still there. I think maybe he spent a lot of energy making a statement in the opening two or three rounds. Might need a round to get his energy back. We'll hey. see he's not as busy right now. What a, statement he made. what a statement he made, but again, you go back to what you said about Hook. Maybe Hook's waiting, maybe Hook's trying to, you know, let him run his course. And now we see Hook starting to come on a little bit stronger with uh, some good combinations. Another thing, Kowalski said in the fighter meeting that... Oh, and a solid right hand got through the defense of Kowalski. Hook doesn't press, though, in the final 10 seconds here of round number five. We'll go to the sixth. Welcome back. We're live on Spike watching a cruiserweight title fight. Cruiserweight division's only been around since 1979. 36-year-old division. Some of the notable champs, according to Steve Farhood. Well, Evander Holyfield, the name that obviously jumps out. The man we're watching in the ring right here, Marco Hook. And Johnny Nelson, the man with whom he is tied for the greatest string of longevity with the belt. I want to come back to the point I was making real, really quick. We said, uh, and Wolvaski said in the fighter interviews that he thought that Mar Marco Hook might have been overlooking him. Now we're starting to see that Marco Hook's starting to come on a little bit more. Maybe he didn't overlook Kowalski. Maybe he knows that Kowalski's strong. He's going to come. He's going to come prepared to fight. Maybe I should, you know, show some good defense and, and play it safe. And then once this fight starts to unravel, then I'll start to let my hand. And a left hand! Oh! Drops Kowalski for the first time in his career. Christoph Kowalski on his back. The count has reached six. Can he make it? He won't get up. He's up, but he's... Is he solid? Is he solid? He does He'll not let him continue. his legs under him. He comes back with an over and he comes back with a left to fight through it. Oh! He tagged Hook. Hook trying to close out Kowalski. Still two minutes left to go in round number six. They are both hurt, ladies and gentlemen. They Amazing are action. Just when you talk, Sean, about this fight unraveling, it is unraveling yes. for Kowalski. Yes, unraveling for both these young men right now. What a choice by Dave Fields, the referee, to let Kowalski go on. 
Yeah, what a choice. I thought he was done. But he's, he's back back to what he was doing before. And Slovatsky now the aggressor again. He seems to have recovered. Hook, is, he's got to land more. Take advantage. Got to take advantage. I think he's surprised. Gavatsky is still throwing that straight left hook right down the pipe. I think he thought his opponent was done. And he respects it. He knows it's dangerous. That's why he's back, hands him back up, and he's not letting him go the way he was. Everyone around us, this entire crowd is on its feet as they should be. Both these guys are heavy hitters, and they're hitting each other hard. Good body shot right there to mix it up, Bop down to the body. And another. That's what he needs to do. And back upstairs, but away flails Glavatsky. There you go. If it's not up and open up, up top, down to the bottom. <laughs> Does not have the look of a fight that will go 12. But a minute ago, it looked like a fight that wouldn't go seven. There you go. Both guys are throwing. I'll tell you what, six rounds in to two fighters most Americans haven't seen yet, you gotta be pleased with this. I love it. At the end of the day, this is what you what you expect from a boxing match. It's two fighters that will fight and not take any steps back. Final 10 seconds of a thrilling round number six at the Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey. Glavosky and Huck oh. trading at the end of the bell. Christoph Glavatsky knocked down for the first time in his undefeated pro career. Wow. I'll tell you what. I was talking about the feet. He couldn't set up the, the straight right because his foot was on the inside. But that, that left hook is so surely there. We saw it there. Will they pick up the action at the beginning of round number seven that they left us with in round, with in round number six? Glavatsky has bounced to his feet, to his legs. He's not hurt. His corner in between rounds, furious, saying, you get this guy hurt, get him out of there. I've been saying, coach, he's still throwing that left hand. He yeah. is not giving up. He's still throwing punches. Hook has gotten a respect mm -hmm. for Gavotsky's punching power. Yeah, as he should, as he should. This is boxing. Anything can happen at any time. We know that, which is why we, we, we sharpen our defense at all times. We stay, stay responsible on defense at all times. Steve Farhood, a check here. Coming up in the uh, one minute in to round number seven. Scott, the uh, the knockdown in round six, huge difference on my part. It gives Hook the lead, and he has the momentum. Uh, that knockdown is a 10-8 round, obviously, and all that good work that uh, Wawatsky did before that, almost erased by one punch, but a razor-close fight on Steve Farhood's unofficial scorecard. I've asked some great trainers in boxing, what do you do in between rounds? Is there any way you can get a guy's head back after he's been knocked down? And they all say, nope. He either gets it back or he does. We do little things, but it's up to the guy's heart and the guy's will to get back after a knockdown. You know what? I saw Marco Hux's corner smacking him a little bit on the chin. They did. And they yep. just wanted to get his, his attention, wake him up a little bit. Um, I get cold water poured on me from time to time. <laughs> I think for me, for the most, oh, big overhand left right there. Gavatsky, staggered hook, now pushes him back to the ropes. I get, I get yelled at. That's how you get my ass. <laughs> You're exactly me. right. In fact, they were speaking, we were eavesdropping, they were speaking to him in English. Uh, Hook's corner was, slapped him on the face and said, what are you doing? You got this guy, now finish him off. Finally, we see some straight punches here from both these fellas. Shades of Emmanuel Newton, Lennox Lewis versus Mike Tyson. Get him out of here, but he's answering back well as Gavatsky. Anthony Durrell tweeting out a uh, name familiar to you, PBC on Spike fans. He'll be fighting September 6th, as a matter of fact. Pauli Malignaggi checking in. Bananas with a couple of exclamation, exclamation points. We agree. Pauli also probably critiquing Sean Showtime Porter in his uh, broadcasting debut you, you here. You know what? I'm glad he didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I got a ways to go before I can even begin to compete with Paulie. And by the way, when I said in the corner, I met Emmanuel Stewart. I was in Bellator for a second. Emmanuel Stewart, the great coach, telling Lennox Lewis to knock out Mike Tyson. But both these guys still unloading power punches. I got to say, I'm a little surprised. We will go to the eighth. Oh, you spike.
viewers recognize those two men, Chris and Oliver from Ink Master in the house, probably admiring the boxing like everyone is right now, and also admiring the artwork on the left deltoid of Christoph Wawatsky, that big Mike Tyson tattoo. <laughs> That is a serious tattoo. Said he saw Mike Tyson uh, beat Francois Botha back in uh, 1999, and that was his uh, inspiration for throwing his uh, life and career into the sport and putting the tattoo on the left arm. Kyle Dunbar from Ink Master has done my ink, done fantastic work. Great guys on that show. That product placement, you just got a free one. DJ Jimmy. That's nice plug in right there. Plug in. <laughs> Have to, man. Speaking of tattooing, these guys still throwing, still throwing hard in round eight. Neither guy really fading. Neither guy fading. I didn't expect that with these foreigners. They're strong over there. They keep coming no matter what. Yep. One thing, oh, nice combination right there from Huck. One thing I am seeing from him, again, even though his foot is on the inside, he is able to land up that, line up that hook. And he's trying to throw it more. And every time, like you said, stepping, Outside is Marco Hook to land that straight right. He's winning the footwork battle, so he's winning the punching battle. Exactly. And now into the corner, Hook is forced. Glavatsky presses. Hook finds a way out. And battles back at the center of the ring. These two men throwing everything at each other. He puts all of it into the That he was does. a barrage of hooks, and he put everything into it. Question is, does Kowalski had the skill to counter once he, he he does unload like that. Because what he doesn't want to do is trade power punches with Marco Hook, the physically bigger guy tonight, the stronger punches in the past. Doesn't want to just stand there and trade. He wants to hit and get out. Power punches, according to CompuBox, slight advantage to Hook. Kowalski backs up and covers up. And Hook feels like he's done damage because oh. he continues to throw. Glavatsky might be staggered here. Look at the center of the ring. He's now. lining him up. Yep. And he was pawing at his eye. I thought maybe their heads clashed because he pawed at his brow above his right eye. It's been 20 seconds or so since Glavatsky has thrown a serious punch. Now Hook needs to have skill, show skill, so that you can hit Wabowski from the outside. Hit him with some shots and set him up for a big one. Don't just throw the big shots. Hook comes in and looks almost off balance before he sets up at range. I agree with that. He's standing straight up, very erect. Uh, most fighters, uh, the, the power is generated from your legs all the way up. Uh, not much shift in his punches right now. And Grabowski seems to look like he has recovered. Final seconds, round number eight. As Marco Hook gets through the defense on Grabowski with two clean punches. We will go to round number nine. We are scheduled for 12 in this cruiserweight title bout. With a win here tonight, Marco Hook will set the record for the most successful defenses in history at the cruiserweight division. He's now tied with Johnny Nelson, 13 straight title defenses. That, that experience is starting to show up too. Steve Farhood, very close on his unofficial scorecard, but the one point advantage by virtue of the sixth round knockdown that Hook put on Wawatsky. Experience, heart and guts on about how it you do when it's going your way. It's how you deal with the adversity. Hook has dealt very well with adversity tonight. Yeah, he very much has. Uh, I, have a, I have a saying that I, I, I hold true to my heart. Adversity makes a champion. When you're able to go through it and come out on top, that's when you really establish yourself as a, ch a true champion. If he breaks the record tonight, he will have earned it. Yes, very much so, going up against this Polish monster, <laughs> Grabowski here. Well, if you like this action, you'll love our September card. Adonis Stevenson, boxing's reigning light heavyweight champion, puts his title on the line against Tommy Carpensi. Plus, rising superstar Errol Spence Jr. battles Chris Von Heerden. It's premier boxing champions Friday, September 11th at 9 o'clock, live right here on Spike. You see a heavy miss here and there, but for the most part, these guys have started to kind of 
pull back a little bit on the heavy shots and, and try to box more in the, in the middle of the ring right here. Is that fatigue making them a little bit more efficient? Do you think that might be it? It could be. When, when, when fatigue does set in, and you, you, you figure out a way to get the job done in a way that you know you can get it done. And if you know you can get it done in the middle of the ring, that's where you go. <laughs> Both these guys, some good jabs right there from Gulbowski. career only passed 10 rounds one time. In terms of rounds, there is no comparison in terms of the experience between these two fighters. I'm sure Hook's corner knew that. They know that. And this is why they're in the ninth round right now. And he didn't come out the way we expected him to, being a bully, continuing to push the action no matter what. Yeah, guys, we started the bout by giving that remarkable stat that Kowalski in his career coming into tonight had boxed 128 professional rounds, 128. Hook has fought 147 rounds in championship fights. Wow, wow how's that for going up against experience? We will go to round number 10 as they jaw again. Some of the testier action in this bout has been at the end of rounds. You hear the bell, they go face to face again, and look at the right eye of Krzysztof Głowacki. That's a cut on the eyebrow of his right eye. We believe that was from a headbutt. Now, what's uh, notable about that is referee Dave Fields did not call it a headbutt, so he will have to deal with it as if it was from a punch. What'd you say, uh, 147 title? Browns? Championship yep. rounds. Yeah. Well, with that number, Hook better recognize that and take advantage of it. We're in the tenth round now, and now we're starting to see the bully that we expected earlier on in this fight. Well, look at the stat at the bottom of the screen. Hook has been here before. Wabatsky rarely into the tenth round or later. Just two fights for the challenger, ten or later. What will he have left? The blood could be trouble in that eye socket. Yes, Sean? Could be trouble. Could be trouble. It depends on how you handle it, especially when you're 10 rounds in, you haven't been here uh, very much. You're tired, you're fatigued, you're trying to fend off a, a heavy hitter, a champion. What will that eye add to the, to the fight, you know? It's bad enough in a fight, a fight that you're easily winning, let alone a struggle, a battle like this. Yeah, exactly. If you're easily winning, you, you figure it out. But, you know, if, if that's coming on too, the eye is coming on too, along with the, the opponent, it, your mind could scramble. Now, the referee did tell Steve Farhood that it was from an accidental headbutt in the corner at the end of the round. Okay. So, if it is stopped, they'll go to the scorecards. I say this, we're, we're talking about this cut in the eye, but Grabowski still isn't taking these steps back. Hook played possum for a moment, acted like he was hurt, then came back with a right-left combo oh. and scored, and then a right snaps the head of Kowalski, and Hook counter. pours it on. Hook needs to take advantage, continue to pour it on, continue to work this body of Kowalski that apparently is worn down. I would expect it to be 10 rounds in. What we're seeing out of Hook, we don't see in most fights, effective counter punching. He isn't always the initiator, he isn't always the bu bully. He's finding his spots to land the counter right hand. And with that kind of experience, that's what you learn. You learn how to find spots, how to find those angles, how to make it deceiving that even though you aren't the pressure fighter, you're not the one stepping forward, you still are able to land and connect and win. And we also see now that once Kowalski gets off, Hook looks to step forward and get off too. He knows it's the end of the fight. He needs to win all these rounds. Hook with the volume continues to score. Those are getting through pretty cleanly on Gorbatsky. He loaded up for a big right, couldn't land it. And now they'll brawl in the center of the ring. And an overhand right. Gorbatsky stares him down in the eyes. But we're going to get a break here and a mouthpiece on the ground. Dave Fields recognized it. Send him to neutral corners. 
Dave Fields constantly getting between these two fighters, separating at the end of the round. He's earned his money tonight. There you go. Pop it back in. Let's go. He's sweating through his shirt. These two fighters in their American debut giving it everything they've got. How about Hook with a shot? Bang on the button. The cruiserweights have been spectacular, and the main event is still to come. We've got a heavyweight fight. Antonio Tarver, Steve Cunningham, words exchanged in the days leading up to their fight. They'll get it on as soon as we are done here in this cruiserweight title fight. It's been spectacular, guys. These two guys came to the United States to live their American boxing dream. Fans are going to want to see both of these guys again, regardless of the outcome. And especially in the last couple of years, the guys coming over from Europe, Gennady Golovkin, Sergey Kovalev, hard punchers that have fan-friendly fights. I put both these guys in that category, Sean. Most definitely. These guys have come over here, and they've done a tremendous job. I'll tell you what, the, first, the fight early on was easier to score. These last few rounds, they've, they've, been, they've all been close and tough to score. Right there, we saw a faint to the body, then a, hook, a lead hook right there from Marco Hook. Uh, again, he's, that's been his heaviest shot, has been the hook. And so we look for him to land that even more. Okay, Steve Farhood now has a, 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 a three-point advantage opened up by Hook. Are we getting into or creeping into Wawatsky feeling like he has five minutes left at this point to try and get a knockout? I would imagine so. Both these guys at this point, they, they know that it's one round at a time and there's only two left. I got to win these rounds. We'll look for both of these guys to be very aggressive through the rest of this fight. Now, one thing is, I don't see how either guy thinking I need a knockout changes their strategy. They've been throwing knockout punches since Great round point. number one. Yeah. I think it's been the same kind of fight. Right? Exactly. The punch output is just going to pick up. I think that's that's all we can expect at this point. Both these guys have great chins. Uh, even though Kowalski went down once, I don't think he's going to go down again. Yeah, that punch would have dropped a rhino. No shame in going down to that punch, well, but he got up again. And that shot we saw that snapped Kowalski's head back in the 10th round would have dropped many men. So let's hear it a little bit for the chin of Kowalski, the Polish fighter. We saw a rare body shot right there from Kowalski. Got to go to the body early. Go to the body early. It pays dividends at the end of the fight. Not to say that it's too late for that, but I would have liked to have seen that earlier in the fight. Usually later on in the fight, the body shot is to set up the head, not just take the legs out from one of the guy, but... Oh! Down goes Hook! The first time in his career he has been knocked to the canvas. Can he get up? Wawatsky with a stunning turn of events. Hook turns his back to the referee. They will fight on with 30 seconds left to go. Kowalski trying to pull off the upset. Oh. He hits him again. Oh. Hook is in major trouble. It's over. over. It's over. It's over. It's over. The streak is over. Wow. Kowalski with the amazing 11th round knockout to win the Cruiserweight Championship. This is the kind of story you watch boxing for. This was an amazing fight with an even more spectacular finish. I am stunned. I'll tell you what, I'm stunned too, the way Hook was finishing. I didn't expect to see this kind of finish. Wabowski pulled it off. The Prudential Center is electrified with the Polish fighter coming to the United States. A man who had not lost in his division at a championship level for six years. A man who was knocked down in the sixth round and came within two seconds of being knocked out. Comes back in the 11th round to score one of the most thrilling, spectacular, punishing knockouts you'll ever see. Amazing finish. And look at it here. Oh, and followed by the right. That sharp, tight combination. Marco Huck dragged himself back to his feet, but he was on unsteady legs. It was a matter of time. Look at this beautiful shot, Sean. Unbelievable overhand left right there for Kowalski. I'll tell you guys this. We, I have rules in my gym. One rule is you don't pull straight back with your hands down. Huck pulled straight back with his hands down, and he got knocked out. He was trailing on our unofficial scorecard. He had one round left if he couldn't finish it off in the 11th. But at 2.39 of the penultimate round, Krzysztof Grabowski becomes cruiserweight champion of the world. We will come back with the official announcement 
on the other side of this commercial break. Catch your breath, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, PBC on Spike has just delivered you what might be the fight of the year. How did it happen, Sean? I tell you what, every fighter should have rules. One rule you should have is not to pull back, straight back, with your hands down. That's exactly what Marco Hook did, and he got caught with an overhand left. Take one more look at it. He's pulling straight back, the hands are down. That shot. And Marco did, or I'm sorry, Wolbowski did a wonderful job of, of following up that overhand left. Absolutely. With a, another right. And then closing. And then closing. That's what you have to do earlier in the fight. When Hulk knocked down Wolbowski, he didn't finish. He didn't close. At the end of this fight, the fighter that didn't have as much experience knew what to do right there. He knew how to finish and close this Listen fight. to the Wolbowski chants from the Polish faithful. And I'm sure some American converts and maybe some German ones at that. A tremendous come from behind. This is Hollywood stuff. I don't want to overstate it. This man was two seconds away from being knocked out in the sixth round. Credit referee Dave Fields for letting the fighters continue, calling a clean fight throughout, and allowing this spectacular 11th round knockout. And a man with a belt around his waist comes over to the broadcast table giving high fives to Sean Showtime Porter and Jimmy Smith. Michael C. Williams has the honors with the official ring announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the PBC ring, it officially comes to an end at 2 minutes 39 seconds into round number 11, the winner by knockout, and now the new cruiserweight champion, Crystal the Head Wolhotsky. I was just told that Marco Hook was ahead on all three scorecards. There were 20 seconds left to go in the 11th round. He needed a knockout, most likely, and he pulled it out. This is boxing. Anything can happen at any time, right? We are back live in a wired Reading, Pennsylvania. We're ready for the first fight of the night, which is our co-main event. This one threatens to steal the show from the main event. There are fans here from Toledo, Ohio, to see that man, Robert Easter Jr., try and go for a championship belt. And there are fans that have traveled from Africa, Ghana to be specific, to see Richard Comey try and get the lightweight championship belt. The fans have been waiting all day for this one. It's just about time to get it on. There is Comey. 24 wins, no losses, 22 knockouts. Easter Jr., 17 and 0, but the number on the tail of the tape, presented by Corona, who brings you the best in boxing, the number to highlight is the height and reach. Two inches taller is Easter than Comey, almost a seven inch reach advantage for Easter over Comey. Time now to meet the fighters in the ring. For that, we go to our announcer, Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, from Santander Arena in Reading, Pennsylvania, welcome to Premier Boxing Champions, live on Spike. The action begins with tonight's co-main event, 12 rounds for the vacant IBM Lightweight World Championship. Introducing the red corner first, wearing the black and white. His professional record undefeated at 24 and 0. 22 wins coming by way of knockout, fighting out of Accra, Ghana, Richard Christos Coleman. And across the ring, his adversary tonight fighting out of the blue corner. He wears the black and silver. He too stands undefeated as a professional, bringing 17 victories, 14 by knockout, with no defeats, hailing and fighting from Toledo, Ohio, introducing Robert Trouble Easter Jr. In charge of the action, your referee, Benji Estevez. As soon as the fighters get bare chested, we'll bring them together for final instructions, and we will be ready to go. You're looking at two men who have built their entire lives, their entire careers, to get to a moment like this. Yeah, 
I'll be Richard, they both receive your instructions, give me a clean match, obey my commands at all times, and most importantly, protect yourself at all times. Good luck to both of you, touch them up. For both of our title fights tonight, we're using the unified rules. No standing eight count, no three knockdown rule. You cannot be saved by the bell in any round. Only the referee could stop the fight. In the event of an accidental foul, we will go to the scorecards after four rounds complete. Neither one of these men has ever lost. Neither one of these men has ever been knocked to the canvas. The lightweight championship on the line. PBC on Spike starts now. Whoa. And Comey throws wildly to begin the first five seconds of the fight. Both of these men come in on st knockout streaks of five opponents. Both of these men put the majority of their opponents down for the count. Question is fighters, who handles long distance, who conserves their energy properly, who doesn't come out too wild with all this electricity in the building. You see the significant height advantage, and with that commensurate the reach advantage, almost seven inches champ for Easter over Coleman. Yeah, he fights really well from the outside and in. Has a controlling jab, like I mentioned earlier. But man, Coleman is not taking a back step. He's putting pressure on Robinson Jr. right now. The IBF lightweight belt vacated by Rancis Bartholomew when he moved up in weight class. Rancis, of course, no stranger to PBC fights, a champion in his own right. And what's important here, I think both of these guys are stepping way up in competition. And it's important to see how they handle it. Robert Easton Jr. can't afford to be pulling back with his hands down with a guy like Cole Mays. Big punch. There's now some range found by Easter. You will hear the crowd that traveled from Toledo, Ohio, here to Reading, Pennsylvania, every time Easter gets active. I think Comey has the right strategy. He's not fighting on the outside. He's moving forward, trying to pressure Easter, get around that jab, making an inside kind of fight. And he's been able to come over top of Robert Easter Jr.'s left jab. And that's important. That's going to be a good punch if he can continue to do that. He's so used to knocking out guys. You hit a guy with a good shot, and he's still there firing back with heavy hands. That can be defeated. It makes guys break all the time we see. <laughs> Energetic first round. Certainly here in the arena. And a bit from the fighters themselves. And Robert Easton mentioned in the uh, fighters meeting that he just feels that he has more weapons and he can do more inside the ring. That remains to be seen. We will establish the, the power credentials for both of these men and really their backstories. Two fascinating individuals in the ring. As a little bit of a flurry there comes from Easter Jr. Colmay steps back. It's going to be a tough fight for these judges to score, man. It's just like this, give and take all night long. Easter Jr. came into the night as a slight betting favorite in this lightweight championship bout. We'll go to two. We are pleased, as always, to be joined by PBC historian Steve Farhood, who will be giving the unofficial scorecard, as well as perspective and scope. Steve, your top lightweights. Well, Scott, this division has been down for a long time. Not so much anymore. Uh, at the top, Linares and Crowley, they're going to fight in a couple of weeks. And uh, Mikey Garcia giving new American blood to this division as he settles in at lightweight. But the winner of this fight, based on this fight, will crack my top five. Very good, Steve. Thank you. Check back with your scorecard in just a bit. Should his scorecard be needed? Easter Jr. and Comey don't hear scorecards very often. One thing that's really important to keep in mind is both these guys have power. They also throw a lot of punches. They're also combination punches. They don't rely on one shot to knock a guy out. That's why we're getting such a busy fight. They know the one who throws more is probably going to win the fight. Those are two attributes you don't see very often. Hard punches usually aren't volume punches. These guys throw a lot. Body for Easter. Colmey strikes back to the head. Oh, nice runs. They mix it up in the corner of the ring. Easter, no fear of an inside battle here, even though he's the taller guy. Oh, no, he has that ability to do that fight inside and out. That's what makes him such a versatile fighter. 
Fans want to let you know you can watch full Bellator and PBC fights on the Spike app. Now available for Android, iOS, and on Roku. Just because Cormier has the back of his throat, don't mean that he's not been effective. He's getting low and landing some good counter shots inside. Yeah, especially that right hand over the top. You said it, champ. Off that jab, even in close, he likes to throw it over the shoulder. Comey, the shorter man in the silver and black, hails from Ghana, more specifically from a neighborhood just outside of the capital city. The neighborhood is Bukol. It is only the size of three football fields, but 20,000 people live in that area just outside of the capital there in Ghana. They have a small area has produced championship fighters. Joshua Clotty, Bazooka Cordy, DK Poison, oh. and the Hall of Famer Azuma Nelson as the two fighters mix it up and temporarily go to the canvas. They tangled up in the legs and with their arms. Make some solid shots of Shane in there. <laughs> yeah, I thought he hurt Easter with a couple of those punches. Man, don't <laughs> blink. Yeah. <laughs> Try and tell a story about Bukom, Africa, and then there it goes. But uh, suffice it to say, per capita, Bukom, that neighborhood, has produced more world champion boxers than any place on the planet per capita. Now, Komei, Komei can't do what he's doing now, reaching with punches, throwing loopy shots. He's got to stay composed and tight. for all they're worth at the end of the second round. Komei with maybe the biggest shot of the fight thus far. We're back after this. Komei and Easter Jr. have had their moments each through the first two rounds. took a peek at Steve Farhood's unofficial card. He gave round one to Easter, round two to Komei. The quickness by both fighters evidenced here again until they lock up. One thing I think, Komei got Easter's respect in that second round and it was some good punches. There's that time when you realize, man, I'm in with a guy who's at least on my level. I think Easter believes that now. I think they both realized that when the bell rang. <laughs> <laughs> Very true, man. Komei about being a road warrior, always being in somebody else's backyard. And being from Ghana, he said, hey, man, there's clean water. You know, the, the sheets, are, it's a totally different. I like fighting on the road. You know, all the accommodations work. He said, I love it. It doesn't bother him at all. Once again, that clean right by Komei. It's finding a home on the chin of Easter. I don't think Easter's used to that countering speed over the top. Just to add to your world traveler story there, Jimmy Komei has fought in Ghana, the U.S., Denmark, Germany, England, and South Africa in his most recent fights. We know you're watching out there on Spike, and you're watching with your second screen on social media. Hit us up, hashtag PBC on Spike. We appreciate the tweet so far. We're monitoring what you're saying about this fight. We think it's an action one so far. Robert Easter Jr. has landed some good shots, but it's that counter right hand that's been the uh, ticket for Komei, man. I, I, I'm anxious to see, can he hit a home run tonight? And can Robert Easter Jr. make adjustments? Now, you know, that's what a champion has to do. Nice left hand, crowd reacts. But Easter Jr. was backing away from that punch as he scored it. seems to have the ability to push Easter back when he wants to charge forward. Yeah, he's been the, the more physical fighter so far. He's the one moving forward. He's the one applying pressure. Easter needs to take advantage of those gaps because what happens is Komei like that throws a shot, leaves his hand down. He takes a big leap to get inside. Easter needs to catch him with one of those and stop that momentum, I think. Yeah, I think Easter also needs to uh, do a body attack too, slow this young kid down. Ah. 
end of three. Welcome back. A live look ringside at multiple time world champion Adrian Broner, who is yelling into the ring at one of the men, one of the men he mentors. That is Robert Easter Jr. So we told you Easter Jr. is from Toledo, but Easter Jr. trains off and down in Cincinnati, Broner's town. In fact, when Easter Jr. is down there training, he often stays and lives with Broner. So Adrian sitting ringside, rooting on his man, trying to get his first world championship belt. We'll have a conversation with Adrian Broner a little bit later on in this edition of PBC on Spike. Dana Jacobson with an interview in between fights. Stand by for that. That's that jab that uh, Robert Easton Jr. is known for. And he's throwing a really good whipping left hook behind him. It's a good description. But man, he pays when he doesn't bring it back every time. He doesn't bring it back sharp. Both of these young fighters are on their A game tonight. <laughs> They're not letting the moment get the best of They came here to fight. Which is a fantastic point because, again, this is a, a belt that's up for grabs. Neither men, and, neither one of these men has held the belt. They have not been on this size stage to this point in their lives. There's Broner in the background. That's one thing we haven't seen. That we know what he's capable of. Is you said, Chip, that body investment. Take the legs away from Kome. Take the energy out of Kome because his footwork has been forward, forward, forward. Take some of that out of him with the body shots. Easter's good at that. Well, he did a lot of that in the second round. But Kome had his back to the ropes. But now this fight has been waged in the middle of the ring. And it's going to be, it's going to come down to who's the best boxer who can set up those type of counter shots. Easter Jr. forces the action. He has to be very careful because when Kome has his back to the ropes, he's plotting a, a trap to walk Robert Easter right into a big punch. It's based on that right hand counter. And he's comfortable as a smaller guy. He's comfortable against the ropes. Want to find a phone booth? Hey, that's great with me. Well, as we look at a close up of Robert Easter Jr., it's worth hitting the, the clock back a little bit to April on PBC on Spice. The Arjenes Mendez knockout. Champ, you said it was it was Tommy Hurd's ex yes. when Robert Easter Jr. had a one-punch knockout of Arjenes Mendez. But he has a different animal in there tonight. It is true. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> Look at the focus of Coleman. Look at those eyes, man. And his face hasn't changed one bit, his facial expression. It's a scary thing to be in a fight and look at a guy and he's staring at you like that. You better be ready. And I think Robert Streamer is. He hasn't fought intimidated. He hasn't found a tactical way yet to take control of this fight, but he's been in it. Yes. And we are through four in ready. The bell rings to bring it together for round number five. Steve Farhood, how do you see it so far? Well, Scott, I put an asterisk next to a round when I think it's really close. I have three asterisks wow. out of four rounds. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the first round was Robert Easter to me, clearly. Uh, a very interesting thing happened in the second round. Easter went inside, and what he does better than anything else is punch to the body. But by doing that, he takes away his movement and his reach advantage. So it's a little bit of a conundrum for him. I have a two rounds apiece. You want to argue any other way? I won't argue with you. <laughs> The one thing that, that's easiest to judge that's been going Komei's way is he clearly has been the aggressor. He's been the one moving forward. He's been the one walking Easter down. That might sway the judges in close rounds. You know, it's funny with a close, unofficial scorecard like Farhood's, when we talked yesterday, with Komei, he said that one of those great champions from Ghana, Azuma Nelson, the Hall of Famer, gave him some advice before he left the country to come here to the U.S. Azuma Nelson told Komei, give everything you can, put your life on it, take the judges into the ring with you. What does that mean to you guys? Take it on their hands, right? Exactly. Yeah. 
leave no doubt. Leave the guy on his back, looking at the ceiling, and you don't have to worry about it. I'll tell you what, guys, Kobe just took an uppercut, man. Yeah, you talk about having a chill. <laughs> this is a very tough kid. Whipping motion that you described, Antonio. Quick left with that left. As we're getting these middle rounds, oh, there he goes for the uppercut again. It was hard to tell if it caught clean. Oh, it was caught clean because he's hiding it. It's a deceptive uppercut. He rolls with it. When you think he's out of reach, it's right there. That left hand right now is dictating this fight. It's bothering Kobe. Now look at the footwork now of Kobe. He's slowing down from the waist down. He's not clearing distance like he did in the opening rounds, and Easter's taking advantage from the outside. I think it's the speed right now that's really shaking Kobe. Yeah, Kobe can't cover distance and make it an inside fight. If he slows down a bit, that lets, that's, that lets Robert Easter back in the fight. That's what I think this round is about. He can do more things in the ring. Round number five, we get a slow-mo look at the uppercut that hammered Kobe back in a bit. Welcome back. PBC and Spike encourage our nation's veterans to make the same commitment to their health that they made to their country. Veterans Operation Wellness promotes physical and mental health and wellness. What's your vow? And I can speak, I think, for Steve and Jimmy, Antonio and Dana and myself on this weekend of the anniversary of 9-11 when we say thank you to all of the men and women who so proudly serve our country. Now Komei closing distance a lot more than he did in round five. I think that uppercut got his respect. He's going to have to be chest to chest if I'm going to win this fight. Double right, that was quick. Speaking of 9-11, a lot of yes, national go. pride on the line tonight. Right before we came on the air live across the country on national television, we had the national anthem. Stirring rendition. Fantastic. Yeah, it was very good. Robert Easton Jr. feeling real good, he's like he's talking to Kobe, but he's going to have to stay focused. He's been going into his tricks with that uppercut. You don't want to keep going back to the same tricks over and over again. <laughs> Both these guys making very good adjustments. Kobe is having a little bit of difficulty with his legs, with the legs of Robert Easton Jr. He's moving the target, keeps him out of harm's way. If you sit still, you're sitting up. The one who's winning the battle with their legs is winning this fight. When, when Easter angles, he's winning. When Kome comes forward and closes distance effectively, he's winning. Both guys are great punchers. Both guys have power. The one who is moving the way they want to, that's the one who's been in charge of this fight so far. He said it over and over, champ. He's a great combination puncher. Nice left hook, though, by Kome. Easter cannot continue to go to the bread basket with that uppercut. He's leaving himself open, and I think Kome is looking for the counter. What hasn't been around the last few, few rounds has been that easy over-the-top right hand over the jab. Easter's tightened that up. Kome hasn't landed that in a while. Halfway home in the title fight. Back live in the Santander Arena in Robert. Reading, Pennsylvania. Well, it's a hole in Robert. Current building we sit in 
goes back to uh, 2001, but it's built on the site of the old Astor Theater. It's one of those old, grand movie theaters, uh, palaces that they that they had where they used to have all kinds of shows. Dates back to when Calvin Coolidge was president, which Jimmy Smith can tell you is roughly. <laughs> He was in between. He was in between Warren G. Harding and Herbert Hoover. Are you giving him a decade? This is this is 1920s. Very good. Absolutely. That history Jimmy, degree was worth every penny. Jimmy Smith, who, ladies and gentlemen, can name every president in order in which they served. Nice little parlor trick we do. We all have our skills. That needs to be mine. Back to the match at hand. More than halfway home in this lightweight title fight. As you see Easter Jr. with his back to us, you, you undoubtedly, oh, as Komei puts a couple of punches together that got Easter's attention and sent it back. But Easter Jr. with the word Percy on the back of the waistband there, as you look at Steve Farhood's card, a two-round advantage to Easter Jr. Percy is Robert Easter Jr.'s cousin who is currently incarcerated, and he wanted to acknowledge his cousin going through a tough time right now, serving his time and watching from prison. Family ties run deep for the Easter family. Robert Easter Jr. fighting right now. Robert Easter Sr. is currently in Easter Jr.'s corner. His father was a prize fighter back in his day. In fact, Easter Jr. grew up wanting to be exactly like Dad. He said when he was a toddler, oh, as Kobe scores with a quick shot inside. That came off a faint mini right hand. He's going to have to get more busy with that jab. That one jab is not going to reach him. He's going to have to double up with that jab and triple up if you want to hit home with that straight right hand. Saying that Robert Easter Jr., who gets the crowd to their feet at this moment, used to go into the bathroom, take all of the toilet paper, and wrap it around his hands like he saw Dad walk around with his hand wraps in the gym. Would take the top of a Kool-Aid jar, like the lid, the plastic lid, fashion it into a mouth guard. This is when he was a top. He said that I came out of the womb with boxing gloves on. Well, he can give the Easter family one of the most proud moments in uh, family history if he's able to win a title strap here in the next handful of minutes. The man's gotten a little closer in this seventh round. He's been able to land the right hand, but the problem is with the build of Easter. Hasn't really been able to follow up on it. He hits him, Easter moves back. He can't hit him with a combination afterward. This is instinct. This is boxing instinct that right now uh, has uh, Robert Easter Jr. dictating these last few rounds. Little flourish as we'll go to the eighth. Okay. You got to. Back live you got as you look at the bio of Robert Easter it. Jr. from right, his amateur go. career. The highlight there, 2012 U.S. Olympic team alternate. Not able to make the Olympic team in 2012. Here in 2016, he told us just, well, a couple few weeks ago when the Olympics were going on down in Rio, he watched on television and he said it just, it just fueled him for this title fight because he remembered the bitterness of not being able to complete his goal of being on the Olympic team and winning a medal for the USA. Well, he can win himself a championship belt here tonight. Meanwhile, the amateur career for Komei, fellas, abbreviated. Only 12 amateur bouts for Komei. Of course, everything's an amateur bout when you come from the area of Ghana that he does. Everyone boxes, it seems, for exercise, for sport, sometimes for survival, as he said. Komei just having a difficulty finding Robert Easton Jr. right now because, again, his legs are keeping him moving the target, and his instincts and in boxing intellect right now is carrying him through this fight. We go to the double box, and in the small screen, you see Adrian Broner in the white T-shirt now standing up. The kinetic energy as he roots on the man that he mentors, Robert Easter Jr. What do you suppose, and we're, just, we're, we're guessing here, fellas, what do you think he's yelling to his guy now? 
Or is that just to keep Adrian active himself? Well, he got, he got to be telling him to keep boxing, keep doing what you're doing until you see an opening or something. Because right now, I think he's pulling away. We've, we've gone to this type of coverage in PBC on Spike before. Floyd Mayweather. Oh! oh! And almost a knockdown. Oh, he calls it. He put his hand on the ground. That's big, and for the first time in his career, Robert Easter Jr. has been knocked shot. Now it didn't appear to do too much damage because obviously Easter Jr. popped immediately back up. On and off balance. But our rever referee Benji Estevez did his job. Notice that the glove touched the canvas and called it the knockdown. Wow. There's a silver. Oh! oh nice right hand by Easter Jr. Both fighters scored on that exchange. Man, you love it when the sweet science. You see the sweet science of the game. And both of these guys have lead in their hands. And now Easter Jr. appears to be stalking Kobe. And he wants it back. That may not have hurt him, but it hurt his pride. He's being aggressive now. of the fight, first knockdown suffered by Robert Easter Jr. as two undefeated fighters go for a championship. Welcome back. Was it a legitimate knockdown? Well, that rem that's arguable, but it reminds me of the time Hopkins hit me with a good shot. They thought my glove touched, too, but it never touched. <laughs> I'm telling you what, if Easter Jr.'s glove touched, it was only a wow. tip of the leather just swiping the canvas. He put no weight down on it to keep himself up, which is really the spirit of the rule. But either way, call the knockdown. It must be scored as such. And as we go to the ninth round, and these men open up weapons free here in Reddit. You know what? I don't like this, fellas, because Robert Easter Jr. was having his way in the center of the ring. There's no need to, to, to right now put yourself in harm's way with a dangerous puncher like Colmack. Steve Farhood sees it with a one-point advantage for Easter Jr. Steve, tell us about last round. Last round could be really, really critical, Scott, because if you take away that one punch that Comey landed, I think it was Easter's round. Wow. So you can, it's a three-point swing. You can go 10-8 for Comey because he landed the knockdown, or 10-9 for Easter if Benji Estevez doesn't call it a knockdown. Very critical moment in the fight. About as tight as it can be on the unofficial scorecard, neither one of these men wants to let it go to the official scorecards. And in defense of Benji Estevez, we're seeing this in slow motion with Absolutely. the focus camera. And Absolutely. we're having trouble figuring out. He had to do that in a split second with the naked eye. Well, I'll tell you what, it was a power Powerful punch, and regardless, it hurt him. Yeah. It hurt him. And it hurt him more on slow mo than we thought it did in real life. That was a solid shot. Actually, a remarkable job for Easter to not go down and put either weight on the on the fist or even have his knee touch the canvas. Comey forces the action. Momentarily had Easter Jr. up against the ropes, and he wisely steps away. Comey has landed two or three devastating shots, man. He's getting oh, Easter's no, attention. No, no. Like I said before, I like to see Easter in the middle of the ring boxing. Easter Jr.'s power, both of these men, big shot artists. Easter Jr.'s power, more of the one-punch variety or solid shot variety. Kobe's power almost always comes from attrition. But now the attrition gets poured onto Kobe by Easter, who thinks he's got him lined up. Kobe up against the ropes, maybe in a little bit of trouble. The crowd imploring the man from Toledo to try and finish it here. 40 seconds remaining in round number nine, and they split momentarily. What a fight we have in Reading. Looked like Easter landed the right hand over top, and Kobe relaxed a little bit. He didn't think it was that powerful. Oh, oh man! Left hooks snapped Easter's head back, and Kobe <laughs> with an offense of his own. We thought this was going to be a great fight. We did not be this good. Man, this is a war. This is what happens when you get that championship on the line, baby. Take us to the 10th.
Fans, heavyweights collide in the center of the Bellator cage when Czech Congo and Tony Johnson go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, plus the return of the baddest man on the planet, Joe Warren, and the U.S. debut of Anastasia Yankova. It's Bellator MMA next Friday, 9 o'clock, live here on Spike. Oh. We see some strikes like Bellator from Kobe <laughs> with a right hand that shot the spittle and sweat off of the forehead and face of Robert Easter Jr. That's been his money punch throughout this fight. That straight right hand, a lot of times a right hand lead. And he's quick with it. Kobe maybe to follow that up with a left hook. Maybe he gets something done. We started the fight by telling you about the, the knockout credentials of both of these men. Therefore, in their pro careers, neither of them have gone deep with any frequency. Richard Comey has only been passed eight rounds two times. Robert Easter Jr. has only been passed eight rounds once. You want to be a champion? That's where we find out if you deserve it. Round 10, 11, and 12. Richard Comey, he averages 4.8 rounds per fight. Robert Easter Jr., three and a half. job in boxing that I would never want is one of judge because of fights like this. It's a dream for both of these fighters, an extremely close fight. I mean, neither one of these fighters has heard a scorecard in over two or three years. to the ground as he felt like he had his opponent in trouble and got a little awkward and off balance himself. Big advantage for Easter there to get about a 5-10 second breather. He's worn these shots very, very well with press with the chin of Robert Easter Jr. No kidding. The problem is that I'm talking about your chin, there's a problem. Yep. He's eating a lot of big punches, especially that overhand right. It's good to have a nice chin right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sucks to have to use it though. Coach May line him up. Very close round here, man, going, leading into the championship rounds. And it happened at a moment when the uh, crowd was rather quiet, and the men and women here on PBC on Spike who bring you the sights and sounds had it perfectly. But that is high. As Richard Comey <laughs> has scored a knockdown earlier in the fight and scores a big right hand towards the end of the 10. Fight, we go to the championship rounds. Start of the 11th. The man on the right, 17-0. The man now behind him, 24-0. One of these men, perhaps six minutes away from being a world champion, barring a draw. <laughs> that, that's an important thing to say right now. Close fight. Both of these young guys have gotten themselves in tremendous shape, man. We don't see anyone breathing out of their mouth. Kone was standing up by the time 30 seconds was left. Which is remarkable because we just showed you on the graphic there, Kobe only the second time going past the 10th. Easter has never fought this deep into a fight in his life. Coming over the top with that right hand, it's kind of like a blinding shot. It doesn't seem like Easter has figured out when he's coming with it. I can't quite see it. Now he's throwing the left hook afterward a little bit more. So far it's been a slapping, pushing kind of shot. But he's throwing it. Kobe has had a lot of success in the 10th and 11th round. A lot. Very close fight. And what we've seen, I think, from Robert Easter Jr. is fewer combinations. He's not going as much as he was in the middle of the fight. Yeah, he's going to have to pick it up a little bit now. It looks like Kobe is having his way. He's fighting his style. 
right now. And he's confident. He's hurt him. He believes he can hurt him again. Be a good time for uh, Robert Easy Jr. to go back to the uppercut that he found a lot of success with earlier. It's great at stopping a guy coming in. It's a great trap kind of punch. Oh. Nice right hand over the top. It sounded like Kobe struck at the same time on that one. Yeah, they both landed good shots, man. And like I said, <laughs> neither one, man, are even daunted about the power shot that they've been hit with. I mean, talk about focus. Another very close round, but I think Cole has had better moments here in this 11th round. Nice right hand over the top of the pin. Twenty seconds left in the 11th round. I felt like Easter took that right hand away a little bit in the middle of the fight. Rounds four, five, six. And then it's working again later on in the fight. Bringing that lead hand back a little bit slower. Now, Kobe with a little bounce in his step and a little mugging. First time we've seen that out of him. We'll go to the 12th and final round. We're going to go to the 12th and final round, but the most consequential moment in the fight, arguably in the eighth round, when Richard Kobe belted Easter and his glove according to the to our referee scrape the canvas thus being a knockdown in a 10-8 round you would assume on the scorecards for kobe how about the unofficial scorecard as we are now through 11. steve farhood how do you see it scott this is a close oh kobe staggered but stays up and easter knows he has his opponent hurt in the 12th and final round Shot by Easter. Whew, how did he stay up? How dramatic would this be if he got the finish in the 12th round? He's looking for it. They go toe to toe. Oh. They are wide open in the 12th round, trying to win a championship. Easter pummeling away. Kobe clinging to his waist. They're separated and brought back together. Right. Buckle up. Buckle up. Right now, Easter needs distance. He's a little too close. Little head to head. And Kobe is holding on for dear life right now. I don't know how. I do not know how Kobe had both knees buckled and did not go to the camp. Determination, man. Determination. He knows what's at stake. And you never know the scorecard. Robert Easter could have needed a knockdown. But he's having a dominating performance in this round. Easter. Kobe. Neither one giving an inch. Neither one has tasted defeat. Someone gets the championship belt. Kome looks to be in trouble again. Holding on. Easter trying to find the kill shot. Referee's got to do something about this clincher because Kome is saving himself, hanging on. He is desperate. He got to clear the cobwebs. And he's still but fighting. he comes back to the body and goes back upstairs. Where is it coming from for both of these men? Talk about a warrior. <laughs> we are stunned. This whole crowd's on its feet. 60 seconds left. Talk about fight of the year. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. Robert Easter said it would be the biggest moment of his life if he could win the belt. Richard Kobe could not even talk about the possibility of winning the belt. He choked up and it said everything it needed to. And now both men speak with their hands, with their hearts, and with their guts. You cannot be saved by the bell. The crowd rises. Amazing lightweight championship fight. Robert Easter Jr., Richard Comey. Thrilling Toledo, Ohio, the country of Ghana.
and the entire viewing public here on Spike. My God, what a round, ah. what a fight. <laughs> How did Komei stay up in the 12th and final round? Well, both guys fought like they needed it. Look at it here. Right hand, bam! Look at the hand of Komei. Bounce back and forth. Everything behind this right hand. Watch the legs. And they buckle, but he stays How? on his feet. How did he defy gravity there? He got good balance. In, in a fight <laughs> that had one knockdown that came probably from millimeters wow. of space, Komei able to somehow <laughs> gird his legs and stay up. Look at that. And that wasn't the only hard punch of the round. No, they were plenty by Robert Easter Jr. He just couldn't find the space to get the finish. If the scorecards are as close as we anticipate they are, that's the difference potentially between a 10-9 and a 10-8 round. He may have just won a championship belt by staying up two or three inches off the canvas. Yeah, absolutely right, Scott. We don't know what the scorecard's going to read. And against the rope, same thing. Nice right hand had Komei hurt. Komei, like a veteran, like a professional, clinched and saved himself. The moment both of these men have been waiting for their entire lives. Who hears and knew will find out next. We are back as two undefeated lightweight warriors go the distance. And now for what could be the most dramatic moment of the night. The official scorecards, and for that, Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance for your decision, we'll go to your official judges' scorecards. Your first judge at ringside, Ron McNair, scores the fight 115 to 112, seeing the fight for Easter Jr. Your second judge at ringside, John McKay, scores the fight 114 to 113. He sees it for Comey. Your third and final judge at ringside, Craig Smith, scores the fight 114 to 113 for the winner by split decision from Toledo, Ohio, the new champions has been around for the better part of two years. That may have been the most amazing arena reaction I have seen in any of our PBC fights. It's lit in here tonight. It's lit in here. The crowd is bouncing in the stadium. Robert Easter Jr. hugging family members and there is the moment he has dreamt about his entire life. The man who wrapped toilet paper around his hands as a toddler wanting to become a professional boxer is now lightweight champion of the world. With the main event of the evening, 12 rounds of boxing for the WBA welterweight championship of the world. And now, ladies and gentlemen in attendance and boxing fans joining us around the world, live from Barclays Center in Brooklyn, it's showtime! Introducing to you first the challenger fighting out of the red corner, wearing black trunks with yellow and red trim, fighting out of Las Vegas, Nevada by way of Cleveland, Ohio. He weighed in right at the limit of 147 pounds. His record stands at 26 wins, one loss and one draw, with 16 wins coming by way of knockout. Currently ranked the WBA number two contender, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former IBF welterweight champion of the world, Showtime, Sean Porter. And his opponent across the ring, the defending world champion, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing red, white, and blue trunks, hailing from Clearwater, Florida. 
He weighed in at already 146 pounds. With a record of 26 wins, no losses, one no decision. He has 22 big wins coming by way of knockout. Tonight, making the third defense of his title, here is the undefeated, the reigning, WBA welterweight champion of the world, Keith Wentzheim Thurman. They both have been 147 pound title holders. Their punch totals are the same over the last seven fights. And they have the same name in their nicknames, Sean, Showtime Porter and Keith One Time Thurman. So it's Showtime and One Time. Here's one Time. Seven-pound championship held by Thurman on the line. Dave Fontempo with you at Barclays in Brooklyn, New York. Thurman getting advice at the corner. Dan Birmingham with him since 2009. Going to keep up that persistent work with the jab. Encountering hey. here by Thurman as Porter is trying to cut down the distance. Not enough of a height and reach discrepancy for anyone to have an advantage either on the outside or getting in. 
So all the space between these two guys has to be hard fought and turned. of the corner lies the strategy of this fight between Keith Thurman and Sean Porter. In the corner, Thurman being told, Porter comes at you, don't let him just get in. Stop him, throw something, don't let him just muscle you. And in the corner of Porter, telling him that when you are on the inside like that, take that step back so the judges can see the punches, you don't smother yourself in their eyes. It has to be visible to be credible. Wait, come back. I got you. Come back, Sean. Come back. Punch is up. Good right hand by Paul. Hands are free. Work it out. Hands are free. free. I got you. Step back. Step back. Important distinctions being made by the referee about the punching room. Watch your heads. Watch your heads. You all right? Yeah. Watch your heads. The referee says, work your way out. That's good if you're an action fighter on the inside. Porter certainly likes that. That's his bread and butter game. If you get a referee who breaks you off it. That's a bad thing if you're an inside fighter. Go home. Go home in there. Let me go. Wait. Step back. I got it. I got you, sir. Step back. Trap was set. He fired the uppercut that missed. Ah, uh, get the fight. I got you. I got you. Hold up. Hold up. You all right? Watch yourself. All right? All right? There you go. Referee right on top of it, Steve Willis. He makes the appropriate call. All right, work. Get up. Get up. Telling Porter to get the punches up, but doing it quickly and not making himself a factor Wait, in the back. flow of the fight. Step back, Sean.
start round four. Keith Thurman, Sean Porter, and was this the scene stealer? Keith Thurman and Sean Porter. Dave Bontempo with you at Barclays in Brooklyn. Thurman, the champion of 147 pounds, the WBA version. Porter, the number two contender. Both have held titles. Porter won his here. In 2013, before losing in 2014 to Kel Brook. Excellent matchup, and you see the contrast. Work it out, work it out. Power punching opportunities for both guys. And yet the this, uh, punch is up, so as keep well. up. Come on now. Back and forth, good action on the inside. Right, 
Six, Keith Thurman, Sean Porter. Nice entertaining round five, in which they both opened up. Porter with the bigger shots. Blocking the field goals, hooks by 
more of a high octave in there as we start round nine of 12. Dave Fontempo with you at Barclays Center in New York. Keith Thurman defending his WBA welterweight championship against Sean Porter. Right, sit back. Watch that on. Watch that on. fight that has been as good as advertised. And fortunately, even though a lot of their numbers were the same and could negate each other. Right, step back, step back. I got you. I got you. They have both had the intensity to make this matchup work. Step back, step back, take a full step back, full step back, there you go. This is Good right hand by Thurman. Right! Let's start fighting now. This is us. This Hold on, hold on, hold on. Showed you is that it's blinding speed compared to the naked eye and the guys at ringside. So here we are in round 10. Thurman and Porter. It's a big nine for Porter and Thurman in the outside trying to box. Money ticket anyway. on the inside. Hey, I got it. Step back. Step back. Step back. Stylistically, overall, it's been the fight that Porter wanted. Fight your way out, guys. Fight it out. Thurman. Fight it out. Fight it out. And having a referee who says, like you just heard, fight it out. Get room to operate in tight. Try to keep a fight flow going. Ah, no, no. Okay, we're good. Let's go. Good right hand by Porter. Very important as a fighter to watch them together stop, here. Stop. You're all right? but they know the style right. of the head. referee. It's like you have to know the style of an umpire in baseball or other sports. <laughs> this referee. Steve Williams left him work on the inside. Fight it out! Fight it out! Fight it out! 
No hold. Punch your way out. Punch your way out. One hand is free. He lets them go. means you're not going to buy time on the inside by having the referee break you several times in the round. Search of the WBA welterweight championship. Right, step back, step back, short. I got working inside. To stay outside after he was cut. And that's been his game. Let's see what the flow of a fight can change. Get a little confident, you land a big shot like Toby did again in the last round. And you might be tempted to work inside again. Watch your heads. Break, break. Step back, step back. Watch your heads, yeah. part about this fight is that despite a lot of similarities in their style, Thurman and Porter have not negated each other. Thurman, the right hand by Porter. Just enough movement on angles. Work it out! Work it out! Put everything into going for this.
Thurman has been pretty effective since he was cut. Made him a little bit more conscious of the angles. And this is excellent versatility for Thurman. He has 22 knockouts in 26 fights. Watch your feet. So you would picture him as a gunslinger. But instead, oftentimes in this fight, he's been the boxer. That's right, work it out. Right your way out. Right your way out. No, no, don't push. I got you. I got you. Step back. Step back. Step back. That's right. Let's go. Good job tonight by referee Steve Willis. Consistent with his calls. Good. I got it. I got it. Step back. I got it. Left the punch out. And there's one on three. And it's time for a break. It's a break. I've got it. He's got the same thing every time. That's right, fight your way up, fight your way up, fight it up. That's Porter. There we go. Working on the inside. Doesn't have to get through a jab. Just lean in and go to work. That's right, get it. That's right, work it out. Fight your way up, I got it. Last now, fight it out. we have a close but unanimous decision. All three judges score the bout the same, 115 to 113. All three in favor of the winner. And still, WBA welterweight champion of the world, Keith Wattime Thurman. Close but unanimous is right, 115-113. I can see that. Crowd doesn't like it, but there was a lot to choose from for the judges in this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Barclays Center here in Brooklyn, New York for the featured bout of the evening. Brought to you by Mayweather Promotions, Debella Entertainment, and Showtime. Sponsored by Corona Extra, La Cerveza Mas Fina. This unification bout is sanctioned by the WBC, President Mauricio Suleiman, Supervisor Chuck Williams, the IBF President Daryl Peoples, Supervisor Lindsey Tucker, along with the New York State Athletic Commission. The interim chair is Ndidi Masi, and the executive director is Tony Giardina. Introducing our three judges, scoring from ringside, from Avon, Connecticut, Glenn Feldman. From West Nyack, New York, Julie Letterman, and from Rivervale, New Jersey, Steve Weisfeld. And our referee in charge of the action, he'll be giving instructions after the introductions, Arthur Mercanti. All right, fans, here we go with the main event of the evening, 12 rounds of boxing for the unified super middleweight championship of the world. And now, ladies and gentlemen in attendance and boxing fans joining us around the world, live from Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York, it's showtime! Introducing to you first the WBC world champion on my left, fighting out of the red corner, wearing camouflage trunks with gold trim, 
originally from Stockholm, Sweden, now fighting out of Las Vegas, Nevada. His weight, 167 and one quarter pounds. His record stands at 20 wins, one loss and two draws, with 12 wins coming by way of knockout. Tonight, he is making the third defense of his title. Please welcome the defending and reigning WBC Super Middleweight Champion of the World, introducing Badu Jack the Ripper. And his opponent across the ring, the IBF World Champion, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing white trunks with black and orange trim, fighting out of Harlesden in London by way of St. Albans, England. He weighed in at a trim and ready 166 and one half pounds, and his record stands at 23 wins, one loss, with 14 wins coming by way of knockout. Please welcome the 2008 Olympic gold medalist. Tonight also making the third defense of his title. Here is the reigning IBF super middleweight champion of the world. Introducing James Chucky DeGale. Once again, a referee in charge. Now to give instructions, Arthur Mercanti. Good evening, gentlemen. This is for the IBF WBC Super Middleweight Championship Unification. I expect you to obey the rules we went over earlier. Touch gloves. Good luck to the both of you. All right. No nonsense, Arthur Mercanti. Let's go. Junior. There is Gail, WBF champion. Let's go in that corner! And then there were three. Two fighters and the referee. Okay, so for supremacy in the 168-pound division, here we go. about execution. These guys have seen each other, been on the same card, fought the same opponents. about keeping it clean. It may not be easy because these guys are going to need to do little things to create openings. The height and reach. Not that much different. Stop holding, man. Stop holding. By DeGale. Are you going to see a horse in hitting type of a thing between these guys? Like you saw in the Cold Love Ward a couple of months ago. But how the referee handles that would be important. that right hand lead, he would like to try to get it against the left. Try to get the double left hook. Stop 
corner. Not much was happening. And then one bomb oh. changed it. We got 11 more rounds to go. You're doing good. You just got to stay with the pivot. Stay with the pivot, right? Keep using. Here's how it changes. Watch the right hand and the left hand gets in there first. Quick shuffle step. By again. Created a quick angle for himself. Wait for the belt, wait for the belt. Get in the corner, wait for the belt. Wait for the belt. Second round action is James DeGale. Harley. Dropped it with a straight left hand. In the round two, scheduled for 12. He has 23 and 114 knockouts. Back is 20 wins, one loss, two draws, 12 KOs. A pair of super middleweight champions on this play in Barclays. Great! They found tempo. There's your wins. Back to the play. Both step back to the play. Champion to Gale champ. Listen, he's out of his league. He's just got to stay switched on. Keep finding him with that lovely jab and moving your feet. But he's, he's very frustrated, James. He's looking for the right hand. Just concentrate on not getting him with the right hand. That's what he's looking for. Boxing lovely. What's his power like? You hit him there, you hurt him. He chill. When you do the hook to the body, you hurt him. I go the same thing. Okay. His belt's a little high. Deep breath. Relax. Remember, he's tired of it. He always saying he's tired of it. But Five smarts, the number. Yeah. You looking good. Come on, let's go, man. Come on, wait for the 
I'll wait for the bell. And round three underway, James DeGale, Badu Jack. Pair of 168-pound champions. to watch the corner of Badu Jack between rounds. Trying to pump up their fighter. And you're doing really well. That punch you hit him up really hard. Just behind the round, coach. Badu, 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 It's a must, beautiful. Everybody with a jab, the backhand's landing every time you throw it. Hold your shape, stay focused. It's very frustrating, James. Relax. How do you feel? Right. What's his power like, James? That's right. You got his hands tight? Yeah. Feel good. Use yeah. your lateral movement. That's right. Yeah, beautiful. But you must use that jab yeah, every time you get... Start letting that right hand go. Straight and over, you can throw everything. Even Russ said it. Russ said that overhead. Move that right hand. Move that Russ said right it. Hand. Into the fourth round, James DeGale and Badu Jack, and the work in the corners was illuminating oh, as they were calm in DeGale's corner. He's been doing well with the jab and the movement. And for Jack, it was a committee. Telling him one thing after another. Different corners work different ways. Sometimes the group speak is all right. Sometimes it backfires, but both of these guys have gotten to a high point in their career. They bring championships in here. Looping up a cut by 
to Gale scores. A far distance, too. Man. You're not supposed to throw the uppercut from so far away. And then you leave yourself open for your opponent to take a step and counter you. If you camouflage the move, you can get away with it. James Bucket, lively. Chase spin it, anyway. I'm going to watch out. By well, James, this is very frustrating with your movement. No, you can't. But don't let him move the way he. Remember, we never let nobody move that way. Don't let him pivot on you. You cut the ring on him. That's what we worked on. but that was one exception to it. And into the fifth round we go. James Miguel, Badu Jack. Unification in B at Barclays. with different ability levels than a, a, a champion. And he's trying to cut off the ring. And Miguel is charging at him and then moving to his right. That's a way to Initially, stop that if you are Jack is to be tight, unload the body, and hook it over time. You can slow that movement and then get this fight where you'd like it to be. Here comes Jack. He left hook. Stepping back, looking for a good right hand, good body shot. Stop holding! Ho ho! Cut 
by the gal and he turned around and fired the right hand.
Edge is drawing it. Right, right. Champion. Nice job. In that 168-pound tournament a number of years back. Nice Having a right hand by Jack. He got in on the Gale here. Some of those body shots did slow the movement. Missed. I got points with that guy, Floyd Mayweather, and probably the judges. Wait for the belt, wait the for the belt. Wait for the belt. Seventh round, we start the second half of this fight at Barclays. And Dave Bob Tempo, you're watching James DeGale and Badu Jack. Putting their 168 pound titles on the line. Quick start for Miguel, putting an early knockout. Miguel and Jack, and he's trying to rally and steadily finding himself the last two rounds. This is sort of what you would expect in the unification fight. And that huge champion. Good enough that carve out some moments. I knew that Buddy Jack the Ripper was too good to be shut out in this fight. James DeGale had a big early start. He's 
Clear into the eighth. shot there by DeGale. And then we talked about Arthur McCanty, how well he handled that. To hey, get out of the ring. Get it washed while they were still fighting. And then bring it back in. So according to rules now they'll have Miguel see the doctor. Okay, all right. And we move along. Big eighth round and some good momentum for the last three. Watch your head. Talk to me about it. All about execution because they knew each other's styles, they had common opponents, they had common success in the sense that they both have a title. Miguel yeah, got the jump on Jack. Jack, right himself after some good body work. So 
that he could set up shot where he wanted to win this fight. He brought himself back. Outside is maintaining discipline. Gale back. And the body language says a lot between the fighters. Can you see? Gale walking slowly, retreating. That is an energy pill for Bobby Jack. James, you've got to go away from his James, you've got to go away from his right hand. Listen to me. I'm telling you now. Well, Arthur Mercanti accuses. And he's right there, but the Gale just let the mouthpiece go out. And he threatened that if it happens again, he'll take a point. And he's been tightly officiating the contest, so it has to be respected. <laughs> Very rarely, maybe only once have I seen a referee take a point for infractions with the mouthpiece. But the specter is there. So here we are into round 10. James DeGale and Badu Jack. An intriguing battle as Badu Jack has surged back at DeGale. Let it go! So it started quickly. Now, Miguel has some moments, and Jack acknowledges that by bringing him in. Good shot! You don't need to accentuate that. Big, 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 good! Let me, let me, let me, let me! You don't got to face, just one, two, 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 just one, Beautiful! And Jack is trying to walk the gale down. And they both know what to throw here, so it's a matter of can something big get in.
Jack has had the new highlight real tech effect in this round. Again, our people can't hear the line of fire. You finish with the hook. Now it's time. The one two is dead. Everything we worked for is dead. Let's go. Your daughter's dead. Yo, we can't do all of this. We can't do his daughter. He's running. Let's get out for it. Going to try to get a little bit more out of their guys. About how we've come too far. On the inside, Abigail had some excellent moments in that round. You kept some of the thunder away from Badu Jack. Go to your corner. Oh, go to your corner. Go to the back. Start the 11.
Gale, Badu Jack. Bear in mind there was a knockdown only round one. Most likely will have a bearing on the score. Forward and then in 
ended up backpedaling and taking a seat. Going one way, and they end up going the other way. This fight had so much. Floyd Mayweather was trying to fight it himself. Scorecards, here are our totals. Judge at ringside, Glenn Feldman scores the bout 114 to 112 in favor of James DeGale. Judges at ringside, Julie Letterman and Steve Weisfeld both score the bout 113 to 113, even a draw. The decision is a majority draw. Both champions retain their belts. We talked about how close this was. Only one point different between all the judges. 113, 113, and 114, 112. Hey, it's nothing little about tonight's main event. The big boys are about to throw down. Let's go to Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to the Barclays Center here in Brooklyn, New York as Premier Boxing Champions presents the featured bout of the evening brought to you by Dabella Entertainment, TGB Promotions, and Showtime. Sponsored by Casa Noble Tequila, the noble pursuit, and Corona Extra, who invites you to find your beach. 
this bow to sanction by the WBC, the President Mauricio Sulaiman, the Supervisor Sir Charles Giles, along with the New York State Athletic Commission. Introducing our judges scoring from ringside. From Connecticut, Glenn Feldman. From New York, Kevin Morgan. And also from New York, Carlos Ortiz Jr. And introducing our third man in the ring, our referee in charge, is David Fields. All right, fans, here we go with the main event of the evening. 12 rounds of boxing for the WBC Heavyweight Championship of the World. And now, ladies and gentlemen in attendance, and boxing fans joining us around the world, live from Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York, it's showtime! Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the challenger, the four interim title holder in the current WBC number three heavyweight in the world, tonight looking to become the first Cuban born heavyweight world champion, introducing the undefeated Luis King Kong Ortiz. Gentlemen, we scheduled to box 12 rounds for the heavyweight championship. We're going over the rules in the dressing room. I expect you to obey my commands at all times. Most of all, protect yourself at all times. Touch gloves, good luck. Lancer to the body. Can he get inside enough to throw to the body against Wilder? 
Ortiz has seven first round knockouts for Wilder. Half of his 38 KOs have come inside the opening three minutes. But again on paper, has never faced an exam like the one Ortiz is supposed to be giving him tonight. Well, Ortiz tried a left hand already. He's gonna throw that punch a lot. It's his power punch. He saw the athleticism of Deontay, the way he was able to slip it, step back, and he kept his balance. It's been a problem for Deontay in the past, slipping punches and keeping that positioning and balance. So far, he's been done it well. Yeah, at times, the champ puts the wild and wilder, but he talks about his punches as being like a whip. And Ortiz putting pressure on Wilder from the south pass stands, landing the combination. Wilder says his finishing punch is the tip of the whip, the, the 50 shades of Wilder looking to produce his 40th victory tonight. Ortiz's jab already, you can tell he's committed to that punch, and he better be. That's an important one for him tonight. He's done a good job of being first thus far in the yeah. last round. He's, he's keeping Wilder guessing. Wilder putting out touching shots, so the one to the elbow. Just trying to probe what, what Ortiz is going to give him. And despite the, the trash talking, despite the failed drug test for Luis Ortiz, these two do share a special bond. They're each fathers of daughters born with special needs. Their kids, the motivation for them to, to put their lives on the line and engage in the spirit of prize fighting out. Yeah, and... and Right now is the biggest moment in both their careers. It really is. I mean, obviously, Wilder with one of the titles defended. This is what many people believe is his biggest test. But both Wilder wary here. Message across to Wilder that Ortiz will react, and he is reactive with his positioning. And of course, public enemy number one for the Southpaw is that right hand, and for Wilder, his right hand puts his opponents in airplane mode. Well, the Ortiz's people said, "Look, we understand it's a freight train right hand. We have to be wary of it." And Ortiz understands it's a power punch. I tell you what, he's doing a good job of though. As Ortiz jabs, he steps over to his own right. Yes. So as that double jab, he's taking away the ability of the jab. <laughs> Ortiz lands a sharp jab on Wilder in the final seconds of the first round. Tempo. We'll take a look at the keys to victory. First of all, for Deontay Wilder, he needs to control the geography of this fight, obviously the distance. When I say fight tall, obviously what it means is not just standing there tall, but it means making sure you don't shorten yourself and you use your height. It's going to be important for him to do that. The right hand is the big weapon for Wilder. He's got to find a way to get that in against the lefty. For Ortiz, the jab's important, but it needs to be used to get him on the inside. Body work is important. He hasn't had an opportunity to do that. He did throw a couple punches, and of course, the straight left hand is the answer. But as this man gets ready for round Check two, he's got to be happy the way round one went. The bell and round number two. Wilder, when addressing his critics, says that people see him swinging like a wild man. They don't understand that he says he just does that because he can get away with it. He says it's entertainment. I wonder if he'll be able to get away with it against a guy like Ortiz. Well, he says he does it when he's got a fighter in trouble, which is true, but... Um, but even we'll defensively, see. we've seen him yeah. balance in the pass ball. Yeah, and I, I like that in the first round, he, he, he was on the defense mode for a lot of the first round, but he was able to keep his balance. So probably things that they've worked on, and that's what you expect fighters to make the improvements. I don't think we've seen Wilder throw a right hand with conviction yet, so we'll see what happens when he does. Wilder well, looking to establish that phone pole jab. He tried that right hand, but he got with left hand in the yeah. round. That's right, there was an indication, and that will actually discourage you from throwing more right hands. You are correct, sir. <laughs> Ortiz very comfortable Thank wanting you. to keep that lead foot to the outside, as you mentioned, Paulie, and walking down the champion Wilder here in round two. And Ortiz has that experience. He's, he, he, oh, there's a left hand. Ortiz just Watch 
three. Jennings, who had just gone the distance in a good showing against Vladimir Klitschko, the champion at the time. Ortiz was able to vanquish Jennings, and now Ortiz bringing the fight to Wilder. By far, Luis Ortiz's best fight, as you point out, against Jennings. You know, Wilder rushed him, thinking maybe that something was amiss when he went down, and Wilder got countered when he rushed in and said, okay, enough of that right now. He was a right hand from Wilder. Wilder fainting there for a moment. It's been Ortiz fainting and doing most of that so far in this fight. A minute left in the second round. Not a lot of punches thrown. And Wilder showing respect to his Cuban challenger, trying to utilize his reach advantage. And by the way, Ortiz's reach, 78 inches, not the previously reported 84 inches. A lot of media saying that Ortiz had a one-inch reach advantage over Wilder. That is not the case. And there's a left hand to the chest by Ortiz. Parker landed on the chin again. Yeah. <laughs> That, that, that opened up Deontay's eyes. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Wilder said, hmm. Ortiz more stoic, given the same look, but a consistent look. Wilder trying different looks to see if he can get any openings. Ortiz, a product of the vaunted La Finca, the farm in Cuba, where the top amateurs spend their time training. Good start for the challenger in Brooklyn tonight. since Mike Tyson, 1988, when he had three of the alphabet group belts. The WBO had not established itself at the time, Al, but he's in tough against Luis Ortiz, putting together a series of jabs, and now Deontay Wilder with some histrionics. Well, the present is interesting. He'd like to have some, add some landed punches to that. You know, Wilder is a fascinating training regimen. He, he spars for a week, takes a week off, then spars again. They feel that refresh, refreshes his body and he can work on the mitts and things, and they look at things he didn't spar. It's a fascinating approach. Both of these big punchers, dangerous in the early going. You see the mutual respect on display. A minute gone here in the third round, and it's Deontay Wilder that appears to want to try to find a way to reach Ortiz despite that reach advantage, Paul. Yeah, not, not a lot going on, and, and, and it's been Ortiz bringing the fight forward. Yeah, the occasional body shot. Well, they got 130 punches thrown overall in this fight, 13 more for Ortiz, so they, they're not, it's not a volume punching fight, that's for sure. But I, I like the start Ortiz has had so Yes. Yeah, for him, this this is the, the tempo we'd like to set in terms of uh, uh, getting some jabs in and landing some some kind of almost getting in with that left hand. And remember when or when Wilder faced the last southpaw Arthur Spielka here at Barclays, he had issues in the in the early going before starching them in the ninth, and the crowd at Barclays yeah. getting a little restless and at what they perceived to be a, a lack of action. Spielka was a little bit of a different kind a different of style fight. But, sure. yeah, but that doesn't do your point. It, 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 he's still facing a lefty, and and yes, that is that was an issue. And Deontay, one thing he's having trouble with is getting the jab established. Yes, exactly. A lot of touching of the probe, of, of the lead hands, not a lot of snapping jabs. Yeah, correct. And that's kind of a staple. Triple jab by Ortiz. Kind of a staple for Deontay when he's on. His jab is really snappy. Combination for Wilder that scores. Oh, 
Hey, go. Let him 30 go. seconds left in the third round, so less than 30 seconds for Wilder. Prediction to come true. A tentative start for the heavyweight champion. Assessing the lay of the land here as Ortiz comes forward and misses with the left hand. It's So Ortiz and Wilder still getting to know each other here in Brooklyn. Yeah, bro. There's Luis Ortiz's daughter who suffers from a skin disorder and she is doing so well. One of the, the biggest reasons that Ortiz Defected from Cuba, went through Mexico where he was kidnapped, believe it or not, escaped his captors and made it to the American border by foot. Okay, keep using the left jab. That way you prepare the right. So start working the body and then you go upstairs. He's, he's waiting for that one so he can hammer you, so just listen to me. Right there, right there, right there, right there, right there, right there. Bell in round four. Official attendance tonight, 14,069. The second highest boxing crowd attendance ever here at Barclays Center, just behind Keith Thurman and Danny Garcia. So they come out in full force to support this heavyweight title fight between undefeated knockout artists. And there, while they're putting together a combination on Ortiz, is, for the most part, they are still taxiing the one way out. You know, uh, Paulie mentioned Wilder having a hard time landing the jab. In his title fights, he averages 8.6 jabs landed per round. So far tonight, going into this round, he had only landed three That's jabs around. A right hand by Wilder. Yeah, and, that, and you're, you're saying the straight right hand, you're probably thinking the straight right hand Wilder landed about 20 seconds ago. It didn't have an effect on Ortiz. But if you notice, Wilder is not putting the same emphasis on the right hand because he's he's bracing in case he misses. He doesn't want to be out of position for a, a sharp counter from Ortiz. So it's still a respect to Ortiz that Wilder is not throwing as hard as he would like to because he's got to brace in case he misses. Both of these heavyweights have been down once in their respective careers. Wilder, body language showing that he wants Ortiz to come forward. Of course, Ortiz, a competent, very good yeah. counter-puncher. Wilder wants to counter him with the right hand, but Ortiz is not following his lead. Ortiz needs to get the jab working again. That's something he's not done so much in this round. Just past the midpoint of the fourth round. Again, there's that left hand, but Wilder off balance. Ortiz will not follow his punches in. It's almost like he doesn't want to get on the inside against Wilder. Well, he's playing the position game right now. Yeah. He's got Wilder backing up. He's, he's winning the real estate battle. He's putting Wilder when he wants to put him. And maybe this is something for later on in the fight. Yeah, possibly. The trap. That could be. But, you know, when two big punchers, you're not always trying to risk it and, and, and try to get all the extra. That's a good back. combination by the Southpaw Ortiz. Under a minute left in the fourth. Wilder along the ropes. Pawing with the jab. What you eventually need to start seeing Wilder do is when he makes Ortiz miss, he's got to start countering, right? Yeah, got to put that right hand to the chamber. Right now, Ortiz comes in with these double jabs, and Wilder's just content to get up to all the ground. Eventually, he's going to start holding his ground and counter with something. Otherwise, Ortiz will keep winning the real estate battle. 30 seconds left in the fourth. I mentioned controlled geography for Wilder. He's not necessarily doing that in this no, fight. He's doing the controlling the real estate. Kind of left hand block. Oh, oh, oh. Pushes Ortiz push, 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 push. and is admonished by referee David Fields, who has 18 years' experience. He worked the Anthony Joshua Vladimir Klatchko fight of the year last year, a modern day heavyweight classic. And of course, Joshua will face fellow undefeated champion Joseph Martin.
this is round number five. Deontay Wilder's trainer, Mark Breland, the 1984 gold medalist, former two-time welterweight champion, known for his rapier jab. I'm sure he'd like to see his protege establish that jab here in round five. You know, Deontay Wilder mentioned in his interview with Jim Gray that part of the reason his weight was less was that they had some stomach issues that maybe made him lose a little weight, a little, maybe a little flu, whatever. The question is going to be, will that impact him in terms of stamina as this fight was, was on? We'll see. I'll tell you what, the pace of the fight hasn't really been. No. Something that should affect anybody. No, it shouldn't. Yeah. We'll see how this fight plays around. Yeah. 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 The crowd here at Barclay Center agrees with that point, Paul. <laughs> Well, what makes this fight, what keeps you interested in this fight is that One you punch. feel like any right, anybody can land something. Oh, and remember, the uppercut from Ortiz, that left uppercut on Brian Jennings led to his demise and almost cut Wilder there. Ortiz on his toes. Now. Yeah, that was interesting. And Ortiz attacking the body, now the double jab. It changed the dynamic of this fight a little bit. Yeah, and you see the double jab putting Wilder out of position a little bit. He's going to eventually, like I said, have to start holding his ground and try to counter in with that right hand. Wilder needs an uptick in his offense, continues to back up. Pressure being put on by Luis Ortiz. Right now, Deontay hasn't given Ortiz anything to create doubts from coming forward and pressuring and, and winning this real estate battle, so to speak. And Wilder has to, has to do something or show Ortiz something to where he starts to question himself coming forward. Midpoint of round number five. Right hand by let me show you something. These, these counters are from Ortiz may not always land, but they get the point across. And he's reactive every time Wilder throws a punch, and it's going to keep Wilder second-guessing himself when he wants to throw. So little offense coming from Wilder. It's not that Ortiz is strong a million punches, but Wilder is just not doing that much offensively in this fight. Well, Wilder called Ortiz the boogeyman. He's treating him like that right now, not wanting to have any much to do with Luis Ortiz. I'll tell you, it's because of the way Ortiz reacts when Wilder throws a punch. He's always ready to counter. Even if the counter doesn't land, Wilder rec recognizes the counter shoots back. Ortiz fainting more, and I think that's part of the Ortiz 
and not losing positioning when Wilder throws these punches. And it's when Wilder perceives to have his opponent hurt out that he gets what many people call reckless, although he says there is a method to the madness. It's controlled chaos. Well, we'll see if Ortiz can take advantage of that. Wilder is certainly up in the air. Left hook to the body, that's a rare very punch rare. for Deontay yeah. Wilder, and it was countered by Ortiz yeah. up there with the, the right jab. Behind the guard for Ortiz. Action picking up here a bit in round six after Wilder dropped Ortiz in the final seconds of the fifth frame. Ortiz is making Wilder move with the fence, but then not able to follow up with punches after he does that. Final minute of the sixth, they exchange jabs. Wilder attacking the shoulder of Ortiz with that jab. Well, while it's not a scoring blow, it's, it's softening him up. It's, yeah, it's not really so much as, not so much to soften him up, but also to just a range finder, sure. you know, keeping the guy in range. If you can touch him, you know you can shoot a right hand. Malik Scott, who lost to Ortiz by de uh, decision and was knocked out Some by Wilder. ambulance affair. Yeah, says there's no oh, 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 the exchange. And they are loading up now, here in the sixth. Malik Scott said there's a different level with Wilder, but right now Ortiz is closing that level a little And Ortiz survived the knockdown in the fifth, coming back here in the final stage of the sixth. Step up. Let's see how reactive Ortiz is. since Brooklyn's Shannon Briggs making the seventh defense of his title as we bring our unofficial scorer, Steve Farad Hinn. How do you have it at the midpoint, Steve? Most fascinating fight to score because the rounds Wilder has won, the fifth and sixth, he's won by a mile. The rounds Ortiz won, he won by a few inches. Yet still, I gave Ortiz the first four rounds. I still have him ahead despite that 10-8 round for Wilder in the fifth. Wilder became the first undefeated American to win a heavyweight title since the first ever Southpaw heavyweight champion Michael Moore in 1994. Of course, Ortiz tonight would love to join Moore, Chris Bird, Sultan Ibragamov, Ruslan Chagayev, and Corey Sanders as Southpaw heavyweight champions. Normally, Wilder, 48% of the punches Wilder lands are jabbed. Tonight, 18% are landed or jabs. 31% for him are power punches going to show stack. So it's been a different dynamic, partially because he's facing a lefty. Polly, talk about adjustments that you would like to see both Wilder and Ortiz make here down the stretch. Well, Ortiz has to start being careful with those straight rights because they're starting to find home a little more often. And if Deontay gets the right amount of drive on one of them, it could be good night for Ortiz. Or, you know, Ortiz, I think, is, 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 is doing a fine job with the real estate battle, aside from taking those right hands. Wilder, on the other hand, you'd like to see him establish that jab a little more, and he's attempting it this round, because that jab is the key to him landing a straight right hand, because it establishes not only the proper distance, but also controls Ortiz and keeps him put for that right hand to follow. Ortiz has not gotten leverage on his left hand like he wants to in this fight. And he's never gotten on the inside, not at all, which I still believe he's gonna need, he, he should be doing in this fight. That's where he can go to the body and he might be able to land that left uppercut and some other good punches. He needs to navigate a minefield of power as Ortiz, a little fainting, 
flashes the jab. Wilder blocks it. Wilder unloads the right hand.
Nice little break, brother. Watch out, watch out. Don't, tell him don't hit on the break, right? Do your job.
UFC Heavyweight Championship. Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Deontay Wilder defending his belt for the seventh time against Luis Ortiz, looking to make history, looking to become the first Cuban born heavyweight champion of the world. Of course, Teofilo Stevenson, Felix Savon, amazing Cuban heavyweights who never turned pro as they were, of course, loyal to the communist regime of Fidel Castro. Yeah, he has a chance to make history as you put out. You know, 60 of the 139 power punches by Ortiz have landed, 43%. 43% is a very nice percentage. Jab lands for Wilder. And that's what Wilder has to do to stop getting out success. He's got to make that jab consistent. Almost the same 
many times. Right. Right. Medical right. attention they could get here in the United States to get goosebumps. You think about that. You see that hug exactly. Yes, goosebumps watching the hug like that because they're brothers of more than just sharing a ring with each other. The numbers, both men landing power punches on power punches, everything but a jab. 42% landing power shots at 14, 39% for Wilder. Both men landed big power punches. At the end of the day, Wilder's power punches were more dramatic, and that's why this man, Luis Ortiz, does not become the first Cuban to win the heavyweight championship, though he came very close for a while now. It started with Anthony Joshua's dramatic victory over Vladimir Klitschko. It continues here tonight with Deontay Wilder defeating Luis Ortiz, and Wilder now oh. sets himself up for what will be one of the biggest heavyweight title fights in recent memory, facing the winner of Joshua or Parker. In the water with no label on it. Yes, we certainly do. And of course, we go like a girl. Thirty first, the other part of the equation. Let's take a look back at the first time that he would hit the canvas, Luis Ortiz. He was hurt in this round, and he was hurt with the right hand, and not not only right hands but the left hooks as well. And we haven't seen too many left hooks from Wilder in general. And I'm scared to catch like a girl. Not Ortiz down. The right hand. Still the first knockdown in this round as we take a look at it. Ortiz, as you point out, is still calm looking in the corner, but couldn't. And also another thing, this started a few seconds earlier when he landed that right hand. He was upset as a counter, and it was Ortiz who moved into it. This again is still the first knockdown in that round. The straight right hand that him kind of off the temple. That kid got him into some, he was already been in some trouble. That left hook exactly. had been in some trouble earlier, and this is why Wilder got so brave in throwing those combinations at center ring, because he already knew Ortiz was hurt here. And at that moment, Luis Ortiz hurt more than he had been, I think, at any point in the fight. And then Ortiz would uh, again be hit with the right hand and hurt him, and the wild attack of Wilder still is landing. And at this point, Ortiz not able to come. And ultimately, a right up cut a punch that Morrow referenced earlier in the fight that could be a factor, was in fact something that Wilder used to knock him down. And, and we'll take another, another look at it. It's, you know, the, the roundhouse, right, which as you point out, Paul, isn't always his most effective, right? But with Ortiz in trouble, it was just going to let already hurt. Yeah, and even, even the previous knockdown in center ring, he had already been hurt when, he came, when Wilder came off the ropes of that right hand. And that's why Wilder, once he's confident, he knows he has you hurt, he'll let, the, he'll let off all, the entire arsenal. And there, Ortiz not able to continue. Referee stopping the fight. And uh, Deontay Wilder made his comeback after a very rocky seventh round was able to come back and win. Don't call it a comeback. Call it the seventh successful title defense for Deontay Wilder. Let's make it official for Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the time of two minutes, five seconds in round number ten. Our referee in charge, David Fields, stops the contest. He is going to buy a way of technical knockout and still the undefeated WBC.
This unification bound is sanctioned by the WBA. President Gilberto Jesus Mendoza. Supervisor is Robert Mack. The IBF President Daryl Peoples. Supervisor Randy Newman. The IBO President Ed Levine. Supervisor Jorge Alonso. And the Nevada State Athletic Commission. The chairman is Anthony Marnell III. Executive Director is Bob Bennett. Introducing our three judges. Scoring this bout from ringside. From Reno, Nevada, Bert Clements. From Avon, Connecticut, Glenn Feldman. And from Las Vegas, Nevada, Dave Moretti. We introduce our third man to the ring, the referee in charge of the action, Kenny Bayless. All right, fans, here we go with the main event of the evening, 12 rounds of boxing for the unified IBF, WBA, and IBO 154-pound championship of the world. And now, ladies and gentlemen in attendance and boxing fans joining us around the world, live from the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's showtime! <laughs> Introducing to you first on my left, fighting out of the red corner, wearing black trunks with orange trim, fighting out of Acoqueque, Prince George's County in Maryland. He weighed in at already 153 pounds, he is undefeated in his campaign in the ring with a record of 21 wins, no losses, and 15 wins coming by way of knockout. Tonight he is looking to unify the titles in his second defense of his belt. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the reigning, the defending, and the undefeated IBF Junior Middleweight Champion of the World, introducing Swift, Jerry. reigning 154 pound world title holder tonight making his seventh world title appearance ladies and gentlemen please welcome the WBA and IBO super welterweight champion of the world introducing Ellis Lundy the American dream and once again the referee in charge now to give instructions. Okay, guys, trunks are good on this side. Trunks are good on this side. Now, gentlemen, we went over the rules in the dressing room. I want to caution you again to keep this fight clean at all times, protect yourself at all times, and what I say, you must obey. Good luck to both of you. Touch them up. And with that, we are set to go with our main event of the evening. And what an interesting matchup this should be. Heard will be the aggressor. He says he's got to win the early rounds because he wants to make Lara fight late in the fight. As to Lara, as Jimmy Landon Jr. pointed out, he is the longest reigning junior middleweight champion. He wants to break the record of Giancarlo Rossi of 11 title defense is this is number seven and here we go Barry, that's my boy no. <laughs> John, John, John Franco, Franco. John Franco. Right. I remember him well we, you and I did a bunch of his yes, fights we did. did we not yes, we back did. in the day you know Hurt is averages 62 punches a round and Lara averages 41 but fighters like Lara end up making fighters less volume punchers. We'll see if he does that to her. Yep. And then it's really mainly sharp counter punching. That was not enough. Uh, mainly sharp counter yeah. punching and ability to control range. Yeah. And distance. And that's a lot of specialty. Yeah, as, as we said earlier, Alaro's a guy, he didn't really care much about style points. He wants to win a fight. And he's really a professional. 
Double left hand. You know, Jared Hurd, honestly, he has defensive issues, and you can hit him. Uh, and sometimes it's almost, it's a kind of an aphrodisiac. You want to keep hitting him so you stay in the pocket too long. That's what happened to Tony Harrison. That's what happened to Austin Trout. Lara is more disciplined than that. You see that? He can land punches. But here's what you can't do against Jared Hurd. It's hard to knock him out, and it's hard to keep him behind. Those are some pretty good left hands, though, and they got him going backwards. And I tell you, Lara even followed up with that combination. You usually don't see that from Lara. You know, he usually he's, yeah. he's touching and moving, touching and moving, and you keep the pressure on him. But I think he's trying to establish to Hurd that he doesn't want to be pressured like that all night. So let's see. Yeah, I will maintain that. And you know what? That was all great, and you're all 100% correct. But I will go back to the Tony Harrison Austin Chow fight. You know, you got to do a lot to discourage this guy. And they were whacking him around the whole fight. But we'll see. I think that's a real big key is how hard Lara has to work to get these early rounds. If he has yes. to work too hard, the late rounds could be a, a bit of suffering. You know, like a jab by Lara. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. right. That's what I thought the problem with Harrison and, and Trout ran right. into was they worked too hard to win the early rounds. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and credit to Hurd for forcing that. Yes. Um, and then uh, they kind of ran out of gas and Hurd's pressure was consistent. I thought Austin Trout's comments, and Austin Trout thought both these guys. He said about Larry, he said he's all left hand, his right hand is just a decoy. He has thrown one or two right hands here, but that's a pretty accurate statement so far. Yeah, he's like what, you know, what I like to call an old school left uh, southpaw. You know, the old school southpaws didn't have a, much of a right hook or whatnot. You see these new school southpaws like Pacquiao, like Devin Alexander, guys like that, uh, or, uh, even others, you know, that uh, they kind of use the right hook as well. Very effective first round here for Lara. Hurd's not throwing the left hook there. He should be, and there he is. Really good first round. Victory. We will take a look at what these fighters need to do to be effective. We'll start with Erslandi Lara. Uh, staying off the ropes is important. He did that for the most part in round number one. And combination punching, we did see that from him in that first round, and he was very, very effective at it. Don't celebrate early. You cannot think you've got Jared Hurd beat. I beating him over the course of rounds. He'll come back. And for Hurd, cut off the ring. He was able to do that in the second part of the round. This he did not try once in that first round. He was in position to do it. Did not try the double left hook. He needs to throw that. And the uppercut is a very big punch for him, and it can land against Lara. Two. Jared Hurd is a notoriously slow starter, and we saw evidence of that there. But you know, he's cutting the distance on Lara pretty easily. He just hasn't been able to land yet. Right hand to Lara. That's not a knockdown either. Quick on the left hand. For the first time, Hurd can unload, but Lara covers up very well. Nothing getting there. The right hand did get there a little bit. But it's something a little different from Lara than usual. He's getting in the high glove guard, and he's holding his ground. Yeah, very uh, Now, there's that, double, there's that left hook downstairs by Hurd. And I'll tell you what that's from. I don't think he wants to get, let Hurd get too comfortable bringing the pressure and, and keep on walking back and getting into that comfortable momentum. Okay. and James DeGale. Jim, what do you got? Very, very unique situation here. In fact, I've never heard of this, but Tom Brown, one of the promoters of tonight's fight, said both James DeGale and Caleb Truax shared the same ambulance going to University Medical Center to get checked out. Wow. When was the last time you saw that? I hope there were no headbutts during that ride. <laughs> 
Bird, meantime, a wild right hand. This is interesting. This is unlike what we see from Arislan De Lara. This is a whole different kind of fight. He's on the inside. We're, we're having two fighters, you know, working on the inside like this. And the question is, can this be effective for Lara for the whole fight? We'll find out. Pretty effective right now. He had a right That's hand right. lead there and then came with a left uppercut. Another good left hand. He's been very sharp. And hard, hard to remind this. No, it is okay. Hard to want to already overwork so that way he gets tired just like the other opponents do. Jared Hurd doesn't wake up till the fourth round. Yeah. And, and then he, he so, you know, unless he gets hurt, this will this will be fine for Arslan De Lara for about three or four rounds. And from Lara's perspective, he's doing this so Hurd doesn't get too comfortable. Yeah, forward. absolutely. So both guys have a reason, and both guys can be happy with this kind of fight. You're 100% correct. Uh, we'll see who gets the better results later. So far, though, it is Lara, and that was a good shot. I thought Lara going backward. Head up, stepped on the foot. There's that uppercut from her. That's a good right hand from her. Lara backs up. That brings the crowd to its feet. It's a very poor hold. Remember, this is a unification bout for the IBF and the WBA. Super well away, 154 pound title, and here are the other champions, yeah, Javel Charles. You know, that's the guy that Norris Lundy Lara indicates yeah. he would like to have. Yeah, and her too, and we will be seeing Javel Charles on, on our air coming up, so he's going to get a chance to show his wares again. And my gosh, she's been very impressive in his recent fights. I mean, extremely impressive. <laughs> Dance. Yeah, I'm going to go. Hey, look. Hey, 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 at this point now, favors her, but will it in fact be still work for him? And Lara's languishing on these ropes now a lot. The crafty so far taking away yes. the play. Her <laughs> got into the combination and then got out, but now he takes two shots from Lara. What I don't see her doing yet really well is getting down and digging with those left hooks to the body and the head. He's done it occasionally, but not as much as he wanted to. I think he's going to need Lauer to tire a little bit, so he's kind of shifting. Yeah. Even, even uh, Lauer is holding his ground a little bit, he's still shifting with his upper body and smothering and whatnot. And Jack tried it there. There it is. Oh, and he came with the uppercut ball. He did. Partially caught that one. And that's what happens when Lauer is not shifting. <laughs> But for the most part, he has been. Yeah. Well, left hand takes a left hand from her. I think early on, it's see, see Lara going up and down with defense. But yeah, I think early on, that's the trick for Lara. He's going to hold his ground a little bit, be shifting with his upper body. And they want it. They want to touch jabs from uh, her. There's her working well. Yeah. They want to get inside. They want touch jabs from him to work his way in. But you know, he's able to kind of walk in there and do what he try to do what he wants. From the body shots from her. I'll tell you, Barry, if, if Lara is a briefcase guy, Hurd is a lunch pail guy. Yes. He comes, he packs a lunch, and goes to work. Yes. And, and he doesn't care how he gets it done. He just gets it done. <laughs> and, you know, Jared Hurd doesn't have the best form of every of any fighter in the world. But you see, he comes to work. Look at him. He's just going to stand there and keep punching and see what he can make happen. Oh, good counter shot by Lara there. Yes. There's a right hand by Lara. Yeah, he does have a tendency to screw a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, Jared Hurd has defensive issues beyond all get out, but, you know, at the end of the day, he makes up for it, right? Well, mostly does. Always, but we'll see if he does it in this fight. That's a competitive fight so far. Yeah, very fun fight to watch, too.
almost got there. He just barely did. And then it shows both guys are sharp and reacting. Birded pursuit by. Watch the color in this fight as Jared Hurd attacks Hurd jacking from the left-handed stance, and he will switch from time to time. And you see, he leaves himself wide open there. And here's Lara with a uh, good combination punch. The first punch got there, but Jared Hurd. Showing his good counter punching. The right hand, the, the left hand got there by Lara, but there's the right hand by her. Now that was a really good right hand. And Lara, tough, tough guy. He took that punch. He took different styles of counter punching. Yes. Yeah, a half step back, getting out just out of range as Hurd falls in and occupies that little step that he just stepped back and he was falls into the punches of Lara. And then Hurd's style of counter punching, kind of a touch and shoot where he doesn't want to give ground. He wants to maintain the physical presence in front of Lara and then shoot that counter. Round four. Two of Third's last three opponents have been lefties, Jojo Dan and Austin Trout. So he's been in against a lot of left lefties. The Lara is the classic left-hander. You see how physically he has large and small the hard pushes him off. Hurts landing some nice shots on the inside of Lara taking them. Which usually means I feel I think you're trying to tell him you're swatting at me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mike Tyson, great heavyweight champion. Mike, what do you think of what you're seeing here? Hey, Jim, I'm watching two good fighters fight. You know, I heard of her and I saw man Landy fight before, and it turned out to be a good fight. It looks like we're going to have a big heavyweight fight coming up between Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua. How would you see that fight if they're able to put it together? You know, um, Joshua looks like he's the guy to do it, but his last fight, he didn't impress me in his last fight. And what are your thoughts on, on Deontay now that he's a 10-year pro? Well, he's, he's improving. He's getting better. How would you rate the fight? Close fight? 
knockout. Somebody gets knocked out. <laughs> Could either of them compete with you back in the day? Hey, I don't know. I have to be there. <laughs> It's always good to see you, Mike. Look forward to seeing you soon. Hey, and good luck to the Hall of Fame. That's an that's a awesome step. Congratulations. Thank you. I look forward to you being there for the induction. Absolutely. All right, Barry, back to you. All right, Jim, thanks very much. Well, I agree with Mike. Somebody's getting knocked out in that fight. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think you're right. And so is he. This is round five. That has been a very entertaining fight. If they're disappointed with anything in Hurd's camp, I think it's that he hasn't used that jab as much as they wanted him to in different varieties. Stepped into the right hand. Laura misses the left. Laura giving him a little more movement now in this round. Laura getting off just before Hurd can set his feet. At least in the beginning of this round, and he's, he's disrupting her. Well, now her is well, he's at his feet as well. All of those that were caught either on the gloves or the elbows of Lara. So he's ripping those left hooks downstairs, and that's what he needs to do. Some of those are getting through, and, and he's got to double with that punch. See, he's not doubling with it. If he doubled with it, he might catch him in the head with it. With a chopping right hand from Lara. I love how Lara just pulled with the glove yeah. first. He moved, moved her left glove out of the way with his right glove and then hooked with it. <laughs> yeah. No, he's he's slick as could be, and he's you know he's standing right in there with this big man, this big 154 pounder who wants to put the pressure on. The right hand by Hurd. And this is how Hurd has worn down his other opponents. Yes, I mean, this consistent pressure, both physical and mental. And you made the point, making them work hard to win these early runs. That's what he said his game plan was. That's what he told us. A nice flip to the body and a right to the head. By her. Austin shot faced both these men. And even though uh, Lara hurt him uh, in the fight, he said her to punch his harder than Lara. Oh, yeah, why not? It's been fun to watch. Good fight, yeah. Combination from Lara. Third back with the right hand. Here, missed the uppercut. Takes a right hand from Lara. That's Tony Southwell here. Done! Very close round. We'll see how the jab has figured into this fight uh, as we see Hurd using his jab and that counter from, uh, from Lara. The jab is a range finder, but it doesn't get there. And then Lara counters with his own jab and lands a left hand after it. And later on, Hurt being very busy, leaving some shots on the inside, keeping his hands moving. That was a good right hand. And then when he's on the inside, he wants to land that uppercut in the left hook. That was an awkward left hook. A lot of arm punching by Hurt, but still throwing. Yeah, and he, 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 one a big thing I noticed on the inside, he's able to outwork Lara. You know, he's he's yeah. he's getting off a little bit more. Sometimes Lara's a bit more accurate, but it's hard to separate them when they're that close for a big part of the round. So we come to round six. A tempo fight right from the get-go. You know, we talked about her averaging 62 punches per round. Well, in this fight, he is throwing 58.8 punches per round, so it's not too far off. And for him, that's a good sign that he's been able to do that against Lara. There 
Ruslandi Lara fighting this kind of fight, let me say this, if he's able to win this kind of a fight against Sharon Hurd, it will be even something added to his repertoire. legacy yeah. and his repertoire. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll tell you why he's kind of forced to fight this kind of fight. Hurd is a tough guy to time. He's a little yeah. bit awkward. Maybe the late start in boxing again, these kind of guys are a little bit awkward and difficult to time because they do some unconventional stuff. Lara knows how to time the conventional stuff, but it seems like Hurd stands, he switches stances, he walks in, throws punches, got these long arms. So at times, if it kind of, I think, and plus the pressure, I think it forces Lara to lead a lot more than he wants to. But he is doing that, and he's being somewhat effective. Oh, absolutely. Which brings back to Al's point, it would be a wrinkle in his, a feather in his hat if he's able to win a fight like this. Yeah. Been very effective in this round. Nothing big, but getting through. The heart's still consistent. Oh, yeah. And those body shots, those left hooks are great. He has to come with, he has to double with that punch. That's what Angulo did. That's why he was able to be so effective with the left hook. And they studied that Angulo film. The video, I should say, film will date me, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Slipped in two, three times by Hurd. Nothing serious. Oh, 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 oh. He's thinking about Hurd. This should have hurt him, shouldn't it? I mean, Laura can't punch a little bit. He's... Maybe, maybe he, uh, he kept walking through it, but you don't want to hear a lot of it. No. Nice right hand by Hurd. Wow. Yeah, he's already set everything up upstairs. Both men have been hit with big shots in this round. Hurt, Hurt feels it now. Let's see if he, he really did hurt Lara. Looking for that right uppercut. Yeah, yeah, almost had it there. Lara holding a little bit. Hurt's probably saying, I'm the guy who throws the uppercuts. Well, you, <laughs> you got yeah. some nerve hitting me with one. Exactly. Lara started out this round well, but Hurt's closed it well. Yeah, again, there have been a lot of very close rounds in this fight. Yeah, and then the Lara family looking out with uh, a little concern. Come on, man. Hey, listen to me. You just keep talking right there, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything is good. Yeah, good. All this time, breaking all your good time, and then it all. Both men landed some very, very good punches. This is Lara with that uppercut that we talked about that landed so well. And as we said, Lara Hurt thinks he's the uppercut guy. But then here comes Jared Hurt back again. And well, he's, he's hit with that big uppercut by Lara. And then later, now, we we'll get Jared Hurt doing his work. Lands that really nice right hand. And that was started a good sequence for him. So we come to the second half of this fight, round seven. Watch and see. But another one of those very difficult fights yeah. to score, I've got to think. We're trying to, whatever movement Lara does give, he's trying to cut it off. There's not that much of it for Lara, and he is, he has been caught on the ropes a lot, and yet, you know, this, he's been able to counter off those ropes. Combination there by Hood. Lara gets out of there. Let's bring in Steve Farhood, our unofficial scorer. Steve, how are you seeing this thing so far? Well, Barry, there certainly have been difficult rounds to score. I have Lara ahead 58-56. For clean, effective punching, his left hand has been the best punch in the fight. But a reminder, Lara's been in a lot of close and controversial decisions in his career. This may end up being another one. Who knows? Yeah, I would think very tough fight for the judges. That was a good left hand by Lara. I want to think of Hurd by Hurd. Yeah, I think Jared Hurd, this is the part of the fight where normally Jared Hurd starts to really get his mojo working. And I thought he did win the last round, as Steve thought. And uh, in this round, he's doing pretty well. He just backed off of Lara. Yeah, that was intriguing. Both men fainting a lot. Yeah. This is as long range as this fight has been in. Oh. interesting, I'll tell you. Because the Lara needs all the time he gets. If you give Lara time, he'll yeah, yeah, absolutely look watch you. Smart by Lara. He overshot the left hand, but 
grabbed the heart in the headlock so that he couldn't get back and get into his better position. Come on, work out, fellas. You're clean. Work out. Force the reset. A little short uppercut. There's another one. You know, Lara normally lands 49% uh, of his power punches, which is anything other than jab. He's landing at 41% tonight, so he's close to that figure. Good right hand by Lara. Missed the uppercut. Got there with a left hand. Missed two more. This is a round, though, which Lara has stayed off the ropes pretty much the whole round. Where Hill took about a half step back and took a deep breath. There's yeah. another attack and another one. Yeah, I agree with you, but now he's coming on. <laughs> nice combination of gun by Lara. Left uppercut, he doesn't get the left hand back. That is a solid short right hand. And I mean, look at Lara, he's, he's a tough customer. He is a tough customer. Lara never changes expression. During the fight, no. before the fight, after the fight. You said at our final meeting that he's the guy you want to have on your team playing poker. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, Ernesto Rodriguez t t has told us that, you know, Jared Hurt is, oh, look at him go after us. That, you know, he has gotten better and better, and they feel like he is coming right into his prime. And right now in this round, he's in his prime. Yeah, those punches were all getting through the guard of water. Yeah, that's what you said a couple of rounds where you start to get into his groove at this point in the fight. And guys are usually starting to fatigue because they've been fought out so hard to win that early part of the fight. So. And Lara had a very good, I thought that last round he did some pretty good work. A nice left hand by Lara. Yes. Shot from her, slipped the right hand in. And these two have gone past seven rounds. Heard undefeated with three knockouts after the seventh round. And Lara, 10 2 and 2. Jared's known as the guy that gets to you eventually, but can he do that against Lara? That's the question. Nice combination there. Started with a body shot, came upstairs with two, and then back downstairs. Jared Hurd has been much more active in this round. He's thrown almost 40. He's thrown 40 punches already. It's only 12 for Law. So this is a turnaround from the last round. And using the jab is Hurd. Yeah. I'm really using the jab. This is the part of this is the part of the fight where Jared Hurd normally shines. Well, he's doing that right now. Trying to, trying to stop this distance and create some space for his right hand. Got to stay shifty though. His punches landed round by round according to the show stats, and you can see how it's fluctuated. Not a huge difference in the punches landed for the most part, though this round clearly we see a huge difference as that count continues. Good right hand there by Lara. win this last minute pretty big to win this round, but still. Good right hand by Hurd. Yeah, a little fake and then a right hand. Nice uppercut. Nothing huge. He's always on you, Jared Hurd. Very good round for him. And I think part of the 
reason it's been so good is he's used his jab very effectively. Yeah, he's been able to extend that right hand for the shots. Stalking the bar. Good body shot with the left hand. It's still a little wide. That's an excellent round for Jared Hurd. And we're going to remind you of just a couple of weeks for the beginning of another triple header. The main event featuring Adrian Broner as he goes against Jesse Vargas in a 12 round welterweight bout. The co feature, Jonathan Milbert, Jerome Charlie, fighting Hugo Centeno Jr. And in the opening bout, two of the former world champions is Jerome Javante Davis and Sir Jesus Cuellar for the vacant WBA Super Featherweight title. Coming up on April 21st, right here on the show. Yeah, <laughs> 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 This is round nine. Heard with arguably his best round of the fight in the last. Threw over 85 punches, landed many, and Ernesto Rodriguez, you heard him say he's done. They think Lara is really tired, and that they can go after him now. We'll see. Well, five jabs. Yeah, he's, he's, popping. he's popping that jab. And a good straight right hand in the middle of that. Two more jabs, three jabs. The question we have to ask ourselves, is Arislandi Lara not moving a lot in this fight like we've always seen him because he can't or he doesn't want to? I think he's just going to expend a lot of energy moving against hard because he'll continue to cut off the ring and make it physical. So you almost can't consistently move. Even if you want to, you need to get your respect from this guy. Even though even when you're standing your ground, it's hard to get your respect anyway. Yeah, right. Good straight left hand from Lara. The other question is, how many rounds did Lara bank previous to this? Hurt is certainly doing what he normally does, coming out in the second portion of, of the fight. This is what I like to call youthful enthusiasm, too. The younger, yes. guy, the younger guy just you know, has that extra passion and, and, and will. Uh, as the older guy kind of starts to fade, we'll see if Lara can get a second win. But this is, this is why this is a young man's sport, as are most all sports. To the other thing, Jared Hurt has landed so many solid left hooks to the body, and that's got to be having a, 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 an effect on Lara. I mean, they've been ripping shots. He's been very effective here. Another big round for Jared Hurd. Now there's some swelling around the eyes of Lara. Yes, and the right eye especially. Yeah. Oh, he's, those are wicked body shots. And he's going to try to make you miserable this in this end of the fight now. Yeah. That's just what he throws on. He has a great job of it. Last two rounds, he's been dominant. <laughs> He's just... There's a good left hand from Lara, but he gets two in return. Oh. You can hit Jared Hurd, man, but I'm telling you, that's why I said in round one, two, and three. And there's a perceptible swelling yeah. under and over the right eye of Lara. Lara's standing his ground. He's fighting like a man, but boy, it's tough against this young guy. This is not Arislandi Lara's normal game. No, and, and you pose the question, Alan. I mean, how did the judges see the early round? Right. And the question is, too, can Lara would sustain this to, to last 12 rounds? Well, he told us he thought he could. Nice uppercut again. He's just standing there and just firing shots. Now uh, takes two from Lara in return. That uppercut has been a big weapon for her. There's a head in there, too. Yeah, we've seen a few of those coming. Yeah. Yeah. Hard lets Bayless know what the bell is. Yeah. Hey, yo, watch those. <laughs> Should I saw the last one, fight? One, one. <laughs> Come on, Bob, get in. No, no, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, this, this round here, I want you on the outside boxing this round, okay? I want you to look, you gotta use that jab now, okay? You gotta let your jab work, okay? Just keep boxing for me. Give me a quick. The 
pressure of Jared Hart. Obviously, I'm okay. He's never won. He's never won. He's never won. Just consistent. And he gets on the ropes. He's doing what he does. Left hooks and uppercuts. Those have been the big weapons. And just constantly throwing, ripping those body shots in the right uppercuts and making things tough for Law on the inside. Law will come with his punches, but they're just not that many. This is round 10. And Hurt comes out firing. How many punches, Barry Tompkins, do you think Hurt threw in that last round? I'm going to say close to 100. Exactly 100. Whoa. You, sir, are a genius. I did not work either. I didn't No, he didn't sneak. He landed 34, <laughs> by the way, according to Joe Stats. And he was opening that big right. time. The reason why he's able to throw so many punches out is because they're not all hard, though. He yes. does a great job of absolutely all the punches, too. Yeah, you're totally right about that. I think a lot of complaining about another head back there. It's just right hand after right hand. We've not seen Larry in this kind of situation. Hurt like this, or with swelling and kind of static, not able to move. That swelling over the right eye is not good. And as a matter of fact, they that I saw between rounds, they didn't get the end swell on the top part. They yeah. got it on the bottom. And like DeGale, whose lead eye had a lot of blood in it, and he probably wasn't able to see. Now I think Lara's going to have a similar problem with the swelling, yeah. as he's not going to be able to see. The difference is, though, Lara can't turn right-handed when he only fights out of the southpaw stance. Hurt has not switched much in this fight to lefty. He did it on a couple of occasions. He will do it occasionally, but he is not tonight. Been so effective as a righty. He is dictating the fight right now. Those left hooks to the body are amazing. Yeah. That's right. Not a big one, but just enough to get your attention. There's a left hand from Lara. Lara on the big attack to Lara. There's Steve Farhood's car, and you can see he's given the last two rounds to Lara. Still has Lara head by a point. Hurt is controlling these rounds right now. And Hurt loves this kind of fight, this battle of attrition kind of fight. You know, it's been kind of the, the, the subject matter of, of the night, this words of attrition. That was a, that was a moment. Jared Hurt threw his crazy wild left hook and got countered by Lara. And that stuff happens to him all the time, but he plays through it. Yeah, he took about a half step back and cranked the left hand. Yeah. He missed with it. Yeah, and then got countered. It was like, okay. Now, Lara has come back a bit in this round. Yes, he has. Double left hand there. Right hand for Lara. That's what Hurd did enough in the early part. Yeah. Have to win the round. This has turned into a very close round now. Man, I, he's, getting, he's getting worse, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did he have this kind of swelling against Paul Williams as well? I don't recall. I, there was a fight I know many people felt that, you know, could have gone the other way. Wow, he's very good second half. He sure is. is. He gets really bad when he got robbed, but I don't yes. know. He doesn't have the high score. Oh, my. Hurd tried it off. He throws it with a flourish as he started it. Oh, that's a fun round of box. That's a... There's a man that could face the winner of this fight. Very possible. I'm on him now. I'm on him now. I'm on him Selling tickets already. Oh, huh? no, not bad. Excellent for sale. Boxing, you see boxing. Very good, very good. Everything looks good. Oh, what is Nothing. 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 Go stand in one spot now. Stand him and step over, okay? No, he's running by the jail all the time. Well, this is in round nine where we had so much action. On the inside, Hurd landing good short shots. That uppercut was ever present. Although there were many good moments for Erslandi Lara in that round as well. That is that could be a pivotal round. Depending on how it's scored. And that eye of Lara is getting worse. Not able to do much between rounds. A lot of standing in the pocket and laugh at James Tony. Yes, <laughs> that's a great analogy. Well, you know, maybe his vision is blocked a little bit when you're in that close. It's a lot easier to hit your man. You risk more, but if you can roll and 
dip and, 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 and pivot like Tony used to do. You can make their aggression count against them even inside. You know, Aristotle and Lara fighting a fight he's not used to fighting against a big, strong young man. He's holding his ground. Very much. So you've got to give him credit for that. You can see Lara passed around in 10. Lara's 5 and 2. Heard is in uncharted waters. That's because usually by this time, Hurd has knocked out his opponent after being way behind, comes back and knocks him out. But even though he's hit Lara with huge shots, Lara has not gone down. No, in fact, I don't think either man has really been hurt in this fight. Not super badly. Another right hand out with swollen eye blue by Hurd. This round, a very close round. Yeah, this is a round that it is, both men have done good work. Hurt is busier. He's been busier in most rounds. Two uppercuts. Lara just laying in there on him. Still firing punches. But Hurt gets there with two more. And, and, and this looks like one of those close Arislandi Lara decisions. Ones that some he's gotten robbed on, some he's gotten the benefit of the doubt on. And, uh, and, and this looks like it's headed in that direction. Jared Hurd has certainly punished Arislandi Lara more than we've seen in a long, long time since the Angulo fight, really. Very much so. That's the kind of thing we can get a rematch out of this fight. Oh, boy, yeah. yeah. Sure, that's a nice left hand from Lara. Is it enough, though? This round is super tight. Hurd with the beginning part. Now this part a little bit for Lara. Also had the moment where he James Tony to two in that round, so yep. on both ways. Final 30 seconds of this round. <laughs> oh, what a uh, the body work of Hurt is just so good. And, and yet Laura is still there. It's yes, time. yes. Wow. Although I, I think Hurd won that round, yeah, personally. Yeah. How'd you see that play? Uh, uh, Luckily, Steve's doing the scoring. He's so good. I don't know how to the scoring. Certainly had moments in that last round, plenty of them, and landed some compelling shots. There's the right hook. And his combination punching has been excellent in spots in this fight. And again, we'll see. I think it's going to be a counter shot. Yeah, right hand, and then countering with the left after Hard leaves that right hand out there. Both men did good work in that last round. Are you talking about some of the He's had three controversial decisions. He had a lot of controls for him. Lara 
does look a little fatigued to me right now. He might be in some, in some danger of getting hit with something big. We'll see. Continuing to dig the uppercuts now. Lara in retreat. What a amazing fight. Right to the head, left to the body. Another right hand there. Now blood from the right of Lara. already this year like it did last year this takes its place with that a lot of mutual respect from trainers and fighters there and why not did this knockdown do enough to get jared Hurd the fight that left hook sent him down and had that Disastrous for yeah. Lara, yeah. Credit to Lara, though. He not only did he get up, oh. he tried to fight until the final belt. Came. And did land punches when he got he up, did. which is extraordinary. And yet another angle as we look at this. A short left hook by set Jared Hurd. Set up by a short right uppercut right. first. They kind of popped the head up of Lara. And that time he knew to put all the weight on the left hook. Nice little setup there by Hurd inside. Look again for the right short right uppercut by Hurd. You'll see it here. It'll do the trick. It'll pop up Lara's chin. And that's the shot right there. Mm. Nice little setup on the inside by Jared Hurd. Jared Hurd sometimes looks like he doesn't pronate those left hooks enough, and yet they're still powerful. And another thing, that uppercut was just a touch shot. That's yes. very interesting yes. about Hurd. He, the last, some of those are always touch shots to open up for the big ones, and that was a great example of it on the knockdown. Mm. All right, let's get to the center of the ring. Here once again, Jimmy Lennon Jr. with the official decision. Jimmy. Ladies and gentlemen, after 12 rounds of action, we have a split decision. Here are the score totals. Judge at ringside, Bert Clements scores them out 114 to 113 in favor of Eris Lundi Lara. 
Junior Green Tide, Glenn Feldman sees it 114 to 113 in favor of Jarrett Hurd. And Judge at ringside, Dave Moretti sees it 114 to 113 in favor of the winner. He is now the WBA, the IBF, and the IBO 154-pound champion of the world, Swift. Introductions will send it to ring announcer. Here is Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to Staples Center as Premier Boxing Champions presents the much anticipated featured bout of the evening, brought to you by MGM Resorts, O'Reilly Auto Parts, and Lucas Oil in a promotion of Man Down Promotions, Sean Porter Promotions, and TGB Promotions. This bout is sanctioned by the WBA, the President, Gilberto Jesus Mendoza, along with the IBF, the President, Daryl Peoples. Introducing our three judges scoring from ringside, Ray Danseco, Larry Hazard Jr., and Steve Weisfeld. All right, fans, here we go with the bout you've all been waiting for. 12 rounds of boxing for the unified welterweight championship of the world. And now, ladies and gentlemen in attendance and boxing fans joining us around the world. I smell the pot. Live from Los Angeles, it's time for the main event of the evening. <laughs> Introducing to you first, fighting out of the red corner, the WBC champion entering the ring wearing gold trunks with white trim, fighting out of Las Vegas, Nevada by way of Cleveland, Ohio. He weighed in at the welterweight limit of 147 pounds. His record stands at 30 wins, two losses, one draw with 17 wins coming by way of knockout. Tonight in his seventh world title appearance, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the two-time welterweight title holder and the current distinguished reigning and defending WBC welterweight champion of the world, introducing Showtime, Sean Porter! And his opponent across the ring of the blue corner, the IBF champion wearing black trunks with white trim, fighting out of it representing Dallas, Texas. He weighed in the same as his opponent, 147 pounds. He is undefeated in his campaign to the ring with a record of 25 wins, no losses, 21 wins coming by way of knockout. He is a 2012 U.S. Olympian, the acclaimed pound for pound star. Tonight, making the fourth defense of his title. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated, reigning and defending IBF welterweight champion of the world. Introducing the truth, Errol Spence Jr. <laughs> Introducing our third man to the ring now to give instructions, Jack Reese. He's coming, Derek coming. Catch him out, peace, say. Out, peace. Derek, Kenny. This, they're right both at the line. He just shoved them down. They're going to come up. I'm going to let them work in here. Okay? I gave you both instructions. I just want to remind you, please listen and follow my instructions at all times. Protect yourself at all times. Fight hard. Fight clean. Good luck to you. Here is our tale of the tape. 
for this welterweight unification matchup. Miguel, what stands out to you? Arrow, obviously the bigger fighter, stands at five, nine and a half. Both coming in at 147, but Arrow also has the reach on Sean. However, that may be an advantage for Porter as he's able to dip underneath the jab of Arrow, use that physicality, and get on the inside of Arrow Spence. They talk about legacy fights. Welterweight unification is on the line. Will it be showtime in LA, Ready? or will it be the truth prevailing here in the City of Angels? Ray Flores ringside alongside Miguel Flores, Errol Spence Jr. and Sean Porter, both champions. Spence coming into this fight, predicting knockout. That's what he's aiming for. If he can be the first guy to stop Sean Porter, that would send shockwaves throughout the rest of the welterweight division. One of the things I'm going to be looking for in this fight, Ray, is the referee, Jack Reese. How much is he going to allow? How much physicality will he allow Porter to exert on Errol Spence? Will he allow them to fight out of the breaks? That is interesting. Sean Porter needs to be able to jab his way on the inside because if he stays at distance, Errol Spence will pick him apart all night long. Now, one thing about Spence is he can get hit. He's a great offensive fighter, has all the tools, but he is not unhittable. Well, no question, we saw that in his, when he captured the world title in England, when he fought Cal Brook, he took some good shots, took them well. Now Porter going on the inside, now trying stop, to make it a very stop, difficult stop. fight. Stop, stop, don't hit each other on the break. Box. We're midway through. Feeling out process thus far. Porter coming forward. Errol dismissed like Sean Porter. Stop. He said, Stop. you're a glorified Stop. street Stop. fighter Stop. who Stop. acts like he doesn't know how to swim. He said that is the offense from Sean Porter. You can see both of these fighters, there's no feeling out process here. Porter on the attack early. Oh, right hand over the top. Porter so athletic, the right hand that connects. Now Porter will see if he'll go to work on the inside. This is where Porter has to gain. Stop, Some offense. Stop, my break and again. Now Jack Reese will separate them. Okay. So we'll see if that remains the case when it comes to Jack Reese separating the two combatants under a minute left in our opening stanza. And there is the signature dance that Porter is known for during his fights. Sean fakes Porter one way. Trained by his father, Kenny Porter, also in the corner. Of Sean Porter, Barry Hunter, a state trainer. He's been in the corner with Lamont Peterson, Adrian Brother, right hand that connects by Spence. But back comes stop, 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 Porter. Stop, 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 stop. Relax. That's what I talk about, Ray. Porter using his high at well, disadvantage, you would say, to his advantage. Ducking underneath a Spence's jab, getting on the inside. That could end up being a problem for the truth. And round Stop one punching. draws to a close. Stevie, come on. Lesson into the corner of Sean Porter. I'm with your punches. You turn him in that corner, and he's late. Go out after him, okay? When you make the turn, you gotta go. Don't block no body shot. Let him have the body shot. Huh? More puppies. Let him have the body shot. Deep breath, blow it out. Okay. Then you take the air when he go to the body. Right? Sorry. Jabs, planes. Turn him where you need him to be and go to work. Okay. Hey, give me a towel. We got a towel. Anybody got a towel? Larry, right. get me the card quicker, I'd appreciate it. Get me the card quicker, I'd appreciate it. Steve! Steve! Miguel, what did get you me take away quick. from round one? Well, Sean is not going to wait close. for Spence. Stay back. Stay back. Porter is going to bring back. the fight to him. He's going to duck underneath. He's going to try to muck it up a little bit. 
He swings wildly. That's one thing we know about Sean. And, you know, he's not the most accurate puncher in the game. Errol, though, was calm, cool, and collected, and it didn't seem to phase him. Let's see how that progresses in round two. Errol Spence, the IBF champion. Sean Porter, the WBC champion. Errol's been a champion for four years now. As you take a look at Errol stepping to a straight left that connected. Beg your pardon, three years for Spence. A straight left right on the chin of Porter. And Porter seemed to be backing up a little bit. Now he comes forward once again. Stop, stop, stop. Sean, that, I told you when he's under your arm, don't hit him like that. And his head under your arm. You all right? Box. And there you see Jack Reese already warning Sean, so it may not be a typical Sean Porter fight. So far, as we've seen the early looks of Jack Reese breaking it up as soon as they get in the clinch. One minute has elapsed in the second. Errol with that straight left right to the midsection of Sean Porter. Errol Spence is one of the most dangerous and lethal body punchers in the game today. Back comes Porter. A straight left, big right hand for Porter. He may stop, have stop, stunned stop, Spence. Stop. Either that or he may have been off balance. So it was that the fact that Porter, that Spence was off balance. Stop, my brain. From our broadcast perspective, it looked like a clean shot, but it was that Spence was off balance and this crowd erupted. Nonetheless, look for Sean to use that to his advantage. And Spence puts the head down of Porter. Spence teeing off on Porter. But back comes Showtime. And there's the signature Showtime that we've seen in the past, lunging forward, swinging wildly. Errol threw a left uppercut that missed. But one thing about Porter, he's got to be careful when he comes lunging in and throwing wildly. Errol is so accurate with his punches. Why and also Sean leaves his chin down. And Errol has shown a propensity to throw that uppercut. Stop, 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 stop. I like how with Errol, as Sean tries to barrel into him, he grabs him, he ties him up, and puts his head down as to try to gain a break. And now Porter needs to go to work right here on the inside. They're both looking to mix it up. Spence with a nice combination. And Porter connected with the left of his own over the top. Let's take a look at what I thought was a clean shot, but we're taking a look at it and, oh no. I thought that the punch grazed him, but Errol was just off balance. That was the left hook from Porter that landed on the forehead of Spence. Porter, as we've seen, is a very unique fighter. He comes in from all angles. He throws from all angles. He is not on the middle. And then turn the other car. Starting with the hook and missing. Right? Body, head, straight down the middle. Turn him. Go to work. Banks and banks when you turn him to banks. Don't yes, just sir. keep drawing him in and looking pretty. So right. Okay. Banks and banks. That's what Kenny Porter told his son Sean right Porter. Now. You agree with the instruction from Kenny Porter, Miguel? I do. I and, and uh, he he was telling Porter too. You're swinging wildly. You're missing. He says, straight, straight, throw some feints. With a guy like Errol, who's so smart, you need to throw him off balance a little bit. You have to make him continue to guess what you're going to throw next. Well, Errol is looking to settle into his groove. Sean needs to make Errol Spence uncomfortable. Here he goes. We'll see go, if Sean will go to work. And now Errol is on the attack. A straight left, right to the body of Sean Porter by Errol Spence. Let me show you, let him go, Sean. And now we'll see if they'll fight on the inside. Jack Reese allowing them to fight. 
Oh, yeah. the break. You gotta hit low because you pulled his head down. Don't pull his head down. You got right? it. So Sean looked over at Jack Reese as to say he's hitting me low. Well, Jack Reese responded with, if you didn't hold his head down, then that wouldn't be an issue. And you see Errol again just calm, cool, and collected, staying in the center of the ring. This fight favors Spence when it's at distance and in the center of the ring. If you're bored, you need to get this fight to the ropes and oppose your will upon Errol Spence, like right here. And just like Kenny Porter said, go to the body. I need more body let him shots. Go, let him go. Work out. Oh, there's a straight left for Spence. Back comes Porter. Porter throwing haymakers. And Spence, there you go, toe to toe. Watch right unification on the line as they are swinging for the fences here at Staples Center. This is a dogfight, Miguel, without okay, question. And right here, this is the fight Porter wants. This is the fight Porter needs in order to win and defeat Errol Spence. Big straight left for Spence. Back comes Porter. Porter digging, body down in his mouthpiece. Back comes Spence, chopping left hands from the truth. Stop, 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 stop. A big straight left right. for Spence on the, on the break. He's right on the foot. You've got to bring him up, okay? And okay. it seems that Spence is fighting what he all accused Porter of doing coming into this fight. He's almost holding on to Porter at times. He's throwing when the refs tell him to break it up. Errol is fighting Porter's game. Well, and also I think Errol knows a big straight left that connected stop, stop. for Spence. Oh, Errol knows stop. he's got to make this. He's trying to take it to no, no Sean punch. Porter Nobody by punch. any means necessary. Good. Step back. Final moments of the third. Time, stop, what a third round. Unbelievable action that we saw there as both fighters. You got to talk us through what you saw here in the third. And, and right there, there was the hold from Porter. Errol went low, and you could see he hurt Porter. And then Errol, again, he's almost laughing as Porter swinging wildly, but that one connected over the top with the right. And Sean, as we know with Sean Porter, he's so strong. He's almost like a bull, and he uses that strength to hold you up against the ropes. And then there's Errol answering back, digging into the body, and then coming and finishing upstairs. Sean Porter and Errol Spence both look extremely fresh, Miguel. They look like they haven't even fought in one minute. That's how in tip-top shape they are. So far, a very entertaining three rounds in the first quarter of this fight. Sean Porter. Jabbing his way on the inside, now attacks the body of Spence. Porter, bring it up. Spence covering up now. Chopping shot for Porter. Going to the body is Porter. Porter is going right at Spence. A left hook. And now he's walking down Spence. Two big right hands on the temple of Spence. And it was the body shot that set those overhands up, Ray. But back comes Spence. A straight left for the truth. Spence has got his mouthpiece open. Oh, a heavy Titanic right hand by Porter. This is the kind of fights that you tell your family members about 15 to 20 years. A straight left that connects for Spence. Both men have been slugging away. Oh, my goodness. And I think Spence is stunned, Ray. Porter might have Spence hurt. Porter applying the pressure. Oh my goodness, what a round. Sean Porter just so durable. He is fighting the fight of his life.
There was a left hand, a wild left hand that connected Flush. That threw Spence off balance. Spence is fighting Porter's fight, but it's because Porter is imposing his will. We'll see if Spence can make adjustments. Here comes Porter again. Non-stop. Porter has not taken a second off. A left hook that missed for Porter. What a round. Look at this work rate by Sean Porter from Akron, Ohio. He just does not know the word stop. Spence trying to answer back. Oh, a straight left that backed up Porter. Spence clipped Porter. No body shot, but back comes Porter. They are going toe to toe here in the fourth. Porter coming and throwing the kitchen sink at Spence. Final moments of the go. fourth. Stop, stop, my break, my break. Let each other go. Hey, keep them up, both you guys. Stop with the bell. What a round. Are you not entertained? Porter with tons of action early. And it's the body shots that are setting up the power shots over the top, Ray. Porter is doing a great job at continuing to dig into the body of Spence. And then here was that left hand on the forehead that appeared to stun Spence and throw him off balance a bit. And then he dig right into the body. Very low blows, quite a few. Yeah, keep him up, but Spence was able to answer later on in that round. Spence answering back with a big straight left. Oh my, holy mackerel. But if you're Porter, this is the fight you want. This is how you envision this going and how it being the rest of the way. If you're Spence, you may need to back off just a bit and not allow Porter to impose his will as much. As we enter round five, this one's scheduled for 12. What a barn burner so far, Miguel. It's been incredible action and incredible pace that both of these guys are setting. Porter. Coming forward. But now Spence, you're seeing Spence be more offensive here in the fifth to start the round. And Porter is so awkward and athletic that it's hard to keep him off of you. Stop. And it's kind of, it's hard to dictate, you know, where Porter's going to go next because he just, he dances around so much. He moves, you know, almost like a bull in a china shop. You don't know where he's going to go. He is so wild that it's so hard to anticipate where he's going to go. Well, Errol's going to have to set some traps to get Porter to run into some things. And now they're both, they're both you tussling. Stop. Both of you stop, both of you stop. Jack Reese separates the two combatants. Porter goes sometimes to his right, to his left, pivots. He's so unorthodox. A champ followed by a straight left from Errol Spence. Oh, a windmill of a straight left. Stop, stop, stop. That stop. misses enough, enough, for Spence. Box. Errol's been looking for that left hand all night. The big left straight. He's just missed a couple of times on Porter. Just over the halfway mark of the fifth. That was a nice jab by Arrow. At this pace, this favor is Spence. So Porter, I don't know if he's taking the round off or he's trying to regather himself, but this is where Spence needs to go to work. This is more of Spence's round. This is where he wants the fight. But back comes Porter. Look at Porter go. Porter is like, as you mentioned, a bull in a china shop. With so much on the line between these two. Porter, 31 years of age, Porter, or Spence, 29. Both of these guys are in tremendous shape, but at this pace, I wonder who is going to fold a little bit early. Who's going to get tired? Who's going to have to take a round off at the pace these guys are setting? A 
nice straight left that found its destination for Spence. As Pull your arms out, fellas. Pull your arms out. Jack Lee's letting them fight out of the brakes. Inside work. Pull your arms Spence out, Spence going to the body. It's almost like Porter is just leaning on Spence. Might be trying to take a round off of, of sorts. That was a nice left hand from Spence back in the way. That's the end of the fifth. Go and listen in to Errol Spence Jr. This going with Derek James as his trainer. Spence's game, a tactician to the finest degree. Staying on the outside, using the jab, comes with the straight left, goes downstairs to the body, and avoids Porter's wild movements. Round six, this one is scheduled for 12. The IBF and WBC championships are on the line as Spence goes to work, tattooing the body of Porter. Derek James told Spence he is hurt or he's tired. You can go to the body. Porter with his back on the ropes, turns around, and now, brilliant move by Porter. Porter now applying the pressure. And that's what I wondered. Porter exerted so much energy in those first four or five rounds, throwing and keeping up an incredible pace. I was curious to see, would he be able to maintain that pace for 12 rounds? Well, the answer, at least in five, he did it a little bit. But now he slowed down considerably. And here is where Errol goes to work. That's why it's a 12 round fight. It's not a four round fight, six round fight. This is a championship fight. Stop, 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 stop. And Spence pushed the head down of Porter. But you can't push it down in the end. You alright? Box. Jack Reese wisely warning Errol about that. Spence using the jab. Wonderfully, and then also going to the body. Going to the body, especially with the way Porter moves, that's going to prevent him from lunging in as much as he does. Straight left, that chest unloaded by Spence. Back comes Porter, though. Spence seems stop, stop, to stop, start to run. take control as we're seeing here in the fifth and now the sixth. And I think this is what Spence envisioned coming into this well, fight. Out. He knows eventually his boxing is going to take over of the wild brawling style of Sean Porter. Let him out, Sean. And Spence is a big 147 pounder too. Now back comes Porter. Porter needs to fight at this rate with his activity. Under a minute left. A right hook that connected to Spence. Over. And I know this is Porter's game, but there's too many misses for me. He's swinging so wildly, he's missing so much. There's a right hand that connected for Porter. But so far in five and six, they've been few and far between. And there's the difference right there. You saw Arrow pick his shot, comes across with the straight left, no, 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 stop, and stop. nails him right That's on the chin. Pinpoint right. accuracy. Stages of the sixth. And you can see the work rate has dropped for Porter in this round. You gotta throw something out to the face, you feel me? You got it? What's good? What's going on? Suck this up and get these Get this body working like it's supposed to work. Look, look, look. I need you to get it working like you put the face. 
face together. Shoot your jab. Put your face together. One, two. Hard punches. Show your breathing down. Deep breath going up. We in shape. His legs gone, man. Breaking. He's breaking. That's deep touching him, son. When you turn him, go to the body, come straight shots to the head. Don't hook to the head. That's right. Straight shots to the down head. Down the middle. Down the middle. Uppercut, straight punches to the head. Right? When you think, make your move. Put something together, put a combination together. Double in the right, go to the body. Make your move. I ain't got no work over here right. Where's it at? Come on, start throwing the thing. Start throwing it up to the ring. Seven. What was your assessment of what you heard in the corners again? It's what I've been saying. I mean, you can see the frustration in his trainer, Kenny Porter. He's saying the left hooks, the right hooks, it's too wild. It's not accurate enough. He wants it straighter. He wants it more accurate. He wants it down the middle. That's where he's going to connect. And that's what the advice he's given to Porter that I've been saying throughout this fight as well. Too many misses. Too many misses. Got to go to the body. Come up. Use the uppercut straight down the middle. Well, Errol Spence is so composed under fire. We saw that in the first few rounds. A nice jab for Spence. As Spence seems to be dialed in. And we'll see if Porter can make him uncomfortable once again. Now Porter on the inside. Let him go, work out. That's a good start for Porter. Coming straight, connected us up. Went down to the body. That's where he's got to keep the action. In the body and then come upstairs. Spence is now the one walking down Sean Porter. Did you feel like that was going to be the case heading into this fight? Not exactly. I thought Porter's wild style was going to prevent Errol from walking him down. And this is more like it. This is what Porter needs to do. We're coming up. On 50% of the way done in the seventh. Let him go. Let him go. Now Arrow trying to corner Porter. Porter is holding on. I don't know if he's trying to grab Arrow to go to work on the inside or what the case is. And it looked right there that Porter's head hit the chin of Spence. Right hook connecting for Arrow Spence. Porter turns him around. Let him go, Sean. Get that on that man. Right on. Sean, you're right on. A right hook for Spence. Body work for the truth. And Porter ties stop, him up. Stop, Everybody stop. My break, my break. And I think now you're starting to see the damage of Errol Spence. The accuracy is starting to take its toll on Porter. He started off hot in this round, but again, the savviness the technical ability of Spence is starting to take over in the second half of this round. Errol Spence seems to be very comfortable now. As arm punches from Sean Porter. Porter comes back. Couple of rights. Look at how durable he is. But Errol, so cool, composed. Sean, you're right like on. another day at the office. As we near the end of the seventh. There's a nice body shot from Porter. Needs more of that. Time. Give him a little bit of Some of the body shots, Miguel, as we see Errol Spence and Sean Porter just tattoo one another. And you can see both guys are trying to live down there. And Errol getting the better of Porter along the ropes, using his size to pin Porter and go to work on the body. Approaching round eight of this welterweight unification matchup. Sean Porter has to go to plan B, plan C, because what he's doing right now, first few rounds it worked. Errol made adjustments. Can Porter make those adjustments? That's one thing, Errol, it took him a few rounds to get adjusted, figure out the unorthodox style, 
the crazy angles that Porter comes and throws with, along with the work rate decreasing because of the, the fatigue that's starting to set in with Porter and the high pace he sets. Errol Spence looking to unify the division. Here comes Porter again. Porter, wild swings. Some of them partially grazed Spence. Spence attacking the body. And Spence does a great job at making sure that Porter's on the end of his punches. Porter might have gotten hurt from a straight left to the body. And again. Oh, there's a big straight left right on the jaw of Porter. And Porter ate it like how I do donuts on my off day. <laughs> But Porter's eating a lot of shots now. Spence starting to take over here in this welterweight unification matchup. With Porter, the pace he set in the first four rounds, it's just so hard to maintain that for the full 12. Almost impossible. Come on. Coming up. Midway point of the eight. Straight left as Porter. All right, stop, stop. Listen to me. Both of your trunks are high, so it looks a lot lower than it is, and you, and I, you can't push him to the ropes and hit him. Box. Good instruction by Jack Reese to both. There's a straight left, a jab followed by the straight left for Spence. Now Spence is just able to pick his shots, dart in and dart out. And as we talked about, if, Spence, if Porter allows this, Spence will pick him apart all night long. Well, you you this is down, work, clearly guys. favoring Errol Spence. Porter, in order to win this fight, we knew he's going to happen to come and use his physicality. Go to the body. Push oh, right ropes. hand. That connects for Porter, but back comes Spence. And this is some of the back and forth that we thought we were going to see. That's you, Spencer, right on. I mean, uh, sorry. A big right hand for Porter. Two big right hands here on the eighth. Maybe that might be what Porter needs to jumpstart and change the momentum of this fight. Well, it started off going back and forth. Porter had it. Spence regained it. We'll see if Porter can retake it. Stop, my break, my break. Step away from each other. Stop with the bell. That's the end of the eighth. And there you see Errol missing with the jab, but the big left. Both guys connected on lefts. And then here's the overhand right that connected flush for Spence. Very surprised Spence did not get wobbled there, but then he answered right back going to the body of Porter. Again, more action. Boom, big right hand. Again, I think this is a very close fight. I'm glad I'm not a judge. I'm glad I'm not Ray Danseco, Larry Hazard Jr., or Steve Weisfeld because, oh boy, do they have their work cut out for them. It's been a tough, difficult fight to score. It hasn't been the prettiest fight, but nonetheless, it's been action-packed, and it's what we expected. It's what we expected from a Porter Spence fight. Two of the division's best fighting each other in the primes of their careers, both champions. This was expected. Round nine. This one's scheduled for 12. Porter starting out jabbing. Neither man is running away with this fight, I guess. No, neither. You, they've had good moments, both fighters. If you're Porter, you want to replicate similar to what you did in that last round. He, he became a little bit more of a boxer, less of a brawler, but yet he still used his physicality. There's a nice go, right hand. Go, Sean. Porter, we are seeing him make the adjustment. We talked about the adjustments. Could he do that? A straight left that connects for Errol Spence Jr. right on the chin. 
And but Porter is starting to box more and then brawl. It's not brawl first, then box. It's box first, then brawl. Exactly, and that's what he needs to do more of. And that worked for him in the last round. And I think that's an adjustment he needs to maintain. There's a straight left that found its destination for Errol Spence. Oh, what an uppercut by Porter. Porter might have Spence hurt. Oh, my goodness. There's again, Porter is connecting flush on Spence. You wanted accuracy, Miguel? You got accuracy from Sean Porter. This is what we're used to seeing from Porter. This stop, is stop. what we wrestle, stop, his trainer, stop. Kenny Porter, Except talked me. about. Well, look, you don't stop Andre Bertil, and that was a very big victory for Sean Porter. Not many people can be able to have that distinction. Porter is a guy who knows how to take you into those deep waters, as does Spence. <laughs> That's what Porter said. He said he was going to drown Spence in those deep waters. But now Spence, a little bit of lack of activity from the IPF welterweight champion. Right hand that found its mark. This is a war of attrition between these two welterweights. Both fighters living on the inside right now. You almost wonder if Spence is just kind of trying to coast out of this round and if he was really hurt by those shots of Porter. We'll go back and take a look at him now. Spence with pinpoint accuracy. Aim at a tee off on the head of Porter. They both not nail each other. This is Rock'em Sock'em Robots. They are going toe to toe with Welterweight Supremacy on the line. Spence and Porter are delivering something special here at Staples Center in Los Angeles. Both guys are going toe to toe, not giving an inch. Stop, my break, my break, my break. Let him go, Sean, let go. Let go. Let go. Let go. That's the end of the nine. It is the momentum is starting to swing back in favor of Porter. He's landed a couple of brutal shots on Spence. Step. Take a look, Miguel. Hi. A straight left by Spence. Right here, here was another left. And he just clipped the top, but it was the oh. overhand left. Porter was not even looking at the target and connected flush on Spence. And here's a right, right in the face of Spence. The shoulders and head. There you see Jack Reese going to the corner of Spence. Take a look at that uppercut again. As we see, oh, oh my, that'll wake you up in the morning. It was less of an uppercut and more of just a straight left that knocked Spence back. And there you see Spence dancing in his corner. He's starting to get that second win. He hit the ball. The crowd erupts for the 10th round. And you heard Jack Reese who won the corner of Spence. Watch the head and the shoulders. Round 10. Errol Spence Jr., this is the kind of fight that he wanted. He said, I'll fight Sean Porter. I want to prove that I'm the best in the division. So many big names. Danny Garcia, Manny Pacquiao, Keith Thurman. Also have Terrence Crawford out there as well. And they're both swinging for the fences. Look at this. This is what a big prize fight here in the City of Angels is all about. You got to dig deep. Drama, you got it. You got to dig deep in these moments. I know you're tired. I know you expended most of your energy, but you got to find a way. It's when you can get that second and third win. This is why you train so hard. Look at these two gladiators stop, stop. My break, just pound away time. upon one another. And now you can see Spence is starting to fight more of Porter's fight. This is what Porter wants. Close quarters battle, almost like a phone booth fight. 100 seconds left here in the 10th. Spence with the right hook to the head of Porter. Porter, he is doubled over. But back comes Porter. 
Errol, let him go, Errol. That's you holding. And there was oh, a body what a shot. Big shot that appeared to hurt Spence. Porter seemed to stop Spence in his tracks with the body shot. Stop, stop. My break, my break. This action, Miguel, is just unbelievable. It's almost as if Errol goes, throws a flurry, lands a couple of nice shots, and then Porter goes, throws a flurry, lands a couple of big shots. This is the reason why there are thousands here at Staples Center and millions watching around the world. These are two of the best in boxing, colliding. Right, stop, my break. Nobody punch. Here tonight. Did you hear the head? Okay, you pulled him in, though. You pulled him in, though. You all right? The guy's okay? Nothing. Box. There you see Jack Reese letting the judges know it was a headbutt, not a punch. I mean, coming into this fight, I think you expected a couple of headbutts. What a straight left for Spence. But Porter ate it well. These two are hammering away upon one another. Look at this work rate. Oh my goodness. Damn, what a fight. As we enter the championship rounds. Incredible action and incredible pace. A small it cut from an accidental butt. He's cut, small cut. Here is some of the body work, Miguel. Right here, here's Porter. This is the one that really hurt uh, Spence. It knocked him back. You almost see, saw him let out a gasp on that left hook to the body. But then Spence recovered and he answered back. And then this is where Porter wants to fight, right inside like this. Right. And then there's Spence with the right hook landing flush on Porter. Both these guys saw their moments here in that 10th round. We talked about it being a loaded division. We get look at those names. Incredible. You got Manny Pacquiao, Terrence Crawford, Keith Thurman, Garcia Ugasu Porter fought in his last bout. Sergey Lipinets is on the rise. You got Jamal Shango James there as well. I mean, talked about not an easy fight. Well. Not an easy fight at all in that division. And there is the cut on Errol Spence as the truth cut. I believe that's the first time he's been cut in his professional career. But you heard Reese warn the judges that that was from a headbutt. That was not from a punch. Both off balance there was. And now Chance of Porter echoing here at Staples Center in Los Angeles. Sean Porter has won over a lot of the crowd here in LA. But you hear the cheers now of Spence drowning out those Porter cheers. We have been treated to a sensational prize fight here at 147. Now here are the championship rounds, Ray. This fight is so close. You don't really know what the judges are scoring. It all depends on what you see. But right now, Errol Spence and Sean Porter both want to make definitive statements in these final two rounds. These two rounds can very well determine who comes out on top. And there's Porter pressing the action against Spence along the ropes. Look at Porter go. Oh my, they are picking it up and they are swinging for the fences. Stop, stop, my boy, my boy. Neither guy wants to move. Neither man wants to give one inch. Nope. Halfway mark of the 11. Shot to the body by Spence. Sean Porter. They are both non-stop. Look at this. A right hook. And there is Spence. A straight left that connects for Spence. Stop, 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 stop. Let me tell the dog. And that's what, one thing that happens in those wild exchanges, especially from Porter's end. He's so wild, he leaves himself open, and that's where Spence has been able to connect several times. He's accurate. And put like leg shot, and Spence takes the canvas for the first time. What a shot by Spence! And Porter says, let's go! Oh my goodness! Porter down here in the 11th! 
Look at them go! Spence is trying to finish Porter. But now Porter seems to have Spence staggered. Stop, stop, stop. My break. What a fight here tonight at Staples Center. Porter starting to bring the action to him. Overhand right connected. Spence and Porter tied up. Final 10 seconds on what has been a classic. Look at them go. A right hook by Spence. That's the end of the 11th. Oh my goodness. What a battle. Right here, Spence was just able to time this perfectly. A short left hook on the chin. There you see Sean Porter was on Wobble Street. He tried as hard as he could to stay on his feet. Boom. Unreal oh timing. Unreal accuracy. But that's what Spence has in his tool bag, and that's what he predicted. And there's Kenny Porter, the father of Errol Spence, or the father of Sean Porter. Boom! Oh my! Anybody else we get would have been out. Flatlined, flatlined. But Porter got up and knew. He told Spence, he goes, let's go, right after that. And now it is round 12. Let's see what Porter brings in his tool bag. It's the 12th hey, and final round. Hey, let's go, We're in the City of Angels here in Hollywood. You want high drama? You got it. Well, to right unification on the line. Right for us, Miguel Flores, Errol Spence, Sean Porter. Porter's got to empty. Hand for Porter. Porter's got to empty the clip. He's got to let it all hang loose in that 12th round. Big right hand for Porter. Back comes Spence. Look at Spence go. They are both fighting at such a high level. Both men know what's on the line here tonight. A loopy left just oh missed. Goodness. Porter knows he's looking for a knockdown. He's trying to match Spence. Porter trying to get that knockdown back. Big straight left for Spence. Spence sensing that he could very well put out Porter. But back comes Showtime. Double, double right hook, and that backed up Porter. Now Spence walking to the Akron, Ohio native. A right hook for Spence. Porter trying to answer back. Big right hand. There he answers back on the button. Por Porter is relentless. Porter is nonstop. Spence got tagged with that big right. Porter's got a little over a minute to but do some damage. Back comes Spence, though. Hammering away upon Porter. Porter answers Sean, back. Stop. It's Stop. a Stop. battle of said. wills. It's a war of heart. It is the pursuit for a championship greatness. A legacy fight. What a straight left for Spence. And there's a right that connected for Porter. Porter is not to be denied. This is why prize fighting is the greatest form of sport and entertainment in the world. Bar none. These men are leaving their heart and soul in that ring. And Porter continues to press forward, but Spence throwing as he's backing away. He's trying left. to finish Porter. Oh my goodness! They both are going toe to toe here in Los Angeles. Look at this! Spence has his moments. Rip it away. Back comes Porter. There's a right hook chopping at the chin of Spence. Final 10 seconds. We will let the crowd enjoy this. Oh my goodness. What a world title fight. Absolutely incredible action, Ray. This surpassed expectations.
from what we thought this fight would be. Both men laid it all in that ring in order to become and unify the IBF and WBC World Welterweight Championships. What a fight, Miquel. Talk us through this. There was Porter. He knew coming into this 12th and final round, he had to come up with something big. He was emptying, emptying the tank, trying to get Spence to the canvas. He was unable to do so, but he hit him with some shots that would have put down a lot of welterweights in this division. What a fight, Miguel. And you know what? I know that we are a ways away from the decision, but I want to see that again. I don't know who doesn't. Absolutely incredible action. Both men gave everything. And this is what you asked for. You couldn't have asked for anything more here between Porter and Spence. Right here, here's some of the highlights. And that was a straight right by Porter, timing it up, staying within those close quarters. But Spence, he proved his worth here tonight. He fought Porter's fight a majority of this, this fight, and he did not crumble under that pressure that Porter brings. Arrow calculated, relaxed, composed, but I feel like at parts of the fight, Arrow wanted to fight Porter's fight to show him, I can fight your fight, and I can beat you at your game. Ladies and gentlemen, after 12 rounds of action, we have a split decision. Here are the score totals. Judge of ringside, Ray Danseco scores the bout 116 to 111 in favor of Errol Spence Jr. Judge of ringside, Larry Hazard Jr. scores the bout 115 to 112 in favor of Sean Porter. Steve Weisfeld sees it 116 to 111 in favor of the winner. He is now the WBC and the IBF Welterweight yeah. Unified Champion of the World, Errol Spence Jr. And Errol Spence Jr. Claims the victory by split decision over Sean Porter. Again, I thought that was a justified decision. I do as well. I mean, both, there's so many rounds in this fight that were just so, it was so wild, so difficult to score. As a judge, you don't know what they're looking for. Are they looking for aggressiveness? Are they looking for accuracy? Are they looking who lands the cleaner shots? You don't know what a judge comes in for. That's why they always say, never leave it into the hands of the judges. But Arrow came out on top, and I don't think anyone can argue with that decision. That knockdown was absolutely massive in that 11th round. Absolutely paramount. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you, and we welcome you to the fabulous MGM Grand Resort and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada, as Premier Boxing Champions presents the featured bout of the evening, brought to you by Tecate, the official beer of boxing, Innovate Motors, O'Reilly Auto Parts, better parts, better prices every day, Twin Peaks, Eats, Drinks, Views, and Fashion Nova, the number one Googled fashion brand in the world. This bound is sanctioned by the WBA, the president, Gilberto Jesus Mendoza. Introducing our judges at ringside, Tim Cheatham, Glenn Feldman, and Dave Moretti. All right, fans, here we go with a bout you've all been waiting for. 12 rounds of boxing for the WBA Welterweight Championship of the World. And now, ladies and gentlemen, in attendance and boxing fans joining us around the world, live from the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, it's time for the Fox Sports PBC pay-per-view main. Introducing to you first on my 
my right, fighting out of the red corner, wearing red, white, and blue trunks, fighting out of St. Peter's Boxing Club, and hailing from Clearwater, Florida. He weighed in at already 146 and one half pounds. He is undefeated in his campaign with a record of 29 wins, no losses, with 22 wins coming by way of knockout. Tonight in his sixth world title appearance, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the longest current reigning welterweight champion, the hard-hitting, acclaimed, and undefeated WBA welterweight champion of the world, introducing uh, Keith. One time Thurman! And his opponent across the ring in the blue corner, really needing no introduction the world over. Wearing white trunks with multi-color trim. As the distinguished boxing senator, he is fighting out of and proudly representing the Sarangani Brethrens in the Philippines. He weighed in the same as his opponent, 146 and one half pounds. Truly one of the renowned idols of boxing today. His record stands at 61 wins, seven losses, two draws, with 39 wins coming by way of knockout. Tonight, in his 28th world title appearance, here is the icon of the sport and future Hall of Famer. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome boxing's legendary and only eight division champion of the world, introducing the one and only Manny Pac-Man Pacquiao. And now introducing our referee in charge, now to give instructions, Kenny Bayless. Okay, Manny Keith. Trunks are good on both sides. Gentlemen, we went over the rules in the dressing room. Again, I would caution you to keep this fight clean at all times, protect yourself at all times, and what I say, you must obey. Good luck. Touch him up. All right, here we go from MGM Grand Garden Arena. Sold out over 14,000 on hand. Manny Pacquiao at his 71st professional bout. Keith one time Thurman unbeaten at 29 and 0. 22 wins coming via knockout. We are underway. Round one scheduled for 12. Keith Thurman placed three bets on himself to knock out Manny Pacquiao in the first, second, or seventh round tonight. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tall order. Uh, one thing about me when I was fighting, I never bet on myself. Although I was very confident in myself, but I never bet on myself. What do you expect early, Joe Goosen? Well, uh, you know, you're seeing what you're getting right now. Manny Pacquiao came out and he threw a, a, a right hook and he, he missed it, you know, by a half a mile, but just landed a nice left straight left hand on Thurman. And Thurman started pressing and there he goes. He's starting to cut loose. I think we're going to see a lot of back and forth action here with some good shots landed by both guys in these first few rounds. Because one of them wants to make a stand. They both want to make a stand and... And, and, and to assert their dominance over the other. So well, let's see who gets away with what. That's a good right hand by Thurman right there. And, and I was expecting Thurman to come out a little bit moving, but he no, he's he's um, no, he's, he's going, standing his ground. Right? Yeah, he's standing his ground. He's waiting to see what happens. And I thought he was going to be more aggressive in this, but he didn't. He's not coming out aggressive. He's just watching, trying to get used to Manny Pacquiao's uh, rhythm. Ooh. It was a nice right hand, but Pacquiao comes right back. Most of the trash talk came from Keith Thurman in the weeks leading up to this bout. Pacquiao said, I'm motivated. The more he talks, I want to prove something to him. There's a nice combination by Thurman. That was a nice uh, right-left uh, uh, right he threw. Uh, Thurman did against Pacquiao, but... You know, Pacquiao, he's smart, and he's been around, and he knows he's going to try to get everything he gets touched with. He's going to try to get it back. Good right hand by Thurman. He looks really confident on Thurman. Yeah, Thurman's coming out with the power punches early.
Final minute. First round from Las Vegas. Look at the punches landed. Ten by Thurman so far. Pacquiao at six. Ooh. Bit of a smile from Manny Pacquiao. Oh, oh down oh, goes oh. Thurman! And let me tell you, that was just a quick punch. And Manny Pacquiao moved in with his legs and his hands and caught Thurman backing up. Thurman thought he could back up quick enough, but he wasn't quick enough to get it out of the reach of that punch. Thurman knocked down late in round one. Pacquiao threw that left hand to the body and that right hook right over the top that is used for years. Yeah, that was a flash knockdown. That was a wake-up shot for Thurman. Sure was. Boy, Pacquiao still has it at 40 years old. He's still fast, he's still quick, he's still powerful. And here's Manny Pacquiao coming through, moving quick with those legs, throwing a combination, punching, catching him on the way back with his hands down. All right, here we go. Look, there's Paco. He's rushing in right there, boom. And there's the hook that dropped him, but preceded by a straight left hand to the belly. You know, the Pacquiao's used that tactics many, many times. Now, now Thurman wasn't probably terribly hurt. It was, a, like you said, a flash knockdown, but he got caught square on the chin and went down. Thurman with his trainer, Dan Birmingham. Well, we, we found out who asserted the dominance in the first round. It was a tug of war, and at the end of the day, Pacquiao won out. Thurman landed 12 punches in round one. All were power punches. And then Pacquiao with the late knockdown of Keith Thurman. More chance of Manny from this sold-out crowd in Las Vegas. Thurman landed a nice little body shot along the ropes that Pacquiao shook his head saying no it, it didn't hurt it may not have hurt but it was still a nice shot by Thurman and then we saw that smile from Pacquiao just before the knockdown yeah I gotta tell you when Pacquiao starts moving those legs very quickly straight at you get out of the way yeah because that's it like that right there that's where he does it best he catches you off guard with his quick feet and hands Look, Pacquiao looks very quick right now. Can you imagine at 40 years old still bringing this type of game to a young, strong champion that's never been beaten? He will turn 41 in December. He told his trainer, Freddie Roach, I feel like I'm 22. Well, Thurman just turned southpaw for a second, and they both threw hooks, and Thurman's landed right there on Pacquiao. So this is a little switch right here, Thurman going southpaw. Switching back to right-handed again. Midway through, round two, scheduled for 12. Pacquiao with a knockdown of Thurman in round one. Another good right by Pacquiao. Those were blocked by Thurman. He closed the gap. He just put his hands together, and the straight punches were blocked. Well, you're going to see a lot of that by Pacquiao throwing the punches. I mean... Punches and bunches. Yeah, and, uh, you know, from... From the other side, if a judge is looking at that, he's going to think that Pacquiao is scoring points on that. That's true. But the, the good thing is, is that Thurman isn't getting hit with it, so he's not getting debilitized by uh, Pacquiao. So he, he's able to keep the pressure up. He's got to keep his hands up against Pacquiao. He, Pacquiao has a great move he makes he hits him with that straight left hand of the body and then he goes upstairs really quick before he even pulls his hands off your body he's throwing that hook so it's always best to keep Pacquiao moving backwards and this is what Thurman's trying to do right now and that's what Thurman told us he said Manny's strength is punches and numbers my strength is power punting the power punching and accuracy
and he's saying, I feel good. Manny Pacquiao's wife, Jinky, on hand, along with their five kids. Three boys, two girls. And here we see the alley shuffle. Pacquiao feeling really good. Keith Thurman's wife, Priyana. This is her first time at a boxing match. Her first trip to Las Vegas. And you can tell she's trying to hold it together. This, this has got to be kind of a shock for her. You know, her man's down first time to a fight and seeing her man down, so you know what she's going through. Pacquiao's moving around like a 22-year-old Lennox. Oh yeah, he's making up that ground with his feet, quickly. Joe, from a trainer standpoint, what message would you have given Thurman after round two? Well, I, I think what he's doing right now, I think if you keep Manny backing up, you're better off than he, than having Manny come forward on you. Because not only will he come straight at you, he'll eventually end up on the side of you. And you don't know where he's at, and he'll hit you from the side, and then he'll end up on another side of you. He's really magical on his feet, and he's done it to so many guys and beaten so many guys that way. But if you can keep him off balance and keep him going backwards, I think he's got a, a better chance than Manny coming forward on him. Also, you know, when Manny throws his combinations, I think that's a better time to catch him and throw punches because he's leaving himself open. Yeah, but he's so fast, and I don't disagree, but he's so fast that he's liable to sneak something in on you. I think you got to be really judicious about what you throw against Manny and when you throw him, because he throws so many punches. Maybe the first two miss, but the third one's going to hit you. 61 career victories, record of 61, 7 and 2. A professional career that began in January of 1995 when Keith Thurman was six years old. Oh, big right by Pacquiao, stuck Thurman. And that was just a jab. It was a good stiff jab. He's really stepping in hard on that front foot. And that jab's following it and really did stun Thurman for a second. Nice combination by Pacquiao after Thurman had him up against the ropes. Well, Pacquiao's inviting him in. You yeah, know, he's really not trying to get away. Did it again. Thurman tried to sweep him right hand and that really missed. Didn't touch Pacquiao and Pacquiao decides to come off the ropes. Pacquiao's controlling. Remember I said there were, somebody's going to try to take dominance of this fight and it's Pacquiao right there. He's dominating every round. Final minute of round three. Kenny Albert, Lennox Lewis, Joe Goose, and Heidi Androll coming to you on pay-per-view from Las Vegas. Two nice body shots from Thurman right there. He's just got to not do that occasionally. He's got to do it most of the round. Good combination by Pacquiao when he comes forward at you. Now to 30 seconds. Right jab by Pacquiao, and then Thurman comes back. Double the body shots by Thurman. Time winding down in round three, scheduled for 12. Fox Sports, PBC pay-per-view. Pacquiao and Thurman, sponsored by Innovate Motors. By Tecate, the official beer of boxing. And by O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day.
trainer Freddie Roach in Pacquiao's corner. Freddie told us yesterday, Manny's speed is still there. He's still hungry, aggressive. He will pressure Thurman. And that's what we have seen, Lennox and Joe, over the first three rounds. Well, now, look, I mean, he's surprising me right now. I, I can't believe he's 40 years old and still fighting like this. Let's check in with Heidi Andro. Heidi. Thank you very much, Kenny. Freddie, you said that Manny Pacquiao had the killer instinct back, and you loved that he was upset coming into this fight. What did you tell him going into this round, and what have you seen thus far? Uh, go after this guy, throw your, throw your combinations, you're too fast. I, I, I told Manny he's too fast, he's too quick for this guy. Go after him with your speed. He's doing great. Thanks so much, Freddie, guys. Back to you. All right, thanks, Heidi. Freddie saying Manny is too fast for Keith Thurman. Beat him with your speed. Freddie's so confident he placed a $5,000 bet on Manny Pacquiao here in Vegas. Well, so far, Thurman's having his best round right now because he's back Manny up on the ropes and actually started to let his hands go. And, uh, you know, he's winning this round, Thurman, right now. Even though Manny's never going to stop punching, I think Thurman's taking the action so far in this half of the fight or this round. Work out, work out, work out. Break, break. Step back, clean. Step back. Did you have Pacquiao winning the first three rounds, Lennox? Uh, yeah, I had him winning the first two rounds, definitely. I think Thurman needs to really step up a little bit more and throw combinations and then not allow Manny Pacquiao to get back at him. That's right. And see, he let him off the ropes. He had him, he had him frozen on the ropes here, throwing combinations, and he stopped and allowed Manny to come off the ropes with the combination. Right. That's the, that's the mistake he's making at the moment. We continue to see Pacquiao using that speed, running at Keith Thurman and throwing punches. Let's check in with our unofficial scorer, Marcos Villegas. Marcos. Kenny, I got a 29-27 because of the knockdown in the first round. I thought last round I gave the nod to Keith Thurman because of the body work he did. This round is very, very tight. Both guys are landing very clean, so it's up for grabs at this point. Okay, thanks very much, Marcos. Oh, right by Pacquiao catches Thurman. Pacquiao again, the aggressor. See, what Pacquiao's doing right now is giving him different angles, giving Keith Thurman different angles, so when Keith Thurman thinks he's in front of him, he's not, and he has to readjust. That was a nice little left hand by Thurman right there, but Pacquiao threw two sets of combinations with seven, eight punches in each one, and he was buzzing around Thurman like a bee, and, uh, you know, he's just impossible to keep your eye on. He's everywhere. And then he mixes up his combinations top to bottom, left to right. He's really, this is why he's such a great champion. But Thurman is still in this fight right now. And Thurman's loading up for that left hook, so Manny's be better be careful because Thurman's looking for that left hook. And this is where Manny's really good. He's moving in with the feet while he's punching at the same time. And he doesn't stop punching. While he's punching, he's watching you as well. So he's moving in with that feet, making adjustments, catching you on the way back. And Keith Thurman, all he's doing is backing up. He's not doing anything. What he should be doing is taking a couple steps back and going left or right. Stepping left or right, but not backing all the way up to the ropes. And this is a different angle that Manny's giving you. He's there and he's not. He's punching you all over the place. So far, Manny's doing a great job. And you saw on that replay where Manny missed the first three and landed the fourth. Yeah. So, because he just keeps his hands moving. And he keeps you on the defense and then eventually slides one in somewhere. When we spoke with Keith Thurman yesterday, he told us he breaks down his fights into three periods. Rounds one through four, he said, it's hard to dominate me early. Rounds five through eight, I assess my performance, see where I am, and then I try and win the fight in the championship rounds 9 through 12. Heidi Androll is with Thurman's trainer, Dan Birmingham. That's right, Kenny. Dan, you know, we talked in the fighter meetings, and he said the fifth round is where you guys start to make adjustments. What did you tell Keith Thurman coming into this fight? Just to be smart and not drop his hands inside and work his body, try to slow him down. What did he say to you? I saw him and whisper something to you. He said yes, yes. All right, thanks so much, Dan. Guys? All right, thanks very much, Heidi. 
This is round five, scheduled up to 12 from the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Pacquiao had the advantage early over the first couple of rounds. Keep Good right in. hand. That's come on. Call Pacquiao on the right. Well, Thurman's doing the right thing. He's pressing Pacquiao, not letting him get those quick feet off on him in the quick hands. And if you keep Pacquiao on the defense like he's doing, he landed a good right hand to him. And this is his round so far. I wouldn't back up a bit off of uh, Pacquiao if, if I were his coach, telling him to keep the pressure on him. His hands up. That was smart. Because you don't want to drop your hands around Pacquiao. We saw another strong right from Thurman, and then the comeback. The response by Pacquiao. Thurman's nose is bleeding a little bit. That's going to affect his breathing a little bit down the line. Yeah, he's got his mouth open. That's never very good. You're right. Here's Keith Thurman's wife, Priyana, attending her first boxing match. They met in Tokyo, married in Nepal. Rooting on her husband here in Las Vegas. Okay, Thurman walking straight in. He's got his hands up and elbows in, but man, he's still threading the needle, coming right up the middle. A little left hand, right uppercut. He did that twice to him. But Thurman's coming right back. Yeah, Thurman should come back, especially after Manny comes to his body. He's not really throwing any shots back. That's when he should swing around with that left hook. With 30 seconds left in this round. And I, I got it pretty even. Somebody's got to make a move here to really win this round, clearly. It was a nice little move by both guys. Boy, Thurman's face is really starting to show the effects of Manny Pacquiao's power punches. It sure is. Blood streaming down on both sides. Time winding down oh. in round five. Thurman just reacted very badly to that last series of punches. And he's... Yeah, he's, he's, he's no... He's... Upstairs to Chris Myers. Chris. All right, I'm with Deontay Wilder and Ray Boom Boom Mancini. And uh, your react. you thought that Manny was up to the task. He was challenged early. He's responded the way you thought he would. Absolutely. And I've said it for me. It's his footwork. His footwork is killing Thurman. Thurman can't figure him out. He's got him, Manny's got him talking to himself. Yeah, most definitely. I think so. You, you're definitely right. The, the, feet, the feet work is, is unbelievable right now, especially with a Thurman. He's so slow. He don't know how he don't, he don't know how to adjust to, to no. Manny with his speed. Right. He don't even know where he's at. Because he's yeah. guarding his eyes and, and his hands. And his punches are dragging. And his dragging. punches are dragging. See, he came out already swinging and trying to get in the slug fest. And yeah, Thurman tested him early, Dante, and he saw right away yeah. that Manny is he's a freak of nature at age 40 to be this quick. And this is still powerful for Pacquiao. That's, that's, that's scary right there. Yeah, he got, Manny got to keep his hands up. All right, let's go back ringside with Kenny Lennox. And Joe Goosen. All right, thanks very much, Chris. This is round six, scheduled for 12. Manny Pacquiao and Keith one-time Thurman. Thurman unbeaten, 29-0. Well, that's in big jeopardy right now because Manny Pacquiao's really taking charge in this fight. And look, at the end of that last round, Thurman was really unsteady walking back to his corner. His face is a bloody mess. They're having a hard time keeping that blood from flowing from his nose. You know, he's got to really step it up and do something drastic to, uh, to even this up. I don't know if he can do it, though. Manny looks so darn good. And who would have thought at 40 years old and just after all these fights, he'd still have this type of energy and, and vibrancy and power. It's amazing. Couple of right jabs by Pacquiao. Premier Boxing Champions returns to Fox on August 3rd. Thanks for joining us tonight on both Fox and Pay-Per-View. Midway through, round six. Nice right, nice right. counter, uh huh? Exactly. Uh, Keith Thurman. There's Floyd Mayweather in the front row. He beat Pacquiao. 
unanimous decision here back in May of 2015. And tonight, Pacquiao matches Mayweather with his 15th fight Pretty here at the MGM Grand. Pretty I'll tell you, I'll tell oh, you, sorry, go ahead. I'll tell you what Mayweather's thinking right now. What? These guys can't beat you. I'm going to come back and beat you and show the world I can beat you and how it's done. Well, it goes to show you how great Mayweather was. He totally diffused everything that Pacquiao's doing here tonight in his fight with him. It's pretty amazing to think about that. As good as Thurman is, uh, you know, this just looks like it's a total domination by Pacquiao. Yeah, I mean, Thurman's not even stopping the job right now. He can't even see the job. He's too quick. Thurman knocked down by Pacquiao back in round one. Oh, left by Pacquiao, and then Thurman able to duck away. Twenty seconds remaining in round six. You know, Keith's nickname is one time. I don't know if he's got one shot that could actually hurt Pacquiao. Well, the, the only shot that can hurt Pacquiao is if Pacquiao puts his hands down or keeps his hands down and gets caught on the chin. Champions in a welterweight division. Earl Spence Jr., Sean Porter. We've heard from both of them earlier in our telecast. They will get together on pay-per-view in Los Angeles Staples Center on September 28th. It's Thurman and Pacquiao tonight here in Las Vegas. Six rounds in the books. Come on, baby. Work hard, work hard. Keep them hands up. He's smart. Dan Birmingham, a protege of Thurman's first trainer, the late Ben Getty, who passed away in 2009. Ben's son, Chris, is a member of Thurman's team. Thurman told us that Ben Getty always told him, don't leave it up to the judges. I'd like to honor Ben with a knockout or a TKO here tonight. This is round seven. Remember, Thurman bet on himself to knock out Pacquiao in the first, second, or seventh round. He probably is saying that. I don't think he bet on himself. No? No. Boxers don't usually do that. Well, we're at the halfway point right here, and I think it's so far been all Pacquiao. And, you know, Thurman came out hot. And throwing some nice combinations, and then he, he he takes his foot off the gas. I think he's got to give a good three-minute effort for the next, you know, six rounds here, and try to win this half of the fight, or else. Ooh, oh, oh, right nice by counter. Thurman. You could tell Pacquiao wasn't happy with that. He realized he made a mistake and touched himself in the head. Yeah, Thurman slipped a, a left hand by Pacquiao and came back with a with a nice sharp counter right hand. And then we saw another sharp right from Thurman. These are the things that Thurman has to do to be able to... For three minutes, yeah. Well, to cope with what Pacquiao's doing right now. He's got to develop something that works for him. Midway through, round seven. It's a nice jab by Thurman, and then a lead left hand by Pacquiao, and, and now this exchange here. So, they're trading punches. Oh, good right hand left hook by Thurman. And, and Pacquiao laughs. It's pretty amazing. As they were separated by the referee, Kenny Bayless. Another smile from Manny Pacquiao. See, if Thurman does this, gets through his combination, then moves away, Manny Pacquiao's going to get a little desperate. Well, I, I don't know if he's going to get desperate because he's so far ahead right now. In my mind, I think he's far ahead. I think he's won the majority, if not all the first... 
six rounds. No, I'm saying he, his reaction when he gets hit, he doesn't like it. Oh, I see what you're saying. It's like, yeah. oh, I made a mistake. I can't make a mistake. You know, he gets upset with himself. And he, well, he just got hit with another right hand left hook. I think Thurman is winning this round. Oh, good right uppercut by Manny. Boy, those punches are really, oh, and a great right hand by Thurman. Time winding down here in round seven. I think Thurman did most of the work in this round. All right, Lennox, let's take a look back at what we saw from Keith Thurman in round seven. Your Keith Thurman steps back and throws an overhand right. Great right hand, great slip. And you can see how Manny reacted to that. We're gonna see it again. And here we go. Yeah, he's upset that he got hit. And you see Thurman scoring with a, a, a quick jab. And here's a quick right hand and a quick jab, and he's following it. These are the things he's gonna have to do, unpredictable stuff that are unexpected by Pacquiao. Hold on, Thurman hold on, hold on, hold on. landed 20 power punches in round seven. Pacquiao Come on, we only got five. Keep. Thurman Warrior, said earlier this week, I get to punch a center in Three, the face. Manny Pacquiao elected to the House of Let's Representatives of the Philippines in 2010, elected to the Senate six years later. It's a six-year term. Pacquiao told us yesterday, it's back to the office this week for three months of budgeting. <laughs> and to serve the people, to take care of the concerns of the country. So the budget on his mind. But a potential five more rounds to go here tonight in the ring before he heads back to the office. And once again, we check in with our unofficial scorer, Marcos Villegas. Yeah, Kenny, I got this fight tightened up a little bit. The last two rounds I gave to Keith Thurman, he's doing a good job of pushing Manny back, keeping him occupied, mixing off his offense both to the body and to the head. He has a good momentum right now, so let's see if he could uh, keep on building on it. One thing he can't do is, is he's leaning back a little bit too much with his hands down, and he might get caught with something from Manny. So Marcos has given the last two rounds on his scorecard to Keith Thurman. Look at punches landed. Very close. Referee Kenny Bayless calling to watch their heads. Kenny Bayless, one of the great referees of all time in Las Vegas. He's been on the job for decades and has been in all the biggest fights. He knows what he's looking at, and he's staying out of this fight for the most part, which is what a great referee does. Paul Thurman to keep his punches up about 20 seconds ago. As we hit the midway point of round eight, Kenny Albert, Lennox Lewis, Joe Goosen ringside from MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas. Right Cut. jab there by Thurman. Couple of nice right hands by Thurman. He's got to keep the pressure on. See, he needs this half of the fight. Good left hook by Thurman, as a matter of fact. But, you know, if I'm breaking this up into two two parts, I give the first, oh, good count. Oh, both countering each other. I give the first half, the first half of this fight to Pacquiao, whether he lost a round or two here or there. He won the first half. Thurman has got to win this half of the fight. Well, we told you about Thurman's philosophy. Breaks it down into rounds one through four, five through eight, nine through 12. Pacquiao's got such a great feel of what he needs to do in a fight. And he knew, and I'm sure he knew, and I, his corner knew he lost that last round. And I'm sure they egged him on. Hey, don't lose another round like that again. Get back into this fight. And again, we see the blood coming out of the nose of Keith Thurman. Look at that left hand by Pacquiao and a counter right uppercut by Thurman. He's, they're both so quick that it's hard to keep track of what they're doing. Yeah, Pacquiao, when he throws his punches, he doesn't stay there to admire his work. He's out of there. Yeah. He's showing you a different angle. Ooh, that was a little miss, but it, there, that one he's looking for it twice, and he found it the second time, a little bit, and the third time. Time winding down here in round eight. Oh, Thurman coming on good at the end here. This could steal the round for him. Errol Spence Jr., IBF World Welterweight Champion, unbeaten 25-0. 
will enter the ring against Sean Porter in Los Angeles on pay-per-view on September 28th. All right, here we go. Here comes that overhand right where we saw it towards the end of the round. Bam, right there. There were about two or three of them at the end of this round, which I think stole the round for Thurman. And there's another one by, after he slipped the, uh, the jab by Pacquiao. So he may have pulled out that round just by that last flurry in the last 10 seconds. And Thurman's been throwing that right hand in a couple of rounds. It's like a sneaky, quick right hand. Anytime he sees Pacquiao making the move, he just throws it. It's a little lead right hand, yeah. And I, I, I want to give credit where credit's due. Uh, both corners uh, are working really well on sta staunching the flow of blood. You got uh, uh, Mike Rodriguez in Manny Pacquiao's corner and, and Carlos Vargas in Thurman's corner, who's really doing a good job. That's a tough nosebleed to stop, but they're doing a pretty good job of it the way it looked about four or five rounds ago. This is round nine, scheduled for 12. Manny Pacquiao, the only eighth division champion in boxing history. He's held 12 titles. Keith Thurman, the WBA super welterweight champion. Working to defend his belt for the fourth time. Nice right hand by Thurman. He shouldn't be giving up any ground. He should be pressing this fight right now and making Pacquiao back up. Yeah, even, if, even if Pacquiao comes at him, he shouldn't back up. He should be slipping and blocking. And being there, Pacquiao will be closer for the counter. But to take a step back, well, there was a nice little step back and a counter, but it fell short. Thurman said in the first first quarter he said he looks at the fight in three quarters so the first quarter went by he would decide on what he would do for the next two quarters what do you think he's going to do Joe? well I, look I think he should be doing what has been successful it's been winning in rounds and that's putting pressure on and taking it to Manny pinning him up against the ropes and throwing combinations that's what's been winning in the rounds backing up has not been winning in the rounds Thurman knocked down by Pacquiao late in round one there one minute remaining in this Ninth round. So he took a chance right there, went in there, and threw a nice four or five punch combination and landed him. That's scoring points. That's winning. That's going to win the round for you on the judges' scorecards if you do that often enough. Good right hand by Thurman right there. There you go. Good body shot. This is where he's doing his best work. This is when he's backing Pacquiao up. Nice combination by Thurman oh, and yeah. a right hook. He landed a right hand and a good hook. See? Now the response by Manny Pacquiao. See, Manny knows one thing. When he loses a set, a combination set, that he's got to get it back and even it up on the judges' scorecards. And that's what he's doing right now. Good right to the body by Keith Thurman and uppercut at the same time. I think Thurman pulled that round out. Let's check back in with Chris Myers. Chris. Kenny, the uh, counter punching has been outstanding for these two Warriors. And that knockdown in the opening round, that was only the second time in the career of Keith Thurman that he was knocked down. This is his 30th pro fight. But Thurman has come on. Yeah. We said seventh round, he'd make a strategy adjustment. What's he doing differently, effectively? He's coming forward. And that's what I thought he had to be. He's, he's a successful against men. you got to come forward, pressure him. He let Manny set the pace too early on. His punches were dragging, but it looks like he got a second win. Who do you have winning this fight? Oh, it's, uh, I mean, it's obvious who's winning this fight. Pacquiao. You know, even the blind man can see this. <laughs> okay. And um, he's just, uh, Thurman, he's just, he, he have not found his momentum. He can't adjust right now. And, and when you can't find your momentum and dress, adjust, you're going to go through this. You're going to get beat up like he's doing now. And Thurman running out of time. Let's go back to Kenny Ringside. All right, thanks, Chris. Thurman did land a fight high, 26 punches in round nine. Both Pacquiao and Thurman have gone the distance in most of their recent fights. Pacquiao in eight of his last nine, Thurman in five of his last six. This is round 10, scheduled for 12. Well, here we go. So, I, you know, uh, punch high for, uh, for Thurman in that last round. He's got Pacquiao backing up. Look, I mean, 
it's bound to happen. I mean, maybe the age is ca catching up right now with Packer these last couple of rounds, and Thurman's uh, youth is paying off for him because he, he looks the more fresh right now. You just can't ever underestimate Packer. He can hurt you at any time. But Thurman was taking the play away from him the last couple of rounds, and he's got to keep doing it like that. He's the one landing punches right now. Yeah, he's got to get Pacquiao thinking about defense, not offense. That's right. Again, we check in with our unofficial scorer, Marcos Villegas. Kenny, Keith Thurman has been doing a, a very good job of scoring with this jab. We saw the last round he won that, and it's because I felt he worked the jab, was able to keep Manny at the distance and keep him occupied, keep him thinking so he can't launch his offense. Right now, I have an 86 to 84 Manny Pacquiao, but it's tightening up. All right, so Marcos has awarded Thurman three of the last four rounds. A look at the total jabs landed and thrown. Pacquiao 23%, Thurman at just 14%. Well, you know, I, I, I don't disagree with those numbers because Pacquiao, wherever he goes, he's always flicking out his right hand. That always precedes, and, and oh boy, there's a headbutt. Either that or a punch, but it may have been a headbutt. I missed it. Oh. Uh. Now, Kenny Bayless will step in between the fighters. But see, Thurman, Thurman kind of did himself a disservice. He let Pacquiao come in and take control of this round right from the beginning. He went backwards. There's another headbutt right there as Thurman threw that right uppercut to the belly of Pacquiao. But Pacquiao's got Thurman on the run right now, and he's got him hurt in a way that uh, he's, he's flinching a little bit. But here comes Thurman with a good left hook. And then a right. Follow up the left hook with a right hook to the face of Pacquiao. Thurman's putting his head down for some reason. I don't yeah. know if he's got a rib shot or he's got a pain or in his body or something. Yeah, that body language, that's what I was talking about earlier. He, there's something that's bothering him right now. Ten seconds. And Thurman's giving up ground. That's not good. Okay, there you go, but... Again, Pacquiao stepped back and got out of the way. Boy. Thurman's struggling right now. Yeah, he's just struggling. Breathing. Much better breathing. round. Much better round. Come on, champ. Come on, champ. We're in the championship rounds. Breathe. Breathe first. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Try to trap him on the ropes. When you trap him on the ropes, you take it to him. Real deep breath. Real deep breath. Breathe. Breathe. That's deep it. Breath, deep breath. Breathe. That's it. Relax. Relax. Uh, come on. Let's outwork this. Let's see if we can figure out what exactly what happened. Oh, boy. Body language it, it, is it, showing it, it, me it, that was a body shot. Yeah, it, yeah, it, 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 from, it didn't look like a, a horrible headbutt. It looked more like a body shot, the way Thurman reacted to it. And we saw Thurman take out his mouthpiece, dropped it into his glove. Yeah, you usually don't do that Unless when you get a, a headbutt. Yeah, it's a body shot. Yeah. Okay, well, you heard Dan Birmingham tell him, you got to get him on the rope. So what we've been saying and advising, Dan Birmingham has been saying and advising, but Thurman has not been following the instructions completely. Let's see if he can do it this round. He's, Dan Birmingham was very adamant that he had to get him on the ropes and really do some damage. So let's see. This is round 11, scheduled for 12 in Las Vegas on pay-per-view. Thurman has landed more punches than Pacquiao, but how about the effectiveness of those punches, Lennox? Well, I would say Pacquiao has more, two more effective punches. Pacquiao knocked down Thurman back in round one. Pacquiao's, two minutes remaining here in round 11. If you notice, Pacquiao's going with that left hand down to the rib cage. He's looking for that little uppercut right there. I think he knows he hurt him there earlier uh, in that last round, and he's going back to it. Good left hook, right hand by Thurman. 
Good uppercut by Thurman. Yeah, but I, I, if we're talking about the punch stats, I think, without a doubt, Pacquiao's punches have been much more devastating and uh, debilitating. He's uh, drawn blood. He's doubled Thurman over. I think he's the harder puncher, no doubt. Yeah, the fact that Thurman got hurt in that last round, that's kind of slowed him down in this round. Oh, good, good right, right hand. hand by Thurman. Yeah, he stepped into it when he threw that right hand. Yes, he did. And now Pacquiao over to dance away. But he's got to capitalize on it. Now he's got to throw not only the right hand, but that left hook. Look at Pacquiao, though. He's, he's such a monster. He just comes right back. He takes whatever you give him. This is why he's one of the greatest. And Thurman's reacting to anything Pacquiao is throwing right now. So he, he's on the defensive mode, especially when Pacquiao throws punches. He's on a defensive mode. He's trying to get out of there. When he should be looking for a way back, he should be looking to answer the call, throw a punch back. 30 seconds remaining in round 11. Oh, left by Pacquiao. Final seconds, round 11. You will see Thurman scoring with a great right hand straight through. This is when you throw a straight right hand. It goes straight to the target. And Pacquiao's face was right there. Dan Birmingham telling Keith Thurman, let it all go. We He's also heard Freddie Roach chatting with Manny Pacquiao, the only eight division champ in boxing history. This is the 12th and final round. The reason Birmingham said to Thurman, let it all go, because he knows he's not winning the fight. Even though he's been in the fight, he's had great moments in the fight. He just happens to be up one of the great legendary fighters of all time, who at 40 years old can still deal with 30 year old champions that have never been beaten before that being said Birmingham knows that Keith Thurman needs a knockout to win this fight I agree with that Manny Pacquiao turned pro in January of 95 Keith Thurman was six years old Pacquiao won his first title in 1998 in the flyweight division at the age of 19 here he is 21 years later he will turn 41 in December. See, Pacquiao's doing the right thing right now. He knows it's the last round. Why take that chance? Right. He should just move around and, or definitely be protected and protect himself and not get hit with no yeah. silly punches. It's not like he won't fight this round because he is fighting this round, but he's not going to try to go for a knockout because he doesn't need one. Usually, usually you know, in Keith Thurman's point of view, he's going to try to do it, but whether he's got enough gas in... in in the, the tank to be able to do it. Oh, good luck down by back down. We hit the midway point of round 12. The only knockdown came back in round one. Pacquiao knocking down Thurman late in the round. That's where Thurman should have gone to work right there. He let Pacquiao right back off the ropes. Even if, even if Thurman wins this round, it's not going to win him the fight. He needs a knockout. Yeah, he does. Period. He's, he just absorbed too many, too much punishment in the earlier rounds. Let so. it all go. Those are the instructions from his trainer, Dan Birmingham, prior to this 12th round. 
He has 50 seconds left. He's whipping that right hand, Thurman, but, you know. But he shook that right hand, so he must have heard it as well. The thing is, Pacquiao's been able to absorb anything that Thurman's thrown and come right back at, at Thurman just as strong every time. Down to 25 seconds remaining. Oh. Got him with a right. Got to come back with that left hook. Back out through a right hook at the same time he got hit by that right hand. All right, here we go. This is early on. That, uh, that was the first knockdown. That was the left hand of the belly, the right cross to the chin, and Thurman went down. That was Manny. He was very fresh, very accurate, very powerful early on. You can see the effects of Manny's punches right there with the blood on Thurman's face. Here comes and Thurman. And here's, here's Thurman throwing some good jabs, good right hands. That quick right hand was apparent through the whole fight by Thurman. This is what you do against Southpaws. This is the last shot of Manny catching Thurman. Thurman reacting to it. This is a little hug after this hard fight. The final numbers. Total punches landed and thrown. Pacquiao threw more punches, but Thurman landed more, 37%. The 192 power punches landed by Thurman, most by a Pacquiao opponent in 43 of his fights, cracked by CompuBox. Keith Thurman came into this fight unbeaten, 29 and 0. Manny Pacquiao has now fought 486 rounds in his pro career, the most of any active fighter. He's gone the distance at nine. Of his last 10. Pacquiao's wife, Jinky. And Furman's wife, Priyana. They await the decision. So do we. Jimmy Lennon Jr. has it. Ladies and gentlemen, after 12 rounds of action, we go to the scorecards. We have a split decision. Here are the score totals. Judge ringside, Glenn Feldman scores about 114 to 113 in favor of Keith Thurman. Judge ringside, Dave Moretti scores about 115, 112 in favor of Manny Pacquiao. And judge at ringside, Tim Cheatham sees it 115 to 112 in favor of the winner. Boxing's pride of the Philippines, the ageless wonder, the one and only current WBA welterweight champion of the world, Manny Pac-Man Pacquiao! Errol Spence and Danny Garcia for the welterweight championship of the world. Let's go to the ring and Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to the spectacular AT&T Stadium here in Arlington, Texas, as Premier Boxing Champions presents the featured bout of the evening, promoted by TGB Promotions, Man Down Promotions, and DSG Promotions, as sponsored by proper number 12 Irish whiskey, the finest, the tastiest, the smoothest liquid gold in the world. And O'Reilly Auto Parts, order your parts online at O'ReillyAuto.com and get free curbside pickup. This bow is sanctioned by the WBC, the president in attendance, Mauricio Suleiman, along with the IBF, the president is Daryl Peoples. 
Judging at ringside, Tim Cheatham, Barry Lindemann, and Steve Weisfeld. All right, fans, here we go with the main event of the evening, 12 rounds of boxing for the highly anticipated showdown between the Battle of Pound for Pound greats for the unified WBC and IBF welterweight championship of the world. And now, ladies and gentlemen in attendance and boxing fans joining us around the world, live from AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas, it's time for the main event of the evening. <laughs> Introducing to you first, the challenger on my left, fighting out of the red corner, wearing purple trunks with white trim, fighting out of and representing his home of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He weighed in at 146 and three quarter pounds. His record stands at 36 wins, two losses, with 21 wins coming by way of knockout. In his 10th world title appearance, and having captured the unified super lightweight and welterweight titles, tonight he attempts to regain and reclaim the welterweight crown. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the renowned top-rated world contender, the acclaimed former two-division champion of the world, introducing Danny Swift Garcia! And his opponent across the ring is the defending world champion, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing black trunks with pink trim, fighting out of and proudly representing Dallas, Texas. He weighed in at a ready 146 and one half pounds, Truly one of the stars of boxing and pound for pound greats. He is undefeated in his campaign in the ring with a record of 26 wins, no losses, 21 wins coming by way of knockout. Tonight in a remarkable return to the ring, he is making his fifth world title appearance. Defense of his title, ladies and gentlemen. Here is the former U.S. Olympian and current sensational reigning and defending undefeated WBC and IBF welterweight champion of the world, introducing the truth, Errol Spence Jr. The referee in charge now to give instructions, Thomas Taylor. Marker. Okay, corner. Trunks are a little high, so I'm going to give him to the middle of the letters here. He's also going to get to the middle of the letters here, okay? Trunks are a little high. I gave you instructions in the back, gentlemen. Protect yourselves at all times and listen to my commands. Touch them up. Back to your corner, gentlemen. Tonight's odds are provided by Fox Bet. If you bet $100 on the favorite, that's Errol Spence. You win $25. If you Bet $100 on Danny Garcia. He's a big underdog. You'd win $250. The payout, $350. And we are trending number one in the United States on Twitter. Welterweight Championship of the World. Danny Garcia says, I believe I can hurt him. The first round, vitally important to see the effects of that car crash on Errol Spence and the strategy of Danny Garcia. We're underway, round number one. Spence pressing forward already behind the jab. Garcia fires a right hand back. Garcia wants to dictate the pace. He normally takes the air out of the ball and will slow things down. He is content to counter punch in most of his fights. Yeah, it's kind of hard to uh, you know, give a guy pressure in the first round when he's pressuring you. And uh, Spence is really doing the right thing. This is how he fought. This is how he fights. I agree 100%, Lennox. And Danny Garcia would be wise to take his time here and at least size up what Errol Spence has got and land when he can and defend himself when he has to. Spence already able to land that jab to the body and he is active with that jab. It's an effortless jab. Right hands to the body from Danny Garcia, able to land a few of his own. Now it's worth noting that Danny Garcia is 5 and 0 oh against Southpaws. He's fought five Southpaws, he's 5 and 0 oh against them. Now he's never fought anybody exactly like Errol Spence, but you know. It's 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 a little feather in his cap right here. He's never lost to one. Yeah, the last southpaw that he, he boxed against, uh, 
was um, Ivan Redcatch. And uh, you know he was practicing the right hand to the body, so I'm expecting the right hand to the, to uh, Spence's body right now because he's been practicing that with the last southpaw, so he's going to do it with this one. You know Garcia able to block that that left hand to the body. Uh, Errol Spence is the most accurate body puncher in boxing. He is able to land with that left hand continually, and Garcia able to block that. That could be significant in this fight. There's a shot that landed from Spence. Good combination. Well, Spence landed, but Danny Garcia connected with a counter right hand left hook. So, you know, this is what Danny's good at. You touch him, he'll play tag with you really well. Spence. He doesn't want to sit on the ropes, I can tell you that, Brian. Spence coming in with that left hand charging hard but you're absolutely right Garcia will do subtle things that are sometimes difficult to see comes in with that right hand to the body but he is able to respond and counter punch effectively He'll counter right hand drive Spence back there's another example of it Spence landed the straight left of the belly and, and and Garcia countered with the right hand up top do you think he can hurt Errol Spence I mean everybody can hurt everybody Joe but you know do you think he can actually land and hurt Spence it's hard to hurt Spence he's been hit by you know some of the best guys in the division I've, I've really never seen him hurt a lot of tension in this building, I can tell you that. Yeah, but Danny Garcia, like any time he's throwing his punches, he's throwing his punch with his body behind him. He knows how to use his, his weight. He does. He does. That's why Thurman said he's the hardest hitting guy he's been in the ring with. Garcia able to land with the jab to the body. The left hand there from Spence. Spence is usually content to slow. And there's a right hand from Garcia straight up the middle, able to land. And you know Garcia's right hand is not coming straight. It's coming. It's like a whipping right hand, and he throws it very well. Yeah, he knows how to fight a southpaw, and and uh, Spence is uh, again trying to put on that pressure, but he's got to be careful not to get put by a counter punch himself. Final seconds there of round number one. We'll take another look and we'll try to get Sean Porter's prediction now, right? We've yeah. seen one round. <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 Errol Spence with a jab. Danny Garcia parried it and missed with a counter right hand. Here goes that body shot. Garcia throws that little chopping right and then a left hook that landed on top of the head. So that's what he'll do to you. And there's that little sweeping right you were talking about, Lennox. But see, Danny Garcia knows how to fight a southpaw. And you, you know you got to use the lead right hand at the right time, and he does it. And the other thing that Danny Garcia does is he'll move to the left hand of a southpaw, which is completely opposite of what you're taught normally. And uh, you know southpaws expect you to go to their right hand side, and if you change that up like Garcia does, it's a little confusing for southpaws. Spence is totally committed to the body. Ten of his 15 landed punches were to the body, and sometimes they're hard to see. But even in that exchange, you could see Spence is able to snake in a shot and land a good body shot on Danny Garcia. You're right. When he goes to the body, he usually lands. It's rare that Errol Spence misses with a body shot. And he outlands against everybody, Joe. It's remarkable. Like what he did against Mikey Garcia was was incredible. But he is able. He's, he just outlands everybody. He's probably going to outland Garcia. It's just a matter tonight if Garcia can do damage damage to the shots he lands. You're right. Yeah, but you know, Garcia is a, a very tricky fighter and he, he moves well and he, he tries to set traps for his opponents. He, just when you think you have him and you're getting him, he comes out with a with a punch, a left hook or right hand or a body punch. Uh, we will find, by the way, I hope Kate Abdo is up there uh, recording the predictions now for <laughs> Sean Porter because we, we believe Sean is ready to make his predictions. So that's it for round one. <laughs> but, you know, I'm sure there there is information to be processed after round one. So Lennox, you first. What did we learn in round one from the fitness of Spence and the strategy of Garcia? No, I expect Spence to come out like this, and I expected Garcia to come out like he Ooh. did. Like I said, he's going to pick his moments. He hasn't he hasn't reached that moment yet. He's still checking out uh, Spence and, and seeing what he can do. But he's just, you know, warming up into the first couple rounds. But Spence looks like Spence, doesn't he, Joe? I mean, that looks Absol like Errol Spence. Absolutely. Right. And, and that's kind of what I said going into this thing. And I agree with Sean. Give him a round. Let's see what, what, what Errol Spence ex looks like exactly. And he looks like just that nice left hand right there. He looks like his old self. He's putting on pressure. He's taking chances. He's looking to win this fight. I don't see any hesitation in his style or his demeanor at all. Right, you know, Spence, if you watch Errol Spence against either Kelbrook, Mikey Garcia, 
uh, Sean Porter in the early rounds would say, hey, this is competitive, he has his hands full. And then in the later rounds, he busted up Brooke, made him quit, befuddled Garcia, and knocked down Sean Porter. So if this is what we see with Spence now, he usually gets better and better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's true. But, you know, again, Danny Garcia is probably in the best shape of his life. He'll be good down the stretch himself. That doesn't mean that Errol Spence can't, uh, you know, put some real hurt on him and stop him later on in the fight. That could happen. Oh, got caught in there. A little off balance with the jab after he threw the haymaker right hand. Yeah, he was able to drive Spence back a little bit. That could be significant. Yeah, that was a good haymaker left hand by Spence. Now, uh, the probability of Spence knocking Danny Garcia out, I might add, I don't think is is high. I, I think this is a is a long distance fight. Because both of these guys are very savvy and very experienced. I thought that was and, interesting in the last few not seconds. Prone to though, get Joe. knocked out. Right, like I, just to see Danny Garcia able to get physical, land a shot, drive Spence back. Again, that's a little more information to take here. And oh, that's clearly after the bell. But we're going to go upstairs and find out what Sean Porter is thinking. Got, Kate Abdo, take it away. Thanks very much, guys. Yeah, we gave you two rounds, not one, but you made your decision after the first. I'm telling you, no need to even cue me up. Listen, I love what I see tonight. Danny Garcia is, he's not being aggressive, but he's punching. He's trying to punch and counter every time Errol Spence throws. That's exactly yep. what he needs to do, and I love what I'm seeing from Errol Spence. He looks like he's 100%. He looks like he's himself. I got Errol Spence Jr. winning a close decision tonight. Guys, we got a pick. Mm. Brian, back uh -huh. to you. All right, there you go. <laughs> Nervous. I hate picking. <laughs> At least we put his feet to the fire. And it, I believe Danny Garcia outlanded Errol Spence in that second round. Uh, er Errol Spence uh, is rarely outlanded on the CompuBox stats, as we watch here at the end of the round, getting physical. Now it's late. That was nice. See, Danny Garcia is smart. He's crafty. He's cunning. And uh, he hits hard. And I, I like what Sean just said. And who better to tell us what's going on in the ring between these two guys uh, since he's been in with both? And look for Garcia's point, right, not to go away quietly. Indeed, there it is, 8-7, and punches landed for Danny Garcia after getting outlanded 15-9. to nine. Not that that means that the, the winner of the CompuBox numbers wins the round, but it can be indicative of what happened. And if you're a Garcia fan, I think you could be slightly heartened, Lennox, possibly, by what you saw there for at least that 30-second stanza. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like I said, he's going to pick his, his, his spots. The only problem with that, what he did, he hit him after the bell. You know, he tested the chin after the bell. You got to test the chin while the round is going on. That was Garcia nice. goes down. No, that was a trip over the Oh, yeah. Front. yeah. It just oh. got awkward and went down, of course. Which happens all the time, most of the time, with uh, when you got an orthodox boxer and a southpaw boxer. Uh, they always mix, mix their feet up. See, Danny Garcia has been real clever here right now. And look at him. He's coming in with the 1-2-1. One, one. He's starting off the jab right here and stop, stop, finishing stop, stop. with the jab. And that's kind of bothersome for Errol Spence right now. Yeah, they're both going to the body. Again, Spence is the best in the world at throwing body shots. Look at that jab. It's beautiful as well. I mean, he's such a complete boxer. But there's a hard left hand by Errol Spence. Drives Garcia back. To the body. He hit him to the body for sure. And, Errol, and Danny tried to counter and fell off balance. Errol has deceptive power, doesn't he? I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't have that body where you think he's going to hurt you. It's a hard right hand by Garcia. But he is able to really lay the wood to you. Yeah, he, he's putting his body behind his punches as well. He's, he's, he's launching that, that left hand from far and is, and is coming far and is landing. Spence, yeah, is dig yeah, Spence is digging in. Yeah, I don't, think here. I don't think there's anything deceptive about Errol Spence's power, to tell you the truth. I think it's a proven commodity and that you uh, anybody that's going to be in there with him, if you're a coach on the other side, you know that he's a dangerous guy at all times. Well, it's an accumulation of power. You know, it's not Tommy Hearns on Pequino Cuevas. You know, it's not he got starts you with one shot. But obviously, well, he look, can, he, 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 put, he can put you down. Oh, look, he did, he did it to Sean Porter. Uh, he did that Who's, late, but it was an accumulation of punishment. I mean, look at the physiques of the guy. You could say that. See, I like what Errol Spence is doing right now. He's close to Danny. He's got his hands up high. Yeah. And he's, yeah. he's basically yeah. putting, you know, pressure on him. Forcing him to either throw a punch so he can do something off of that. Good jab work there by Errol Spence. He spins Garcia around and he continues to punch. Hey, that's fair game. Yeah, that's done good. right. Yeah, Spence was good. He didn't hit him behind the back. He aimed for the front of the head. Yep. Absolutely not a dirty fighter. Again, he was hit after the belt too. So he could try to return the favor. Let's go, Danny. Danny, let's go. 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 Let's
go. In the final seconds of round number three. This is Spirited build, action this is here in the first build. three rounds of the welterweight championship. And we are going to go into the corner and listen to Angel Garcia here after three rounds and see what he says to hey, his Jim, son. Top of the nose. Not the rope, Jack. The one on the rope, not the rope. You know what I mean? Not the rope, like we, No, a little cut, like a scratch. It's a little baby scratch. Little Listen. Scratch Just so you know, he's got a cut on top of the nose. I ruled it from a punch. Okay? okay. You dip and slip and make him pain, though. You're giving him too much confidence. Back him the fuck off. Be smart, Danny. Don't so jump you guys out. guys know this cut is from a punch. On yeah. top of the nose, okay? Danny, it's not a cut, Danny. It's a baby. It's, scratch. Don't worry about it's yeah. a baby nothing. It's put put the blood stop on that. I got it. What are you waiting for? I know. I got Danny. It. It's in here. Danny, don't jump straight back. Okay, keep circling on him, Danny. You gotta make him pay when he, when he throws, go under and work with him. Okay? You give him too much respect, keep your hands up. Fuck this pussy up, man. Yeah, that cuts nothing, Bri, and, and Angel's right. I don't think it's a factor at all. Yeah, there's still a lot of talk about yeah. cut. There's a yeah, cut, there's a cut. <laughs> like, oh, where? 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 Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you what. What's what's more threatening than that cut is the way Errol Spence is putting on pressure right now. Yeah. And look, uh, Errol Spence outlanding Danny Garcia, only 10 to 9. And again, that, that's not the norm. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Larry Hazard right now, see how he scores the first three rounds. Larry, how do you have it? Well, you guys are doing a great job analyzing this thing. I got Spence ahead 30 to 27. Danny Garcia is going to have to take a page out of Sean Porter's book and jump on top of Spence and take this fight into the trenches if he expects to win. Right now, Spence is having his way. I got him three rounds to zero going up. Larry, thank you very much. Yeah, look, that, that could be definitely the way. Possibly second round could go to Garcia. Joe Lennox, would you have any rounds going to Danny so far? No, not now. Like I said, you know, Spence is controlling the fight with his jab. And he's controlling the distance, and he's throwing good combinations. When, when you when you step in with the jab like that, Danny Garcia is just moving around. He's 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 f trying to find a way to counter punch. Good hook there by Garcia, at least uh, landed slightly uh, on the side. And there's a body shot, little right hand to the body, and then the head. To answer your question, it's it's hard to ever argue with Larry Hazard, and I completely agree with him. It's look, it's uh, right now with Sean Porter. Uh, uh, sorry, it's Errol Spence that is really pressing the action here. That's taking the fight to Garcia, and uh, he's the one that looks like he's winning the fight. And Angel said, "Look, you got, don't give him so much respect, right?" So he's asking him to get in there close. Oh, right, he he understands what he's looking at right now. Yeah, you know, the size difference on the, the height difference really makes a matter uh, difference as well because, you know, with Errol throwing that jab, you know. It's, and Danny boxing against a guy that's a great jabber, plus he's taller and he throws a lot of punches. You know, it's kind of difficult for Danny to really uh, focus on what he needs to do. What he needs to do is really come back with the punches like his father was saying. Don't give him those free shots. Don't step back too much. Better off stepping to the side, which he did. And Errol Spence just, Lennox makes that so difficult. He's so active. That jab is long, it's strong, it's snappy. There it is right there, bouncing off the head of Danny Garcia. And at any moment, he will throw that left hand to the body. There it is, a good uppercut as well. And Spence is number one in the welterweight division in punches per round. Punches landed per round, jabs landed, power punches. And body punches. Yeah, I mean, he's just, he's, he is number one. His accuracy in his body shots, also number one in a star-studded division. But yet you see punches landed, 43 to 35. That's not a wide margin. Garcia tries with the right hand. Spence comes firing right back. Excellent work rate by Errol Spence. Right hand was blocked. And that to the body. Garcia stays active. Let's go to the corner of the champion. Listen, when you throw the jab, don't push it out there. Keep it, keep it popping. Don't get too comfortable with it, all right? Keep shooting the stick. And listen, step over and start shooting that. Around here. He's number five, coming up six, coming up, I don't know. Coming up on five, coming up on listen, five. Listen, listen, listen. Now it gotta be six. Listen, keep that, keep that stick popping, right? And then if he's looking for the jab, start sneaking that hook around the side. You gotta shuffle, shuffle to him, or you gotta throw a wild one, one of the two. You make the decision. Well, listen, and also yep. when you get on the side, he make the move. So just step around, don't shoot the shot when he's there. Step around and hit him on the side, all right? You're making him dip down, so when you get, shoot the shot when you get to the side. Don't shoot the shot over his head, all right? 
Six. Six is six. Around five. This is towards the end of the round, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this, is a, this is a little looper around the guard of Spence and it landed. And then he goes back down to the belly and hits him really solid. I mean, he's got to do more of that if he wants to, you know, win rounds here because right now Spence is out working them. Yeah, but not, it's amazing, Joe, to me, with the copy box numbers are, are always so widely in favor of Errol Spence, even against Sean Porter, where Porter was throwing bombs. But the punch differential, the last three rounds has been by one punch. 8, 7, 10, 9, 13, 12. And that means Garcia is in this fight. Now, I'm, I'm, well, that doesn't you, mean everything. I mean, you can see the numbers, but what when you're watching the fight, you're calculating who's winning. Yeah, but also, look, Garcia's landing those shots, Joe, is what I'm saying. He's landing meaningful shots. I know that, but I'm just saying, you can make an estimation by the end of the round who won that round, whether you look at a punch stat or not, can't you? Absolutely. Okay. But what I'm saying is normally, even in a close round, like against Sean Porter, oh, that's a good hard left hand on Garcia. It, Spence would have this wide discrepancy. I mean, he just outlands everybody. And here, Garcia is able to stay in the fight. Now, I don't know if he's taking any rounds, and I think Spence is getting the better of it, but Garcia is very much in this. At least by the copy box, that's a little, the punch has landed. It's a bit surprising. Yeah, well, you know, the judges don't, uh, aren't privy to the punch stat numbers, so they have to actually make an opinion-based scoring. Right, but wouldn't that favor the puncher, right? And there's a good hard shot by Garcia. I think, I think that favors Spence, because if you're a judge looking at this, it looks like Spence is winning round after round, okay? I don't disagree with you, All right. but I'm saying some of the harder shots are being landed by the counter-punching of Danny Garcia. I agree, and he's just whistled one right back. And, and there's two right there that just landed from Garcia. I agree. Lennox, bail us out. Yeah, no, they, they're attacking the body very well. I mean, both guys are, are scoring points. And, uh, you know, oh. I think, oh, great, great combination by Spence right there. You know, Danny needs to move that head a little bit and not get caught like That's that. A whistling left hand right there. And Lennox, what did you say to me between rounds? This is flying. No, 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 no. We're yes. in the fifth round. Yeah, we're in the fifth in round. Incredible. I can't believe this. There, there, is, there is tension in this building, as I mentioned. There's intensity in the ring. It's an interesting fight. Uh, Errol Spence, number one, looks like the Errol Spence that we saw oh. last September. Oh. Wow, right hand over the top well, by Garcia, but it missed. Well, no, I'll tell you what, Spence landed one and Garcia countered, and it looked like it wobbled him right there against the rope. Uh, unless my eyes are deceiving me, I'd like to see that on the replay. We'll take another look at that. I thought it whistled over the top. Yeah, I thought it whistled over the top, too. All right. Double up on the jab. Stop, stop, stop. He no caught point. him. He caught him. He did a little bit of a Texas two-step there near the rope. Yeah. Hard See, hard that, right that's hand. the punch, the sweeping right hook. And he's got the sweeping left hook as well. It's a natural punch by Danny Garcia. Another interesting round. And in this case, the punch has landed in the fifth, 20 to 9 in favor of Errol Spence. And that is the norm in an Errol Spence fight. Let's go back now and look at the end of this and see where did that right hand go? That was the right hand that went over the top. Well, Spence throws, and boom, oh. there, it, it hit him. Of course it did. That's a 10-9 uh, round for oh, Joe Goose. It was a glancing uh -huh. shot. Well, you know, with a whole bunch of knuckles in that glance, all right? Joe, you won that one. Good job. I tell you, at your age to see that, that's well done. Where are you, bro? <laughs> <laughs> you near me? <laughs> that wasn't that yeah. flush. All right, so live this way. Yeah. Okay. Tell him, Lennox. All right. Okay. No, I All thought right. it whistled over this the top, and that, that did graze him. Yeah. So now, would you give her any rounds to Danny Garcia, Joe? Just unofficially, what are your thoughts on this? No? God, I just, right now, I just, you know, it just on, on the appearance alone, it just looks like Errol Spence is, is winning these rounds. Yeah, he is winning these rounds, but uh, Danny is very much in this oh, fight. Oh, without a doubt. And, and yeah. look, he's going to have to do more of what he needs to do, and that's he's got to land his own punches and maybe hold his ground a little bit more. We're in round number six. We are flying here, welterweight championship of the world. And look, Larry Hazard just gave that last round to Danny Garcia. Interesting. Good hard body shot there by Garcia. That's all good stuff right there that's Gar Garcia's doing. And he's got to keep it up and uh, really make an impression on the judges that, uh, you know, he's not just doing it for a couple of seconds here and there, but that he's doing it during the course of the round. You've got to make it emphatic that you win a round. Errol Spence had said that, you know, he wasn't looking to try to avoid any of Garcia's shots in particular. He said, we'll see what kind of power he has. He just wanted to flow, kind of get the computer readout 
on Garcia in the early rounds. And again, he has such a high boxing IQ. He usually comes on stronger and stronger, and his form holds throughout the fight. A lot like Floyd Mayweather in his patience and his acumen throughout the fight, his determination. He stays consistent round after round. Good body shot by Spence. And Spence is just ripping these shots. He's putting everything behind it. He looks like he's just starting to even get more warmed up. And, you know, you know, we know Errol Spence. He's really hot down the stretch. Yeah, Errol Spence wants to put him against the rope, but Danny Garcia is not, st not standing for it. Garcia tries with the right hand. Another jab falls short from Spence. And you see that, that face, Danny Garcia's eye is getting marked up. Not closed just yet, but that jab has found a home right on the eye, left eye of Danny Garcia. Joe, what, what should Danny Garcia be doing? Well, you know, he's 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 doing what he normally does, which is block and counter, slip and counter. He just landed a nice uppercut hook out of that corner before he got off the ropes there. But Spence comes right back and gets everything back. So everything you touch him with, you know, and Garcia tries to counter, Spence comes back and gets it back again from you. So it's a give and take this round. But what, what should uh, Garcia be doing more? I think he's got to hold his ground a little bit more and try to land some thudding hard shots, see if he can put some real damage and hurt Spence with some. This long jab out there for Errol Spence as he has now outlanded Danny Garcia see, 76 to 52. See right now you know Danny's holding his ground right there. Errol gave up some ground and is backing up a little bit. That's where you know uh, Garcia should really take advantage of that. You know punch when when Spence gives you the the opportunity to do it. He yeah. tried to get those body shots in on Garcia. He was able to block one of them, but a lot of those Ooh. shots are getting through. Right hand counter and a left hand counter by Spence right away. But Danny landed a good straight right. Yeah, no doubt. And then he landed one a little looper around the uh, around the gloves of Spence. And then ate one. Yeah. And they're good exchanges here. That's what makes this a great fight yep. right now. Let's go back to Angel Garcia in the corner of Danny. Damn. Damn. Listen, Danny. Danny, you're making it too obvious for him, Danny. You're a way better fighter than that. Yeah, man. Yeah, bro. You're not, you're not getting beat up or nothing like that, but you're making it too easy for him. Like, he's pity paying. You keep backing up. I said, don't back up on the softball, Danny. You can't back up on the softball. You heard me? You're backing up too much, Danny. All right, keep slipping. Keep your hands up. You slipping. Well, here goes Spence right here. And it gets blocked by Garcia, and then he lands that little short left one that he threaded the needle with. And again, right off the uh, right off that eye with that left hand by Spence. But Angel Garcia said something in the corner. It's kind of what we talked about the last round. Danny Garcia's got to hold his ground. He goes, you can't back up against the southpaw. It just won't work. And he, he's got to jump on him like we were talking about. He's got to do more and hold his ground more and land something of consequence. We're in round number seven, and you see the punches landed right there. Let me just, I want to get this out, Joe. I'm not some slave to CompuBox, like that's how you decide to fight. No, I didn't. I'm, I'm just, I just want to set that straight. But this is a guy who outlanded Mikey Garcia, who was a lightweight champion, 345 to 75. I'm just saying, Listen, Spence really outlands his opponents. I, I, okay, we announced that fight, and, and I was there, and Mikey Garcia did not do a quarter of what he normally does in any fight. He, he was very intimidated by Errol Spence, and he fought a very defensive fight. That's why he didn't throw a lot of punches like he normally would. Well, yeah, but I agree Spence with Joe is, there. But, well, what? Yeah, Don't Spence, do that. Out, <laughs> Spence outlanded him like five to one, is what I'm saying. It's fact. Uh, Let's go to Larry Hazard. Larry, how do you have it? I have it 59 55. I gave uh, Danny Garcia the fifth round. Hey, look, guys, what Errol Spence is doing. If Danny hits him twice, he hits Danny three times. Right. This is what Errol Spence knows how to garner the judge's attention. And that's what it's all about. Exactly. If Danny can't get on top of Errol uh, Spence and take him into the trenches, he's going to lose this fight on points. Yeah, well, it's just a situation where, you know, uh, Spence throws a lot, a lot of punches around. And he's not stopping it. He's keeping up the volume. The volume is, is what is allowing him to win this fight. Yeah, his work rate has been terrific, especially given the car accident, the year off, the shutdown, all of that. And he is right back to work. And he is aggressive, dedicated. Right hand there from Garcia. 
Uh, but he is relentless. And again, usually it gets more and more in his favor as the rounds go on. And, and might I add, you know, Larry Hazard, I think, summed that up stop, perfectly. Stop. That's why I call him the Professor Larry Hazard. He was right on point, and it's what the judges yeah, are seeing. He was a judge, a he was a commissioner, right no he's clock. done it all. And he you knows that. that the judges are going to be okay, duly impressed by Errol right? Spence hey, and his Errol, pressure and his output okay? right now. You good? Heads clashed right, there. Tom Taylor taking a, a good long look at both fighters, no cuts. Again, we're flying. Round seven, we're in yeah. the final minute already. So this fight, it's, it's dramatic. Uh, yet, yet it could be a clear points win, but we don't know just yet. Garcia, uh, we wonder if he can slap it into another gear. We're getting into that territory where he, he might have to. And, and is he capable of throwing caution to the winds sent coming in? Yeah, Danny's, this is where he should be doing some work, right here. Why not? The other stuff ain't going to work for you. And you can hear the desperation on Angel's, uh, his dad, Angel's voice in the corner. He knows he doesn't like what he's seeing here, and something else has got to change for Garcia. And that's what he's doing right there. Danny is staying in the pocket now, and he's yep. able to land that shot in a body shot. Two right hands to the body in the final seconds of that round. We're through seven. And here we see a great combination by Spence throwing five punches. One, that's two. Three. Four. And that's it. Five. Garcia, Garcia here throwing some combination at the end of the round. Good combination. But, you know, he stopped at two punches and needed to throw more punches. But he elects to go to the body. That's been working all night for him. But use your feet to do it. So by using your feet, you're not in front of him. All right? Taking pose, he's still alive. He still got some shit he's trying to throw. Get the focus. Well, they knew it wasn't going to be easy. You know, when, you, when you're going up against Danny Garcia, you knew it was going to be tough. Uh, the good news is, now we're through seven, and Errol Spence Jr. looks like his old self. No ill effects from the car accident, from being thrown from his Ferrari. He has outlanded Danny Garcia 92 to 61, and he has just shown again that you know, active jab, controlling range and distance, and an outstanding work rate as well. Garcia in the fight, but it appears he's being outboxed by Errol Spence. Well, Errol Spence is just shadowing Danny Garcia along the ropes there. Garcia got off the ropes, he just turned around and came right at him. He's, uh, he's really applying the pressure in this round in particular. Uh, he's just getting a full head of steam right now. Even though Danny Garcia tried his best in that last round to offset some of this pressure, He's going to have to do more. Garcia tries with the jab. Yep, yeah, goes in with the hook, lands a hook to the body. Arrow Spence looks like he's trying to get close to Danny Garcia to, to throw some type of um, uh, left hand or left body punch. He's already in range right there, and I don't know why he isn't letting his hands go a little bit more. His arrow's right there. Well, it's a, you know, it's just not his identity, I guess, Joe. I mentioned earlier, right, like with Sean Porter or Pacquiao or Thurman, like volume is there, pressure fighters, but that, that's not Danny Garcia's game. Yeah, but Danny Garcia is waiting for Arrow to, to, to commit himself. He's waiting for that, that one mistake so he can take advantage of it. But he can be, be waiting all night and it never happened. Yeah, he needs to create some openings for himself. I know Spence is just too smart. I mean, that's that's right. That's not going to happen. And that was the big question coming in. You know, would you know, would you be able to take advantage of this guy? That's unlikely if he's 100%. And Spence looks 100%. Look at that champ. Beautiful work. Neither fighter has been knocked down as a professional. These guys are both mentally and physically tough. Spence, though, has made guys quit in the ring. Yeah, look, Spence is, is really, really starting to put a lot of leather on Danny Garcia. That was a good body shot as he exited. You can see that eye, that left eye for Danny Garcia starting to close up a little bit, taking a beating, and now he's pinned up against the ropes. Let me tell you a, a, a mistake that Danny's doing. He's allowing Spence to be first. Every time they, they come out of a clinch and go back, Spence is the one that's Errol Spence is the one that's starting the action and ending the action you can, and starting the action again. You can see Spence Lennox like just building momentum. You know, if Danny is going to stay stationary and not throw, uh, Spence will just take over. He'll he'll just smell that. 
Yeah. Doubles up on the jab and then throws a left to the body. Yeah. yeah. When somebody's throwing a lot of combinations at you, mentally, you just go into a defensive mode, and Danny's right into that defensive mode right now. Able to clip him with the right hand and tries with the overhand right. That was just a lot of superb work. I was going to say, Spence. Angel Garcia's got to be really sweating in the corner right now. Can't be happy. In the ropes, he letting you pity pat him. He's pity patting you in the ropes. Stay in the middle of the ring, man. You gotta, you gotta pick it up, dude. You okay, let me see the puck. Let me see that. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see one, Bill. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see, Bill. I know. Give him water. Give him water. Gentlemen, I've got a cut over here on the other corner by a punch. Just so you know, it's been ruled by a punch. All right, thank you. Damn. You gotta let, you gotta start letting pity pat you in the fucking corner. You hear me? Hit it with the Antoine. Yeah. Hit it with don't the Antoine. Let, don't let him pity pat you, Dan. You hear me? Mm -hmm. He's pity patting you, Dan. Don't let him pity pat you, Dan. Get the fuck off the road. Dale duro, que no está dando duro. Él dale duro. Joe, Joe, I gotta ask you. Yeah. With the ref coming over and telling each corner that the, the other guy's got a cut, is that right? Well, what he's telling them is that it was caused by a punch, not a headbutt. So don't complain about it. it it's it's it, it's a legal punch. Legal, you know, the cut's not uh, caused by a headbutt. Basically, we're into round number nine, and Jordan Plant is there uh, near Errol Spence's corner, and Derek James Jordan. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Derek, are you liking what you're seeing from Errol so far? I am liking what I'm seeing. He's breaking him down. He's, he's like, he took the fight out of him, basically. But he still has some fight in him. He's going to keep trying with the lucky shot, but just got to stay composed and stay focused. Is there anything Danny's giving you guys that maybe you didn't expect? No, we knew he had a heart. We knew he had a skill, but he never was able to get into the fight. The jab was the key to everything. And just keep popping with the jab. Listen, but listen, you got to. Thanks, Coach. Oh, Brian, back to you. Jordan, thank you. Look, and I think in the last round, we saw Danny Garcia's energy on the wane for the first time, where he just the energy level just seemed yeah he was lessened. subdued he was subdued right you know he's thinking about it you know there's a lot lot on his mind yeah he's not he's not hearing what he needs to do things are not happening for him that he wants to happen you know obviously he wants to catch Arrow uh, with with some good punches and and he's not the only time the only way he's having success is to the body. And Spence is just relentless. And and just so, such a good work rate. Errol Spence has sapped a lot of energy out of Danny Garcia by the pressure he put on, by putting him on the defense, by making him sweat it out because he's really a very dangerous guy in front of him, and he's landed a lot of punches on Danny Garcia. So, you know, there's a reason why Danny Garcia uh, is a little hesitant, a little tired right now. Good combination there by Garcia. It would land with at least one right hand. Spence right back to work with a, a jab and a left hand. Yep. And you can see that that eye is closing. I mean, he's doing damage to Garcia's face. And, and look, I, you know, if I were Errol Spence and I were in his corner, and, and I think Derek, uh, Derek James told him, I would just keep that relentless pressure on like he did the last couple rounds. Don't even slow down here a bit. And, you know, try to go for the knockout. I mean, but I tell you what, he's capable of it. Yeah, I mean, I was. I, that's what I said. I said he's going to pressure him and he's going to go for the knockout because he learned a lot of uh, different things, especially from the Mike, Mikey Garcia fight, where he looked back at the fight and said, "Hey, oh, he maybe let him, I, he let him off the hook." Yeah, he let him off the hook, and he was supposed to, you know, do a lot more damage than he did. Yeah. Well, against Sean Porter, that 11th and 12th round, he put the pedal to the metal. I mean, he just he got after it. He knocked down Sean Porter in the 11th and in the 12th. He was going for the knockout. So he, was, then, he, know, he, going, he got after it. He was going for the prize. The prize is the first one to knock out Sean Porter. That's what he was going for. And look, that, that's why he's a pound for pound star. Look, and Terrence Crawford's in the audience. Right? You've got everybody watching. The world is watching. And so far, it has been a marvelous performance for the welterweight champion. Can you please stop thinking that fucking Just mentioned like Terrence Crawford comes off a, a win. Against Cal Brook, and he's already throwing jabs. <laughs> Say this, this is what he's got to do. This is right. what I would do. Well dressed. You got to remember, Crawford can go left-handed and right-handed. So look, Terrence is saying, "What? Are you booing me? Are you really booing me?" <laughs> <laughs> so there goes a little reach around right under that elbow of uh, Danny Garcia. Is that straight little left hand? I mean, when you land stuff like that, 
you know you're really doing well. And let's see about Danny right here. Okay, he got a nice right hand and finally. Those are too far and few between. If he landed more of those, he'd probably be in this fight. And you know, I don't think I've seen Danny Garcia's face like that before. Yeah, Have no. You, I, I, I was gonna say, you know, when you're halfway through the fight and your eyes are a little puffy, that kind of, you know, yeah. he looks, hurts you a little bit. He looks beat up. I, I haven't seen him beat up. And look, Keith Thurman almost yeah, took his head off water. early in that fight. But I haven't seen Danny beaten down like this. Round 10, now in the final three rounds. Errol Spence has looked terrific. He's outlanded Danny Garcia. And a lot of the starch has come out of the challenger. Let's go back to Jordan Plant. She's with Angel Garcia. Go ahead, Jordan. Angel, you were telling him he's given Spence too much confidence. What does he need to do to take that confidence back? Well, I think Danny needs to pick it up a little bit. He's not, he's not. I mean, he's doing good, but he could do better. What do you think it is that's making him not go as fast as you want? Danny's a counter punch. He's waiting for the right shot, but I tell him not to do it. I just hit him wherever you catch him. Are you worried about the eye? No, yeah, the eye's okay. The eye's just a little bump. The eye's good. All right. Th boxing. Thanks, Coach. See, he, his father knows that yeah. he's a counter puncher and he's waiting for that opportunity. But sometimes you got to make that opportunity happen. Yeah, look, they, had, they knew that going in. I mean, they had to know that going in. Against the guy, the level of Spence, that you weren't going to be able to sit back and, and make him pay. Errol isn't going to sit there, you know, and take a picture after he lands on you. Now it's on. Well, I don't know why Harold's backing up there. I mean, he's got a lot of energy left. Uh, he hasn't taken a lot of punches in this fight, and I just think he should be present, Danny. Why let him back in the fight to do this to you? I, I'd be a little irritated if I were Derek James in the corner. Why give him a break? Why give him any chance to get momentum going? When you're just yeah. breaking him down, right? And his, yeah. and his only shot is to land something really hard and yeah. maybe stun him, put him down. Uh, we haven't seen him really close to that in this fight. But you could tell Angel's very disappointed right now. He's had, he knows it's been a difficult fight. Errol Spence has really brought his A game tonight. And, you know, Danny's got to be in great shape to take some of the punches he's taken and to hang in there as much as he had. But, you know, if Danny uh, wants to do anything, he's got to land something very substantial, something that'll turn the fight around. Like that. Oh, that's a right hand. That landed flush on Spence. Quick right hand from Danny Garcia. Yeah, but Danny, yes, here. Danny did the right thing. He took a step over to the left and, and threw the right hook. Did it again there, partially blocked perhaps. Yeah, when you do things like that, you know, you, you catch, you're throwing a punch where a guy doesn't real. Right, you're throwing a punch where, uh, you know, it's coming from a different angle where a boxer's not expecting. Garcia trying to turn this around, but he is he's gonna have to do much much more yeah. Just thought we had a chance there as you see Spence covering up and again normally and you watch a lot of Errol Spence fights it, it gets worse and worse for his opponent as the rounds go on and he just doesn't change a bit It's a beautiful look right there at AT&T Stadium and the fans still buzzing fans back in this building and a virtuoso performance so far by the champion yeah. when Final seconds here. Let's go up top. Kate Abdo and Sean Porter. Thank you very much, Sean. Of course, you know what it's like to be in a fight with both of these men. What are you seeing so far? I see Errol Smith Jr. doing what he's what he's used to doing, and that's taking off near the end of the fight. Now, however, I do have him losing the last two rounds, and that's because he's taking his foot off of the pedal a little bit. But first time back, you're going 12 rounds. Maybe you're saving something for the end of the fight. But his consistency throughout the fight is what's having where he's had his most success and he's been the most consistent, and that's why he's winning the fight. How clearly do you have him winning this fight? Though? I have him clearly winning the fight. I, I, I've only given Danny Garcia, I believe, uh, four out of the now 10 rounds. So, uh, and, and I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't write that one down, but um, consistency from Errol Smith Jr. is key for Errol Smith Jr., and that was what I wanted to see from the real Errol Smith Jr., who we see tonight. Brian, back to you guys. Okay, Sean, thank you very much. Now, again, the strategy going in, what, what Angel Garcia, what you know, Sean was talking about before the fight. Now, Angel Garcia saying, hey, we're not running. You know, we'll do everything in the pocket. We'll control the pace. And we all, I think, collectively wondered, hey, do you think that's going to be enough to beat this guy? And take a look, Larry Hazard has only given, well, two rounds. All right, seventh round as well to Danny Garcia. So that's two rounds. Sean might have four. Um, so that's a little bit closer. But it has been Errol Spence's night tonight. Yeah, Errol Spence has been consistent and persistent with his punches. You notice Arrow isn't backing up this round. He came out because he probably heard something from uh, Derek James in the corner, like, what are you doing? 
you know, letting the guy back in the fight or even winning a round there, maybe, possibly. You, you go back out there, you got six minutes left, two rounds, six minutes, finish the fight strong, and see if you can take him out or just win it decisively. Good combination by Spence there. It's a hard, thudding left handed shot. As he resets his feet, circles over to his right, gets the angle he's looking for against Garcia. Right hand lands by Garcia. That was a hard shot. Now a hard shot. As are hard right hands. They were they were blocked, and, and you know, Errol Spence is doing the right thing, keeping his hands up. It's always dangerous in these last rounds. Right on the belt line from Errol Spence, able to land to the body. I mean, he's just so consistent with his shots. And Errol Spence is a machine tonight against a really, really good counter puncher, smart, high IQ fighter in Danny Garcia. And he's really. He's really taken away all of his best tools from Garcia with his pressure, his relentlessness, and his combination punching. Errol Spence is back. Joe, you think uh, uh, Danny Garcia should be jabbing with Spence at the same time? Well, you know, look, it's 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 always difficult to jab with a southpaw. You know, sometimes it's it's hard enough just to kind of stop it and parry those jabs from a guy like Errol Spence. But yeah, I mean, usually advantage goes to a southpaw when it comes to the jabbing duel. Desperation time now for Danny Garcia. Only four minutes left in this fight. We're going to go into the corner and listen to both corners, but also Angel Garcia and see what they try to do. Again, he is staring at an 0 for 3 at the welterweight champions. He's had a career-defining fight. There was so much at stake, so much to gain for Danny Garcia. But it is a it's a tall order against Errol Spence. Just goes to show you how great Sean Porter was because he was neck and neck with the with the with the pre the whole night. The, yep. You know, and and, and and it really came down to that 11th round. And uh, let me just tell you something. Sean was in that fight and could have won it. So. Yeah, and even could have gone either way even with the knockdown. You're absolutely right, Joe. Final seconds here, round 11. And let me tell you, Sean Porter threw a lot of punches in that fight, you know. Man. Errol Spence really got Sean Porter to really throw everything. Body shot landed there by Garcia. Blocked that right hand from Garcia. Yeah, he did. Spence well, he went down to look at his feet or something. Not sure what that was. What happened to the, something probably, did the mouthpiece pop out? Yes. Okay, because he went down to look for something. Well, let's go to the corner and see what they say. Danny, why are you not flush? Stay focused. Keep your hands up high. Go ahead and spit. Listen. Okay, last round, gentlemen. We're going right. to touch gloves in the center, all right? all right? Listen, listen, listen. The only reason why you did that was because you were playing with him, all right? Do not play with him. This is not a game. This is not a game. Keep the... Dang. 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 Listen to me. Danny, when you're in the pocket slipping, you're giving him too much respect, Dan. When you're in the pocket dipping and slipping, try it once. Flush him. Dip on the like that and come over the top. Keep your right hand up, your left hand up. Danny, flush it, please, bro. Let's go, coach. Danny, oh, peace. You, know, you, you, you got three minutes. Let's, let's go, go, coach. Let's go. Three minutes. Final three minutes. And in the corner for Earl Spence, Derek James saying, do not play with him. Right, keep it nice and clean. Right, in other words, go back out go. there and, and from the, uh, to the last second, Keep on working like you are, like the pro you are, like the champ you are. Don't uh, mess around and, and, and play any games because it could be dangerous. But Joe, I didn't hear anything from Angel Garcia that would, you know, anything specific that would work. No, you? no, he hasn't. He hasn't yeah. given him any no. specific. Well, I think all the information was given ahead of time. Oh, good right hook by Spence. Spence coming in now hard. That landed, and uh, Garcia probably more difficult to see with that eye closed. In, in all fairness, in, on Angel's part, um, look. He's given it his best shot, given Danny instructions. They just aren't working. Errol Spence is too much. You know, they need a grand slam, not a home run. But I thought, again, that's why, Joe, I was saying at the beginning of the fight, Garcia would have to do something different. Otherwise, it would be just, hey, a close loss. We tried. We did our best. And against Spence, you had to do look, more the than counterpunch. The best laid plans of mice and men, as they say. Look, you can have all the plans you want, but when Errol... No, but they didn't plan it, Joe. What I'm saying is they well, didn't plan that. You, they planned to do their thing, well, and this is their thing. You don't know. You don't know. They could have tried it, and it didn't work, and they gave up real quickly. I didn't see it. Well, well, I mean, there's only a couple things you can do. Go forward or go backwards or a blend of both. Okay? I didn't see I, I think it's different. I think it's different when you're in there. You know, you, you, you have all these plans, like you said. That's right. You know, and punches and a guy's skill level changes all of that. 
But do you think he had the right game plan, Lennox? No, I didn't think he had the game plan. No, I didn't think so either. Well, I mean, we already, we well already what is the best game plan? I mean, the, the best game plan is throw a lot of punches. Okay. You, you got to throw more punches than the guy throwing punches at you. But the, you can't go through a whole career not doing that. Right, right. I agree, I agree. You know, I agree. That's what we're saying. Here, Errol Spence going back to work. If Garcia tries to flurry, and now they tangle up on each other. Final minute of this fight. And let's see if Danny Garcia has one last gasp in him, a last stand. He needs something miraculous to pull this out. Hoping that Spence comes toward him for something meaningful. Spence, though, look at the energy level, able to bounce and oh, faint. Yeah, yeah. Fainting is, is, is so important when you're at this level. And, the, you know, he's doing it right now in the last round. That's incredible. That's good. Yep. And his hands, are, his hands are fluid. It's effortless. He's looked terrific here tonight. And again, he was off a career high beating Sean Porter last September. And then coming off the car crash, this has just been an outstanding look for the welterweight champion of the world. Final seconds, let's listen in. champion that Errol Spence is indeed back. He says, I am the best welterweight in the world, hands down. And he proved that here again tonight, coming off the car crash, thrown from his car, and he just looked physically, mentally, like the same champion he was yeah. 15 months ago. But, yes, but did you see what Danny Garcia did there in the last 10 seconds? He should have been doing that That's over the whole fight. and over and over. Oh, absolutely. Fight, and he didn't do it. He's not, really not capable of doing No, that. he's not built that way. That's no, not the way he fights. And by the way, let's tip, uh, give a great uh, uh, tip of the uh, hat to Tom Taylor, the referee. What a great job. Oh, we, yeah. didn't even, we didn't even notice him tonight. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he was really, really did a great job. Let these guys fight. I tell you, rounds one through four, I was making a lot about the punches landed because it was very close. It was 45 to 38. Punches landed one through four in favor of Spence, who is, again, that's his game. He's, he is that good. He's a pound for pound star. But after that, rounds five on, it was 142 to 79. So almost two to one in favor of Spence. He's just better. Just reflects what we're watching in the ring. But that's what we expect from Spence. That's what we were noticing from Spence. I don't think it was it was hidden. I think it was quite obvious that he was out punching him two to one. Yeah, and, and you know what? But early on, it wasn't. So I thought, hey, maybe there's a chance. But after that, it just, he, they needed to do something different, Joe, is my point. You, you, but, but again, you know, the, the fight has to play out a little bit in the early rounds before you get settled in. And you find your rhythm, you know. And, oh, and from Spence. Oh, yeah. he does that every fight. Yeah, he gets right. better and better. And we'll take a look at some of the copy box numbers just to give you an idea of how it turned out. And again, Errol Spence is, is, leads the division in punches landed, and we're talking about some of the top stars in the, uh, in the sport at 147. 187 to 117 in favor of Errol Spence. They both threw over 700 punches. Take a look at some of the power punches. Uh, that was even, 103 to 103. Uh, but that jab is so active for Errol Spence, and it just dictates everything. So we will get the decision. Tim Cheatham, Barry Lindenman, and the experienced and excellent judge Steve Weisfeld okay. will have the call in this last, one. Last question. Did it look like Errol Spence only threw seven more punches than yeah. Danny Garcia? No, that, that, that's, that's a terrible. <laughs> you're, you're asking me, I'm saying no. I would have thought he threw 100 more punches. Is that what you thought? I can't hear you. The glass. <laughs> it's a plexiglass. Suddenly he's mute hey, let the me first tell you, time. Let me yeah. tell you, the elephant left the room quickly. <laughs> yeah, he's fine. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's riding horses, not Ferraris, and he is back on top. We believe. Let's get the decision and go to Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, after 12 rounds of action, we have a unanimous decision. Here are the score totals. Judges at ringside, Steve Weisfeld and Barry Lindemann scored about 116 to 112. Judge Tim Cheatham sees it 117 to 111. All three in favor of the winner. And still, the undefeated unified 
WBC and IBF welterweight champion of the world, the truth, Errol Spence Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, we begin. Welcome to the State Farm Arena here in Atlanta, Georgia, as Premier Boxing Champions presents the feature bout of the evening, brought to you by Mayweather Promotions, GTD Promotions, TGB Promotions, and Showtime. Sponsored by MGM Resorts. This bout is sanctioned by the WBA, the President, Gilberto Jesus Mendoza, Supervisor Julio Time, along with the Georgia Athletic and Entertainment Commission. The Chairman is Seth Milligan. Executive Director is Matt Woodruff. Our judges at ringside. From North Carolina, Barry Lindenman. From Oklahoma, David Sutherland. And from California, Zachary Young. Introducing our third man of the ring, our referee in charge, he'll be giving instructions after the introductions, Thomas Taylor. All right, fans, here we go with the main event of the evening. 12 rounds of boxing for the WBA Super Lightweight Championship of the World. And now, ladies and gentlemen in attendance, and boxing fans joining us around the world, live from that Oh, wow. 
Barrios is very jab-centric. 49% of his punches are, in fact, jabs. He didn't do that enough against Batir Akhmedov in a fight that was, as we've pointed out tonight, so close for him. He wants to use that punch tonight. In 24 bouts, Davis has never faced a foe as tall as Barrios or with as long a reach. He's on a 15-fight KO streak. In fact, the last fight to hear the final bell took place nearly seven years ago. <laughs> a six-round decision win over the durable Herman Moraz in October of 2014. Mm. No. Leo Santa Cruz, of course, much smaller than Barrios, tried to push Davis back uh, with a little success earlier, but obviously he ultimately walked into a monstrous punch. Yeah, Davis scored the Ring Magazine 2020 yeah. knockout of the year with that lethal left uppercut, stopping Santa Cruz for the first time in his career, and yet Davis telling us, despite all of the hype, with his prodigious power in the lower weights, that he thinks this is the fight where he is going to showcase his sweet science, which I know will make his mentor Floyd Mayweather smile. You know, Davis normally lands 37% of his punches, of his punches that are landed to the body. He hasn't been in a position to throw to the body yet, but I know he wants to get there. Yeah. Yeah, Barrios, the tall, rangy boxer puncher, usually gradually breaks down most of his opposition from the outside, but has his natural instincts to want to get on the inside and not utilize his yeah. height and reach and make it a firefight. But against a guy like Davis, you want to use that jab like you said, Al. Yeah, he wants that punch to be out there and not bend in and not give Davis a chance to land maybe a big, powerful overhand left. Davis blocked that right hand from Barrios. Davis double pumps the jab, just looking to use it as a range fighter, trying to find a way to close the distance. Floyd Money Mayweather, the Hall of Famer, heavily invested in the career of Javante Tank Davis, taking in the adulation from the crowd here in Atlanta. Keys to victory for these two men. Uh, he wants to Pedraza him. He beat Jose Pedraza to win the title. He bullied him. Work the body, get inside, and land shots to the body. The uppercut is if he can get inside, he has one of the best in boxing. Fort Barrios. Fight tall, stay on the outside, don't bend in. Land the counter right hand when Davis is coming inside and he has a good uppercut, especially his left uppercut. Bell in round two, Barrios working his 11th fight with the respected Virgil Hunter, who knows how to teach range and defense and Seems to be a good fit for the Aztec Warrior. Yeah, Virgil Hunter, of course, a wonderful trainer. And they have been together, as you said, for a while. And it has really been a great partnership. You know, the, 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 what I suggested there, those keys, is for that I thought Davis at some point is going to try and get inside and actually bully the bigger man. We'll see if that happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. He may have been joking, but Davis said watching Floyd Mayweather against Logan Paul gave him a sense <laughs> yeah, of, of what's say. happening yeah. in terms of the physical. Much he different did. levels, of course. I thought that was a fascinating comment that he made saying that. A but. minute gone here in the second.
Oh, right hand got through the guard by Barrios on the pint-sized powder keg that is Gervonta Tank Davis. And now Barrios trying to put together a combination. Akhmedov was, Akhmedov was able to land overhand oh, lefts nice. against Barrios. And even though Davis is a shorter fighter and uh, he's got great power, of course, in his left hand, he wants to land that overhand left as well. Barrios landed a good left hook to the body of Davis a few moments ago. A minute 15 left in the second. Neither fighter has ever been down in their respective pro careers. There overhand it is. left by Davis. That was what he was, he's been looking for. And you know, he fainted a couple times. And Abner, that I think is a key for Davis to faint more. Barrios goes to the body with a right hand. Left hook, right hand through the guard. Good combination put together by Barrios. Double pumps the jab. Gervonta Tank Davis has been credited with landing just one punch here in the second round by Showstats as Barrios doing a good job of keeping him at bay. And that one punch was that nice overhand left. Gervonta Tank Davis knows how to attract a crowd. Huge audience here in attendance at State Farm Arena. Home game for Davis uh, adopted by Atlanta. And here we'll see, we talked about uh, Davis wanting to get the overhand left in. And there actually it was a pretty straight left hand. I mentioned that Akhmedov had landed that punch a lot against Barrios and Davis able to get it in. Then later on Barrios Throwing the hook to the body and then the straight right hand. So a terrific combination in which it was a creative combination that allowed him to land that right hand. Yeah. Davis's trainer Calvin Ford has been with him throughout his life, has proven to be a light through the darkness that was. Gervonta Davis's youth and now a bona fide box office draw. Just how popular is Gervonta Davis? They have sold out the arena tonight. 16,570. Even bigger than the audience that was here for his victory over Yuri Orcas Gamboa. Yes. Yeah, you're right, Abner. That's true. And you know, Barrios against Akhmedov landed, uh, knocked him down with a left hook and a right hand. Oh. The right we've seen land, the left hook from Barrios, we haven't seen him even try that punch yet against Davis. Oh, Davis has found a home for the left to the body and then upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was interesting. Well, 16,000 plus showing their approval by showing up here tonight to witness Davis's move up two weight classes. Nairs a one two. Now the hand speed of Davis on display. And you see Barrios try that left hook. He knows that punch at some point might be available to him. And he kind of felt the waters out there. Davis has, uh, has started oh, to fight. He's getting closer with that left hand. Yeah, exactly. 
And, you know, there's Barrios fainting a little bit. He could do that as well. Mm -hmm. Final 30 seconds of the third round. Barrios goes to the body with the left hook. Davis on the ropes. High guard. We have completed three rounds, scheduled for 12 at 140. In terms of offense, as we begin round four, last round, both were credited with throwing 23 punches each. Barrios connected on five. Davis credited with three landed yeah. punches. Yeah, we have only had a little over 100 punches thrown in this fight. It's been a very tentative and strategic start. For Barrios, he likes that because he Amen. can stay on the outside and peck away. And very important advice given to him by Virgil Hunter about, about not leaning his head in. I think we're going to see Davis start to jab a little bit more to try and range find for that big left hand. Yeah. Yes. That right hand bounced off the glove of Davis. Davis utilizing his footwork to get away from the ropes, resetting in the center of the ring. Fainting, pawing at Barrios with the jab. Instead, it's Barrios that sticks a sharp jab, lands, and taking advantage of the the physical attributes, the physical advantages. And you know, the other fascinating thing, we're all sitting here in pins and needles. We're wondering, what happens if he lands a left hand? We don't know. Can he hurt Barrios? It's, you know, that's part of what makes this so fascinating. Right. Meanwhile, Barrios would love to earn a one-way ticket to the exosphere if he were to record the upset victory here tonight. Despite his physical advantages, he is the underdog. And now Davis with the jab. Under a minute left. Well, we said that earlier in the round. Remember that jab, if Davis can get it on track, can help him land that left hand. Under 30 seconds left in the fourth. Double jab through the guard by Barrios. Doesn't follow up with the right. There's the right hand. And there's a big difference when Barrios doubles with the jab. There's a right hand again that scores through the guard. Barrios effective with the jab. And the right hand here in the final seconds of the fourth frame.
in the last run, Barrios sticking that jab out and getting a right hand in uh, from distance against Davis. Nothing that hurt Davis, certainly, but it was a punch that landed, and there have been few and far between of those in this fight. Fifth round underway, scheduled for 12. Gervonta Tank Davis debut at 140 pounds, where Mario Barrios is a perfect 9-0 with eight knockouts in this division. And again, Barrios gets through the guard with the right hand, pawing at him with the jab. At this juncture, it is, the onus is kind of on Gervonta Davis now to somehow change the script a little bit. And whether it's him jabbing his way in and then landing power punches, or whether it's him landing a big overhand left from outside, I don't know, but he's going to need to change the script a little bit. Yeah. Davis a Davis a belt holder at 130. Secondary title 135. So many mouthwatering matchups to and, be made and at 135. And the left hand twice got oh, in for Davis. Uppercut. There's a right hand of the body by Barrios. Yes. There's a left hand that lands for Davis. There's that left hook to the body, right hand upstairs combination again by Barrios. Straight left hand, the lead left lands for Davis. Barrios is leaning in just a little bit more oh. in this round. He's making himself a little bit more of an appealing target. Good head movement and footwork by Barrios to avoid Davis' attack. Davis still putting on the pressure. There's a right hook to the body by Davis. Left hand upstairs. And Barrio stands his ground. There, Barrio rips a left hook to the body. Left hand by Davis. Electric atmosphere here in Atlanta. picking up here in the fifth and Davis has flipped the script <laughs> he changed the script under 20 seconds left here in the fifth Mario's beginning to feel the pressure of Javante Tank Davis That was earlier in the round. And then later on, Barrios, uh, who was firing back against him, would rip the left hook downstairs. It, it kind of blocked Lost, by yeah. Davis. Didn't get in exactly the way he wanted it. At the end of the round, Davis had excellent moments. And you notice a little blood around yep. the right eye of Barrios. And there's the left hand that just got there and the head following as well. Round number six, Barrios cut for the first time since he was cut against Jose Roman back in July of 2018 over his left eye. This cut appears to be over the right eye. Oh, <laughs> stiff jab by Barrios. Now yes. Barrios off to a good start here in the sixth, though, with the jab. And he has closed the distance between himself and Barrios now as, you know, 
And that will allow him to potentially Pedraza him by getting on the inside and doing what he did to Jose Pedraza, which is bully him a little bit and rip shots on the inside and 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 land power punches. And I would just be disrespectful to Jose Pedraza, who's come back from that and done very, very well for himself, but uh, that's what Davis did. <laughs> And, and, of course... Left hand lands for Davis. Barrios now the man going backwards. continues to walk down Barrios continues to negate the jab by pawing at it opening hoping to find an opening for that left hand just like that another left hand Ooh. by Davis now there was a counter right by Barrios and that's something he wants to do if Davis over commits final minute of the sixth Davis starting to encroach on Mario Barrios personal space beginning to find his distance <laughs> well the range. there's the uppercut by Barrios he he still thinks there's a home for that punch yeah under 20 seconds left here in the sixth round Barrios continues to fire back as well. Goes downstairs, left hook, and a right hand to the body. Barrios has thrown more punches, and according to show stats, very much in this round, but it's the body language of Gervonta Davis. Davis's left hand has become a potent weapon in this fight. Uh, he's landed it not a lot, but enough to, to make a difference. And there was a good straight left. He's landing it as a lead punch. Not even, and not always using, and there he uses the jab to set it up. So it, he can land it as a lead or the jab. Floyd Mayweather continues to his advice to the corner in between rounds goes to Davis's corners. We begin the second half of this 12-round affair being contested at 140 pounds. Javante Davis, who holds, bounce at 130 and 135, moving on up, wanting to test the limits of his power against Mario Barrios. Both fighters undefeated. Yeah, good point. Barrios lands to the body, but Davis does a good job of avoiding the punches upstairs as we bring in our Hall of Fame unofficial scorer, Steve Farhood. Mm. <laughs> Tend to agree with Steve Farhood. Uh, single digit connects the round. There needs to be an uptick in the offense. But again, credit Mario Barrios for sticking to his game plan. Davis has used the jab better, and it is changing this fight. It's allowing him to try and get into a better position to throw power punches. Yeah. up Barrios but high peekaboo guard not firing 
Trying to counter Barrios, trying to time Barrios as Barrios goes to the body with the left hook. Straight left, the lead left lands for Davis. Pot shotting with the left in the final minute of the seventh. First left uppercut, we've seen Davis try it, it almost got there. Barrios avoids the one-two from the southpaw, Davis, and then clinches. Right hand from Barrios, left hook. left in the seventh. It's been a good round for Gervonta Davis. And yet punches remain at a premium as we go to round eight. Davis attacking and using the jab very effectively. We talked about that. And what does it do? It sets up the straight left hand as Barrios retreats. The best way, huh? <laughs> Round number eight scheduled for 12 between Two undefeated warriors in Gervonta Tank Davis and Mario Barrios, Mauro Ranallo, Al Bernstein, Abner Matis here at ringside. State Farm Arena in Atlanta, joined by Brian Custer, Jim Gray, and Showtime Championship Boxing Crew, where in one interview, Gervonta Tank Davis said he would stop Mario Barrios in round eight. Yeah. You know, both these men have had some issues in later rounds. Barrios got tired against Akhmedov. Um, Tank Davis has had some stamina issues uh, a little bit, even though he well, knocked out Gamboa. Yeah, issues but, on the scale. Right, but...
Davis has brought his power to 140 pounds. It's a very good point. Yeah, Tank Davis is a good finisher. Um, Mario's and also get him out. the biggest opponent of Davis's career is going to take a little more. Yeah. Davis eats that shot to the body from Barrios and Davis again. Now, the very calculated. The dynamic of this fight has changed because that would be a 10 7 round with those two knockdowns. So the question is early rounds, we know some went to Barrios. And then the middle rounds, Davis started getting there. And right on cue, there's Steve Fard with his unofficial scorecard. So, oh, and Barrio oh slaps a combination on Davis. Wow. And Davis has never been knocked down. And you wonder, did Davis potentially punch himself out in that ferocious eighth? Well, Virgil Hunter said that, I think, to pump up Barrios, but <laughs> he's hoping it's true. Mario Barrios allowed the opportunity to regain his faculties. Reset here in the ninth in the center of the ring after going down twice in round eight. You know, the interesting thing is the thing I was talking about when that knockout came is that both men have sometimes had issues in later rounds. So we'll see if either of them fades more when, the, when that knockdown happens. Under a minute in the ninth left. Corner wants him to unload with Davis on the ropes. There's the left hook, but up and down goes Barrios. So after going down twice in the eighth, Barrios with some of his best work here in the ninth. Well, and Davis has thrown oh, uh, double jab, 12 hand. punches in this round. Compared to the ninth or 20 of Barrios. Yeah, right. Offense at a premium, but boy, plenty of excitement, plenty of drama as we head to round number 10 in tonight's main event.
Well, that was fascinating, that whole exchange. Here is where Barrios in the last round lands the nice left hook. Yep, that was it. And he used that to knock down Akhmedev when he fought him. You know who else used to love to jab to the body and then go upstairs with a left hook? A guy by the name of Floyd Muddy Mayweather. Yeah. And that was a fascinating exchange between he and Gervonta Tank Davis with, of course, Calvin Ford trying to do his yeah. job in the corner as well. So here we are, round number 10. Mario Barrios looking to establish the jab early. He's looking for a check hook there. Right hand to the body by Barrios. Yes. I oh, agree. Double left hook, one to the body, one upstairs for Barrios that lands. And Steve Farhood, our unofficial scorer, has Barrios now one point ahead. The ebb and flow, the give and take. Terrific stuff here. And Barrios continues to work the body as Davis navigates his way in. Fires off that right hook that Barrios ate well. And while Barrios is not forced to fight a trench warfare fight, will he be able to sustain and get through, or will he be hurt again by Davis's power? Another right hook curls behind the guard of Barrios, and the jab pops Davis's head back. Barrios again, battering the body of Davis with the right hand. Barrios has thrown 38 punches, only 15 for Davis in this round, so he's been busier. Davis walks in, left to the body, starts to back up Barrios. Barrios looking to utilize the oh. jab. Oh, punishing right hand, the body by Barrios. That was a little low by Barrios. Under a minute left here in the 10th. Wow. Left to the liver by Davis. Bobbing and weaving. Sustained body attack by Mario Barrios. Oh boy, yeah. I, oh, I, beautiful left hook, left upper gun. Right hand to Davis. But then Davis heard him. The exchange oh. of body shots and then another thudding left. That's Davis for Davis. Thunderous 10th round in Atlanta. An instant classic round between Davis and Barrios. Much to the delight of this crowd in excess of 16,000. comes back with a three-punch combination through the guard. We have reached round number 11th, the and penultimate round of this 
prize fight at 140 pounds. Tank Davis daring to be great, and his power has already delivered two knockdowns, but Mario Barrios isn't going anywhere. And round, that last round, which Steve Farhood, in his unofficial scoring, gave to Davis, Barrios was doing quite well, and then Davis turned it around with those big power punches in the latter part of the round. Timeout called by the referee. Momentary respite for Barrios says the action resumes. Davis double jab left hand. And Barrios has been 12 rounds twice. He's won both of them. Davis went into the 12th round when he knocked out Gamboa once. And that was in this very arena. Yes. Referee warning Davis for the forearms. You heard the corner watch the forearms. Oh, and Davis got clipped on the jaw by Barrios. That was his monstrous left hook, and give and Davis, Davis credit oh my. for taking that punch. And Davis walking forward, walking through fire. Left oh. over cut, right hook lands. What a fight between Barrios and Davis. Right hand to the body by Barrios. Oh. And uh, we said the body would be important. Well, guess what? It was important at the end when he landed that big body shot to hurt uh, his opponent. He didn't land a lot of body shots, but the one that was important was that one at the end. The last round had so much drama packed into it. There were a lot of ebbs and flows. We'll take a look here at the knockdown. We'll 
this is that tremendous what of course it's an uppercut what else would it be for uh, for for uh, Gervonta Davis and again we see a body punch much like we did with Jamel Charlo knocking down Rosario doing big damage and after here's where we see the stoppage And because of the body language of Mario Barrios, the referee not wanting to see him take another punch, and they did not complain. Barrios didn't complain about that stoppage. Nobody in the corner did, so they, they felt, you know, he was protecting him from what a situation he perceived could be dangerous for him. Gervonta Tank Davis wow. sticks the landing in his debut. 140 pounds, three knockdowns, 24th knockout. The 26-year-old is now 25-0 and, and continues to add to his aura. Let's go to Jimmy Lennon Jr. to make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a time of 2 minutes 13 seconds in round number 11. A referee in charge, Thomas Taylor, stops the contest. He is the winner by way of technical knockout. He is still undefeated. Now a three-division world champion and the new WBA Super great champion of the world, Javante. He wants to be one of the greats.